Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as circulated in the chamber. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Clark. Mr. President, a committee has lodged a proposal as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. Does anyone wish to put that particular matter to a vote? They do not. I will then move on and I'll call the clerk. Order of the Senate for the attendance of Minister Birmingham to make an explanation in relation to an order for production of documents. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I table a document responding to the order for the production of documents concerning the China Australia Free Trade Agreement. Uh, Mr. President, uh, in tabling this document, I'm explaining the government's assessment, uh, in accordance with the Senate's order of 3 December, of China's compliance with the letter and spirit of the China Australia Free Trade Agreement, known as CHAFTA, the extent and consequences of Australian economic dependence on the Chinese market and the wider economic, strategic and diplomatic context of Australia's trade relations with China. I'll touch on each of those three points in response, Mr uh, Madam Deputy President. China's compliance with the letter and spirit of CHAFTA. After 10 years of negotiations, Australia and China signed CHAFTA in June of 2015, and after both ratified it, the agreement entered into force in December 2015. It was the third bilateral FTA Australia concluded with a North Asian trading partner. Since 2015, CHAFTA has delivered six rounds of tariff cuts, which have provided expanded opportunities for Australian businesses and consumers. Australia's goods exports to China were valued at $149.2 billion in 2019, up 97 per cent since CHAFTA's entry into force, and total two-way goods and services trade with China was valued at $251 billion in 2019, up 66 per cent since CHAFTA's entry into force. CHAFTA is being used extensively by businesses, with around 95 per cent of eligible imports from China to Australia benefiting from CHAFTA tariff pre preferences, helping Australian businesses and consumers, uh, which was up in 2019 from around 85 per cent in 2016. Preliminary trade data for calendar year 2019 shows growth compared to 2018 in a number of products where tariffs have been cut under CHAFTA. Some examples. Exports of whole and skim milk powders grew by 22 per cent to $256 million, with 10 per cent tariffs progressively reduced. Exports of fresh chilled and frozen beef grew by 106 per cent to $2.67 billion, with tariffs of up to 25 per cent that were previously in place progressively reduced. Exports of sheep meat grew some 79 per cent to $1.2 billion, with tariffs that were up to 23 per cent being progressively reduced. Exports of frozen fish grew some 53 per cent to $26.5 million, as tariffs that had been up to 12 per cent have now been eliminated. Exports of fresh lobster and crayfish grew 17 per cent to $711 million, with 15 per cent tariffs that were in place now eliminated. Exports of shelled almonds more than doubled to $171 million, with 10 per cent tariffs now eliminated. And exports of cosmetic skincare products grew by 39 per cent to $101 million, with 6.5 per cent tariffs that had been in place now eliminated. Chapter has also improved access to the Chinese market for Australia's services exports, including education, health, legal and financial services. The latest available data from China in 2017 indicates that Australian businesses utilising the preference rate for Chinese imports from Australia uh, was over 90 per cent. 
However, Madam Deputy President, the Australian government has become increasingly concerned about a series of trade disruptive and restrictive measures implemented by the Chinese government on a wide range of goods imported from China and that these disruptions have increased significantly in recent months. The Chinese government has publicly stated that these disruptions are due to legitimate trade remedies, biosecurity measures as well as non-compliance with other technical standards. They have included measures implemented through the operation of Chinese regulations on quality, labelling, safety and pest and disease inspections. In the view of the Australian government, the targeted nature of Chinese government measures on Australian goods raises concerns about China's adherence to the letter and spirit of both its chapter and its WTO obligations. Australia has raised these concerns with Chinese officials on multiple occasions in both Canberra and in Beijing and has asked the Chinese government to engage on these matters at officials and ministerial levels. The Chinese government has consistently spoken about its commitment to open trade and the multilateral trading system, as well as to its free trade agreements, including JAFTA. All WTO members are expected to conduct their trading relationships in a manner consistent with their international obligations. We have raised our concerns about the Chinese government's measures in the WTO, including most recently at the 25 November 2020 meeting of the WTO Committee on Trade in Goods. We raised at that committee our concerns in respect to barley, to wine, meat and dairy establishments, live seafood exports, logs, timber, coal and cotton. Only yesterday, the Chinese government, through its customs agency, the General Administration of Customs of the PRC, notified Australian agricultural officials of a further suspension of a meat processing facility, Miramast, in Caboolture. The Australian government has raised its concerns with the Chinese government's anti-dumping and countervailing duties investigations into imports of Australian barley and has expressed our view that the Chinese government's processes, analysis and findings were inconsistent with WTO rules. JAFTA includes a structure of regular meetings intended to create an ongoing dialogue between Australia and China and a built-in agenda of reviews which provide avenues to address issues and increase two-way trade opportunities. After a reasonable start in bilateral engagement, in recent years the Chinese government's lack of engagement has prevented the use of these structures. Australia remains committed to building on the gains already achieved under CHAFTA and we will continue to advocate for its timely and effective implementation including those consultation, me consultation mechanisms for the benefit of businesses and consumers in both Australia and China. Our government continues to work closely with our exporters in an effort to retain preferential market access into China, which has delivered such widespread gains to date, and we continue to raise issues of apparent or potential discriminatory actions targeted against Australia. The Australian government is considering all dispute settlement options in order to support our exporters and to ensure they can compete on fair terms. Deputy President, to turn to the second point of the motion, the extent and consequences of Australian economic dependence on the Chinese market. It is a fact that China is Australia's largest trading partner, accounting for around 29 per cent of our total two-way trade in 2019-20. Over the same period, China accounted for around 35 per cent of Australia's total goods and services exports. Australia's exports to China reflect the complementarity of our economies and meet many of China's needs, including for resources, energy, food and tourism and education services. This trade has helped to lift hundreds of millions of people in China out of poverty and indeed across our region. The economic growth of China and the elimination of poverty for many millions of people is something that we warmly welcome, we wish to see continue, and it underlines the mutual benefit that comes from trade. Australian businesses have capitalised on these opportunities, and in doing so they have made their own choices about markets, reliance and risk. Australia is not unique in terms of having China as its largest trading partner. At least 60 countries in 2018 counted China as their number one merchandise trading partner. Australia's success in growing markets in China has been driven 
by Australian businesses, but also by factors such as the size of China's population, its favourable demographics and its rapid economic development, as well as, of course, our geographical proximity. In turn, China's economic growth, we acknowledge, has been supported by our reliable and high-quality supply of exports, including iron ore, energy and agricultural commodities. The trade disruptions occurring at present are not only detrimental to some Australian businesses, but also potentially to Chinese businesses and consumers as well. As China opened up and its citizens started increasingly to travel and study abroad, it has grown to be Australia's largest inbound visitor market for both students and tourists. In the past five years, visitor numbers have increased by 69 per cent and total spending by 117 per cent. This again is a function very much of China's size, its economic development, its demographics and its proximity. It again is not unusual for countries across our region to find a circumstance where their largest visitor market is, of course, the largest country in our region. On investment, many do not realise that China is an important, but compared to others, comparatively small partner for Australia. The, total stock of to the stock of total two-way investment was $163 billion in 2019, making China Australia's eighth largest investment partner, behind countries such as the United States, the United Kingdom and Japan. The total stock of Australian investment in China in 2019 was, for the third year in a row, greater than Chinese investment in Australia. The Australian government is committed, of course, to expanding opportunities in other markets. Australian businesses will continue to export to markets where Australian products and services are in demand and where profits are highest relative to risks. Concluding ongoing FTA negotiations, implementing and upgrading existing FTAs and expanding their membership and increasing Australia's two-way trade coverage by negotiating new FTAs will underpin trade growth and diversification in a post-COVID environment and will support the creation of Australian jobs. Our government has had considerable success in expanding Australia's FTA network, including by expanding FTA coverage of Australia's two-way trade from around 26 per cent in 2013 to around 70 per cent covered today. Apart from CHAFTA, over the last five years, our government has concluded and implemented FTAs with Japan, Korea and, most recently, with Indonesia, Hong Kong and Peru, as well as the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, known as the CPTPP, which has opened up additional opportunities for Australian businesses in key markets, including across the Indo-Pacific region, where some of the fastest growing economies are concentrated. A groundbreaking agreement on digital trade signed with Singapore on 6 August 2020 sets new global benchmarks for digital trade rules and offers an opportunity and a pathway for Australia to be leading in this space and to enhance opportunities for Australian exporters. Progress is being made in trade negotiations with the European Union and the United Kingdom. Signature of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, known as RCEP, in November means Australia will become party to a regional agreement that will provide a single set of rules for trade and investment across region 15 regional economies and is the largest ever such agreement. Although it is disappointing that India has chosen not to join RCEP in 2020, the door to India remains open. And in the meantime, we are exploring opportunities with India to recommence bilateral trade negotiations, particularly following the 4th of June virtual summit meeting between Prime Ministers Morrison and Modi where both countries agreed to elevate the relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership. Throughout COVID-19, our government's actions have helped to keep supply chains operating, including, including through collaboration with trading partners via the WTO, APEC, OECD and the G20. Deputy President, if I turn now to the last of the points in the Senate order, the wider economic, strategic and diplomatic context of Australia's trade relations with China. Growth and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region has been underpinned by open trade, both with China and with other regional partners. Australia's trading relationship with China has supported Australia's growth over time, as it has China's growth. It has helped through the global financial crisis and contributed to Australia's 28 years of uninterrupted economic growth. By providing some of the key inputs to China's modernisation 
and more recently to its development of a consumption-based economy, Australia has in turn played a crucial part in China's development and, as I noted before, a development that has seen China lift more people out of poverty than any country in history. At the same time, the relationship is taking place in the context of increasing geopolitical competition, including China's growing economic and strategic weight in the global context. We make no secret that this competition is creating new dilemmas for us and for the rest of the global community. Australia has been consistent in our approach to our values, our principles and protecting our national interest. It is not we who have changed. It is in our mutual interest, though, and that of the region, to coexist peacefully, promoting economic development and open trade to aid recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. As a supporter and an adherent to open and rules-based trade globally, Australia's continued economic engagement with China will remain important, as will expanding opportunities for Australian exporters to make the choices necessary to access other markets. Multilateral institutions and organisations are key to sustaining Australia's trade relationship, guided by international rules and norms. Organisations including APEC, the G20 and, in a trade context, most importantly, the World Trade Organisation, provide a platform for Australia to manage the challenges that arise from our evolving economic and strategic landscape. As the Prime Minister has said, international institutions play an important role as circuit breakers to provide the space and frameworks for meaningful and positive interaction to be maintained as a bulwark against any emerging divide. This is not to say that these organisations and institutions are perfect. We must continue to improve their effectiveness, including by encouraging all members to play their part in terms of participation, enhancement, as well as honouring the commitments they make through such organisations. In relation to the WTO, Australia acknowledges the importance of reforming it so it can better serve the needs of its members. This includes resolving the impasse on appointments to the appellate body. The WTO's dispute settlement system provides an independent umpire for members to consider and resolve their disputes. That independent umpire must be used in ways that uphold the rules and must be able to be relied upon to do so and deliver and uphold those rules effectively. Our government is currently considering our options regarding a WTO challenge on anti-dumping and countervailing duties on barley, where we feel this sector, like wine, has been so egregiously impacted. Australia remains a nation that supports the free flow of trade and goods according to the international rules and norms that not only we have committed to, but that China has committed to as well. It is important that we remain open to working together and to find a way forward. Our door remains open for ministerial dialogue. We continue to make that clear, including just last week. For all the economic and strategic reasons I have just outlined, Australia remains committed to constructive and workable relations with China. I hope that fundamentally this is something that the Chinese government wants too. We, of course, equally remain committed to opening up more avenues and more opportunities, as we have done consistently over the last six years, for Australian exporters and businesses to access even more markets around the world. I thank the Senate for the opportunity to address these issues this morning. I encourage all senators to read the government statement which I have tabled, uh, and I understand the Senate and will take note now of this explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I asked uh, I, I ask the Senate take note of the minister's uh, statement. Um, I, I thank the minister for making the statement. He has provided the Senate, uh, uh, both in the, in the tabling and in, in his uh, address this morning. I would like to highlight several parts of the minister's very diplomatic comments on the state of the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement. The first from the minister's statement is, is that, and I quote, the targeted nature of the Chinese government measures on Australian goods raises concerns about China's adherence to the letter and spirit of its CHAFTA and World, Health uh, World Trade Organisation obligations. It is a good thing that, uh, after much delay, the minister now acknowledges the clear pattern of China's action in what is a coercive trade campaign. Even if the minister can't quite bring himself to use words like uh, uh, 
coercive or punitive, there is no doubt that this campaign is politically driven with the open aim of punishing Australia for non-compliance with China's geopolitical ambitions. In this regard, it is significant that the minister also revealed that China switched off Chafter's consultative and review mechanism some time ago. Chafter includes a structure for regular bilateral meetings and a built-in agenda of reviews to address problems and increase two-way trade op opportunities. The minister has now acknowledged, and again I quote, after a reasonable start in bilateral engagement in recent years, the Chinese government lack of engagement has prevented the use of these structures. It's worth pointing, uh, emphasising this point. In recent years, Beijing has switched off processes of dialogue and review by which uh, bilateral trade problems could be addressed. The reality is China has been prepare, preparing to move against Australia for some time. It is well, a well-known uh, uh, tension in, in the Australia-China uh, relationship that has been building um, uh, over the past three years. And it basically starts with concerns about Chinese espionage prompting uh, the, government, the Australian government to ban Huawei, uh, an appropriate step, from the 5G network rollout, and this parliament's enacted new laws against foreign espionage. The Chinese uh, communist regime expressed dissatisfaction with these measures as they ran counter to Beijing's aim of increasing their influence and interfering within Australia. Against that background, there was a significant report in the Australian newspaper in mid-January. In an interview uh, with The Australian, a senior Chinese official bluntly signalled that, uh, that Australia-China relations were heading downhill. Wang Cho, president of the Chinese People Institute of Foreign Affairs, China's most influential po uh, foreign policy think tank, was a member of an official delegation for the sixth annual Australia-China political dialogue. In his interview, he he set out several Chinese grievances, especially Australia's ban on Huawei and Australian criticism of China's human rights records, particularly the treatment of Uyghurs in the Xinjiang province. Wang expressed the strong view that it was solely the responsibility of Australia to improve bilateral ties. He said Australia had to comply with China's core interests and major concerns. He said that it was up to Australia to do what was required. It was a view of a relationship in which China would call the shots. What has changed over the years has been the escalation of, of, uh, of oh, sorry, changed over this year has been the escalation of China's hostile rhetoric and their resort to blatant coercive tactics. But China's political intent has been consistent. The minister could have more honest, uh, been more honest today if he had directly acknowledged the politically driven nature of Chinese, China's actions. China has long held a hierarchical view of international affairs in which Beijing should be the centre of the diplomatic universe. In Beijing's view, smaller, less powerful nations and peoples should pay homage and comply with directions from the centre. This is a world view forged long ago in the days of imperial China, but fully held today by leaders of the Chinese Communist Party as the economic power and inter international influence has grown. Beijing sees our bilateral relationship as, one, uh, as a one-way street where they must be in charge. They want to impose the diktat on Australia. Part of the problem here is that uh, there's been a lot of wishful thinking in Australian uh, policy towards China for a long time. For far too long, our foreign uh, policy elite, including both the coalition and Labor governments, imagined we would happily trade with China and make a lot of money, while turning a blind eye to the totalitarian nature of the Chinese Communist regime. Both the, China, both the coalition and Labor were naive in negotiating a free trade agreement with a regime with no respect for the rule of law. Some of that wishful thinking is still apparent in the minister's statement. The minister refers to Australia using all available dispute mechanisms under Chafter and the WTO. We'll get short shrift from China through the bilateral mechanisms and WTO appeals, which will take years to be determined. And as the minister mentioned, we have an issue in respect of the appeals jurisdiction. Uh, even the Chinese compliance with uh, any unfavourable uh, uh, ruling is quite uncertain. 
Yet in that context, the minister has reaffirmed the government's commitment of building on the gains already, already achieved under Chapter. Although it was not mentioned in the minister's statement, it was to that end the government last month rushed to welcome China's expression of interest in joining the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership CPTPP. Now, that was a foolish move. Our government should not have been so quick to lay out the welcome mat um, in, uh, to, you know, to the Chinese president's latest geopolitical uh, ambition when, at the time, China is engaged in a coercive trade campaign against us. In their desperation to ease tension, the government conceded a significant position to Australia's disadvantage. Behind the minister's uh, carefully chosen word, the reality, uh, realities of our relationship with China are, are all too clear. China's ministers refused to interact with their Australian counterparts, and the Chinese embassy in Canberra released a 14-point diktat laying out their demands for Australia to kowtow before there is any improvement in the bilateral relations. Beijing no doubt views, viewed the government's response in relation to the CPTPP as a concession, and they will press for more. They have already turned up the pressure further in relation to our beef experts, exports, and that won't end the matter. It is noteworthy that in a shift from earlier Chinese uh, wariness ab about the original TPP agreement, uh, Chinese state-controlled media are now portraying the CPTPP as a means to further strengthen China's regional trade position, especially to boost China's digital services sector and digital economy, including ending the national security restrictions on Chinese companies such as Huawei. Australia should not engage with, let alone encourage, China's latest initiative until such time as Beijing drops its current trade uh, coercive campaign and engages properly in bilater bi and bilaterally on the basis of mutual respect. Why would one throw away a few good cards in your hand? Prime Minister Scott, Mon uh, uh, Scott Morrison is obviously no poker player. And uh, the regrettably um, but clear reality is that the Australia-China relations are likely to get worse before they stabilise. Australia must stand firm in defence of our national interests and values. We have the national resilience as well as, uh, as reliable and powerful allies to assist uh, resist in resisting China's attempted coercion. Australia must make an effort a major effort to diversify our, uh, our economic ties and reduce our economic dependence on Beijing. It may well be that the Australia-China relationship will be considerably more distant in the future. Meanwhile, it cannot be said that, the so that China's so-called wolf worry diplomacy is a very good formula for winning friends and influencing people. China's diplomats aren't uh, political wolves, and most of the time they're yapping is mainly directed at their political masters in Beijing. We would do well to ignore most of their feigned outrage and attention-seeking tweets. China has done much damage to their reputation as a trading partner and as a responsible member of the international community. Amid all the uh, uh, tumult, this, uh, this one thing is very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. As Senator Steele John. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, well, I think there needs to be a, a couple of key observations made at the outset of this uh, debate. First of all, that the Australian Greens uh, are the only party in this place who opposed Chafter uh, when it was put to. Uh, well, I say when it was put to the place, uh, it was never fully put to the place, and we shall get that uh, get to that in a moment. Uh, but we opposed it then, and we oppose it now. Um, our view on free trade agreements, and particularly on this one, uh, has not changed. We do not support agreements that do not uh, explicitly protect the rights of Australian workers and the integrity of our democracy uh, over corporate uh, interests. A lack of uh, labour market testing means that there are uh, no requirements for, no, uh, for jobs to be advertised locally. Uh, there are issues around environmental standards. There are issues around uh, human rights. Uh, these are issues which the Greens raise in this place time and time and time again. 
Uh, Senator Hanson Young raised them as trade spokesperson before myself. Senator Wish Wilson raised them uh, when he had the portfolio. And it comes back to the fundamentally broken nature of our treaty making system in this country. It is a treaty making system uh, which facilitates the executive, uh, the Prime Minister, the Cabinet. Uh, whichever particular uh, powerful figures within the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade exist at the time, uh, to collude with business interests in creating deals that uh, benefit uh, corporate interests globally at the expense of the environment, at the expense of human rights and at the expense of labour standards both in Australia and around the world. It is a broken system uh, that is rapidly uh, losing its legitimacy and becoming an exception to the overall norm. There are many countries and jurisdictions in the world which have taken the process of treaty making and put it back where it should be, uh, that is, with the parliament to scrutinise. It is absolutely unacceptable uh, that all we get to do here in these legislatures is basically give treaties uh, the tick and flick, or well, not even the tick and flick really, the shadow of the tick and flick. Uh, it gives no opportunity for the community to properly scrutinise, uh, for the social sector to properly scrutinise, for the union movement and environmental campaigners to scrutinise the impact of these treaties. Uh, and it also has to be said, in addition to all of this, uh, that the presence of investor state dispute mechanisms uh, within these free trade agreements has consistently uh, been raised by the community, by the relevant stakeholders, as completely unacceptable. These are the mechanisms that allow corporate interests to sue governments for taking action in the public interest uh, through uh, quasi-judicial mechanisms where precedent doesn't exist. Absolutely unacceptable uh, to the Australian people and an issue which we will continue to raise uh, in this place. Uh, now, it is very uh, important, I think, to recognise uh, the context in which we have uh, this conversation here today. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt as to the reality that the diplomatic relationship between Australia and the government of China uh, is at a uh, particularly low ebb. Um, and there is no doubt that there exists a great deal of tension uh, between uh, our government and the government of China. However, in the analysis offered uh, by the major parties today and by others contributing to, debat to the debate, I think the Greens uh, would contend that there is a fundamental misanalysis of the cause uh, that leads us to a, a space where we cannot effectively articulate the solution. And here I want to uh, pay tribute to Janet Rice, our foreign affairs spokesperson, who is doing some fantastic work in this space. Um, it is so important to recognise that we have come to this particular moment where there is such a profound breakdown in the relationship between the Australian government and the government of China because of a process which has been in train now uh, for more than a decade. Uh, that is the setting of our security policy on a collision course uh, with our economic uh, policy and priorities in the region. Uh, it began with the Pacific pivot. Uh, in 2011, uh, proclaimed uh, in the other place by President Obama uh, on his visit to Australia in November of 2011, and has seen from that point an ever-growing closeness between Australia and the United States in terms of our military relationship. We have seen troops uh, permanently based and rotated through Darwin. Uh, we have seen uh, treaties signed with Singapore, enabling the expansion of their military presence here. We have seen the beginning of a defence framework being established with Japan. And we have also seen the opening up of our military installations in a way which it is clearly understand it, to be sending the signal uh, that we would be able to take the presence of such machines as American strategic bombers. Now, all of these actions uh, send a very clear uh, geostrategic message, as they are intended to do, uh, that Australia attends, intends to maintain its status as the America's largest aircraft carrier in the Indo-Pacific. 
And this is a position which is completely at odds with the dip stated diplomatic desires uh, to develop greater uh, trading relationships and economic partnerships uh, for uh, and with China. Uh, we have been willing participants in a process of military and uh, a strategy of military and economic containment in relation to China, uh, as articulated uh, through the TPP processes um, as a, and as in articulated and made material in the security sense uh, through these various uh, shifts in policy uh, in relation to the American and other allied presences here in Australia. At the same time, subsequently, uh, we have uh, undermined terribly the ability of the Australian government to speak out on human rights issues by perpetrating incredible human rights abuses here at home and uh, in other Pacific Island nations. And I speak now here clearly um, of our disgraceful program of detaining uh, refugees and asylum seekers on Manus Island and Nauru. These practices undermine completely any demand on behalf of the Australian government for any of our regional neighbours to step up to any type of human rights standards, while we here at home perpetrate similar abuses. And the Australian Greens have consistently warned that this moral undermining of our position in the region would harm our ability uh, to call on our friends and neighbours in the region uh, to hold and uphold uh, human rights standards. Uh, it is also the case uh, that, as we have continued uh, to undermine this position, we have also failed uh, to equally admonish and call on uh, other state actors, such as Saudi Arabia, such as the United Arab Emirates, uh, in their violation of human rights abuses. And this absence of consistency undermines further our ability uh, to call out the horrendous human rights abuses being committed by the government of China in relation to issues uh, such as the treatment of Uyghur peoples. Uh, I sit here as, the member, as a member of the Australian Greens, the only political party who for 30 years have been consistent in our criticism of the human rights record of the government of China. There is no doubt, there can be no question, that abuses committed by that government are unacceptable and in total violation of global human rights standards. And it is because of our understanding of the importance of calling out these uh, issues, these treatment of people, that we have also been consistent in arguing for us here in Australia to be consistent in our criticism of other global perpetrators of human rights abuses and to be consistent uh, in relation to our own human rights practices here in Australia and under Australian uh, political uh, policies. It is very clear what must now be done. There must be a de-escalation of this trade war that is developing between our two governments, because it hurts our peoples and it hurts the small businesses that depend on exports uh, to China. There also needs to be policy settings put in place that seek to diversify our um, economic uh, trade <coughs> pathways in the region so that we are not dependent on any one uh, state actor. Uh, but we must first reality the history Recognise the history of what brought us Steel to John, this moment. Your time has expired. If there are no further speakers, then the question is that the motion moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. So there's no one either way. Declare it carried. Clerk. Government business order of the day number one. Social Security Administration Amendment, Continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020, Second Reading Debate, and on the amendment moved by Senator Dodson. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Social Security Administration Amendment, Continuation of the Cashless Welfare, of, of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020. Well, here we are again, talking about a discriminatory, racist, punitive approach 
to income support in this country. It has been going on for far too long, and it's time it ended. The Greens have stood in opposition to compulsory income management for the last 13 years. And while I draw breath, we will continue to oppose compulsory income management because it causes great harm to communities and individuals. This bill will make the current cashless debit card trial sites permanent in the areas of East East Kimberley, Sejuna, the goldfields in my home state of Western Australia, that's two in WA, and in Harvey Bay, the Bundaberg region in Queensland. It will permanently introduce the cashless debit card into the Northern Territory and Cape York. Finally, the government has actually come clean with its intentions. It always intended to try and make this card permanent and this process permanent. This was their plan all along to entrench this racist, discriminatory, paternalistic, ineffective, top-down blanket approach of income, compulsory income management. In the middle of a global pandemic and Australia's first recession in 30 years, the government has chosen this moment as the right time to make the CDC permanent. It's astounding that the government refuses to make any decisions on the base rate of the job seeker payment and youth allowance due to the changing in adverted commas economic conditions, but is happy to entrench compulsory income management. You can't raise the rate, but you can entrench this punitive approach. I'm so deeply disappointed that this bill did not receive the scrutiny it deserved. The Community Affairs Legislation Committee, because of the tight timeline put on it by the government, had a single half-day public hearing into this bill, and many organisations and individuals, including First Nations organisations, missed out on their opportunity to voice their opposition. This level of scrutiny is simply unacceptable when you know that this policy will permanently impact and, I say, harm the lives of tens of thousands of Australians. I'm also disappointed with the complete lack of proper consultation about making the cashless debit card permanent. About 82 per cent of people who will permanently be transferred onto the cashless debit card in the NT are First Nations peoples, and they were not properly consulted. Yet the government did not even bother to ask First Nations communities whether they supported the introduction of the cashless debit card or the continuation of compulsory income management, just like they did not consult the Northern Territory when they introduced the Northern Territory intervention. I have said it before and I will say it again. Information sessions explaining the policy is not consultation. It is simply explaining the policy and not listening to people's opinion on it. There is a letter that has been circulated, I understand, to crossbenchers from the Aboriginal peak organisations of the Northern Territory. And I have not got time to read out the whole lot, but in the absence of the government's failure, uh, in the absence of the government doing a proper consultation, I will read out bits of it. This is from the Aboriginal peak um, organisations of the Northern Territory, and it's to the crossbenchers. And they, they say they acknowledge the extreme pressure you are under in making decisions, but want to let you know that, we, that you have the backing of APONT um, and thousands of constituents we represent living in the remote communities across the Northern Territory. The opposition to the CDC from the Northern Territory has been clear and unambiguous since it was first proposed, and members have lived with compulsory income management for more than a decade and remained subject to this enduring legacy of the punitive 2007 federal intervention. We support income management as a voluntary measure for those experiencing hardship and who value the structure it can provide during difficult times or as a measure for individuals considered to be at high risk and vulnerable by Aboriginal controlled health organisations. Even in the latter situation, the period of income management should be time limited and closely monitored and supported. The clear and positive message from the Northern Territory is for improved education and training delivery and pathways to meaningful employment, not compulsory income management, which traps people in a cycle of poverty. The letter goes on, but I don't have time to read it all out. The failure to, cons to consult directly uh, contradicts and undermines the new national agreement on closing the gap, which has been founded on the principles of shared decision-making and self-determination. The government should be ashamed of itself. The ink is barely dry on that agreement. Already they are undermining that very agreement. 
The evidence used to support the recommendations of the Community Affairs Legislative Committee to pass the bill was deeply biased. The majority report report cited 50 citations of pro-cashless debit card submissions and 96 citations of anti-cashless debit card submissions, despite the fact that 90, 90 per cent of submissions were against the card. What's worse is that Generation One stroke the Mindaroo Foundation was cited at least as many as 16 times, as all, which was more than all the organisations in the Northern Territory. Despite five years of the cashless debit card trials and 13 years of compulsory income management, there is no evidence to show its effectiveness. In fact, research shows that compulsory income management has produced worse, worst outcomes for First Nations peoples in the Northern Territory. The academic community has done some very good work reviewing the flawed government evaluations and undertaking independent research in the trial sites. Earlier this year, researchers from Monash University found that the cashless debit card had no substantive effect on gambling or alcohol use. They also found people on the card had a higher proportion of spending on less healthy foods. Another study from the University of Queensland found that the social, and social emotional and economic costs of continuing with compulsory income management outweighs the benefits. Unsurprisingly, the government is refusing to release the, university, the latest University of Adelaide evaluation. Here we are, debating making this card permanent, making compulsory income management permanent, and they won't release the study that they've paid around $2, uh, sorry, $2 million for and wasted hundreds of hours of participants' time through that review process, and they won't even release it, so that we have the benefit of evaluating, the, looking at it, so in order to consider uh, these bills. On Tuesday, The Guardian reported that researchers conducting the evaluation say there is little consensus the cashless debit card is fulfilling its intended aims of reducing drug and alcohol abuse in the Goldfields trial site. Only a minority of those interviewed from the goldfields backed the card in its current form. No wonder the government doesn't want to release it. No wonder, because then we'd actually see, see what that evaluation said. It's not backing what they claim, I suspect. Compulsory income management fails to address the underlying structural issues and social determinants that have an impact on, the, on health and financial outcomes. It breaches people's human rights, disempowers them and denies them control over their lives. It is unacceptable denial of individual autonomy, cho autonomy choice and self-determination. Yet the government continues to obsess over this ineffective policy when we desperately need reforms in our social security system that would make a difference, like increasing the job seeker payment, for example, making sure that communities had access to quality uh, social services and support services and that they were there and could be accessed on demand. I would like to acknowledge the government MPs, like Bridget Archer, who has displayed courage in speaking out against this card. Ms Archer knows what it's like to live on income support payments and recognises that the CDC is not the answer. Maybe if more parliamentarians have lived experience of the social security system, then they would understand this card is not the solution. They would understand how people feel when, they, when their income is managed, how it takes away their autonomy, how it makes them feel anxious, how it makes them feel like they are losing their dignity because somebody else is controlling their money. I find it deeply problematic that the objectives of the cashless debit card have shifted under this bill. There is a new objective of the policy related to financial literacy, namely to support program participants and voluntary participants with their budgetary strategies. This is unbelievable given the imperial research which shows that the cashless debit card has not only failed to support people with their budgeting strategies, but has made budgeting more difficult by preventing people from paying their bills and rent. We also have to ask whether the cashless debit card could ever be an effective budgeting tool when the biggest challenge facing people is the low rate of the job seeker payment. People on income support are some of the best financial managers you can meet because they have to make, until the coronavirus supplement came in, they had to manage on $40 a day. I tell you what, 
That takes a lot of financial management, let me tell you. The cashless debit card is an outrageous waste of public funding. We have no information about the cost making the card permanent because we're told that's commercial incompetence. The supporters of this bill are essentially giving the government a blank cheque to spend an unknown quantum of money rolling out an ineffective policy. This is irresponsible and reckless from a government that claims they're good financial management. managers. What a joke. There are a number of serious technical problems in this bill, which I'll outline a few of. It gives the minister the power to quarantine 80 per cent of someone's income support payment with the card. While the bill maintains a 50-50 quarantine ratio for people using, uh, moving to, from the basics card in the ENT and the CAPE um, onto the card, there is nothing stopping the minister from increasing this ratio to 80-20, like the other uh, trial sites. This is unnecessary and unchecked power. Um, you've got to question the government's motives on this. The bill also reintroduces an element from previous versions of legislation that enables the minister to revoke an exit or wellbeing exemption. This retrospective application of this could mean exit approvals made prior to the passage of this bill could be revoked. Again, again another uh, flawed uh, mechanism in this bill. As we all know, an exit application process is, the process is already deeply flawed and not many people have come off it, given the number of applications to come off it. This will make that situation worse. The bill also removes uh, the, ability, the ability of the secretary and the AAT to review certain decisions relating to child participation. It's just absolutely incredible taking these rights away. This means that an individual, no long, an individual will no longer be able to seek a review from the secretary or the AAT when they are first placed on the card and will instead need to apply for an exit or exemption from the scheme. Again, appalling. It also, there's, also, there's no clarity in this bill about whether the government intends to place new income management recipients onto the cashless debit card. This bill lifts the cap on the number of people that can be placed on, on, onto the card in March. Onto the card, sorry. Although the minister uh, paused new entrants being placed onto the card in March, it's unclear whether this pause will remain in place if this legislation pass, uh, passes. Newly unemployed Australians have the right to know whether they will be placed on the card before the scheme becomes permanent. The government must come clean about this. And when I asked in estimates, the minister, the minister could not answer that question. Could not answer that question. This bill. Um, uh, this bill will be responsible for entrenching a two-tiered banking system that goes against Section 12DL of the Australian Security, Securities and Investment Commission Act of 2001. Sending a debit card or credit card to a person who did not ask for one is an offence under this section of the ATSIC Act. Today I'm calling out ATSIC to take action against the government for sending unsolicited cards to people on income support. We have had 13 years of this discriminatory policy. It has not worked. The government can't produce the evidence. They produce anecdotal stories all the time. I get emails, Facebook messages, tweets every single day of people that have trouble with the cashless debit card. Every single day. Rent is a particular problem. They cannot pay their rent. I've had a lady who um, could not pay her rent on the card, had to get Indu to pay it. Indu told her she'd pay, that, that they had paid it. She went out and then made other purchases, only to be then found that her rent hadn't been paid. So, in fact, it made her life more difficult. She was trying to do good financial management. Indu, once again, stuffed up because they didn't pay her rent. So now, if she applies to exit the card, they say, you can't manage your money. When it was Inju's fault, repeatedly, they will not pay the rent. They mess up all the time. This card is a racist, discriminatory, paternalistic approach that costs this country a fortune, but more importantly, takes away people's dignity, causes anxiety and stress. It is not a good measure. It is a poor measure. Compulsory income management is an appalling infliction on our uh, social Senator security Steve, system. This time needs to has end. Expired. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak 
against uh, this bill. Uh, it is a bill that really all senators uh, should be totally against. Totally against, simply in one word, inefficient. Inefficient in that this government has failed to do what it should have do, done in terms of uh, representing Australians on these trial sites. I spoke in the Senate this week about this government's failure to adequately evaluate what was going on in the four trial sites across Australia. And this government has failed to bring to the Senate, has failed to bring to Senate estimates, has failed to bring even to Senate inquiries as to what it is about the cashless debit card that is so good, so good. This Senate and all senators must uphold the highest of standards in the work that we do in approving or disproving legislation. This piece of legislation that has come before the Senate has no evidence to prove that forcing people onto compulsory quarantining of this cashless welfare card is a good thing. If anything, Mr Acting Deputy President, it shows the reverse. It shows how discriminated people feel. It shows how discriminated <coughs> that the behaviour of others towards them is. It shows the inability to empower residents of Australia to rise above poverty, to rise above vulnerable circumstances, and it does not show. It does not show the evidence of what this government espouses the card does. Now, have a good think about that for a moment, Mr Acting Deputy President. We here in the Senate must always research and inquire and ask the deeper questions about, is this good policy? Does this help our fellow Australians? Does it enable them to take their place in Australian society as equals? Does it enable them to pay their bills in a way with dignity, without having to be scrambling and scratching on a phone for hours, begging for help to be able to get some dollars out to pay a bill, whether it's their rent, whether it's in the local supermarket, whether they want to take their children to an event or a function but can't? That's not empowering. There is no dignity in families who cannot look after their own simply because they are forced on a particular card all because the government says you should be. And that's the real problem here, Mr Acting Deputy President, is that the government has failed to show any evidence, any evidence to prove otherwise. If anything, the cashless debit card is so discriminatory and so racist, like the basics card of, that we have in the Northern Territory. And let's go back. Let's go back to the history for the Northern Territory. In 2007, Mr Acting Deputy President, the then Prime Minister John Howard intervened into the lives of First Nations people across the Northern Territory. Seventy prescribed communities forced immediately under the emergency intervention. It happened for the reasons that the then Prime Minister and Indigenous Affairs Minister said were based on caring for children and rivers of grog. But we've come to know 
only a few months after that decision, the then former minister, Alexander Downer, spoke publicly and said we only intervened in the Northern Territory because we could. Because we could. For those of us in the Northern Territory, we knew then what being disempowered felt like. I was the member for Arnhem and stood in the Northern Territory Parliament representing the people of Arnhem Land. And never in my life had I felt so disempowered, so disempowered, and here I was, a politician, representing thousands of people in my electorate, and I could not change or stop anything. I went out to Arnhem Land on the 3rd of August 2007, a couple of months after the intervention occurred. There were meetings by First Nations people happening at the Gama Festival at Gulkula. And I knew when I went there that I was going to face the barrage of criticism, concern and hurt by First Nations people. And I did. I went out there to face them, knowing it wasn't me that made the decision of the Commonwealth to come in and impose such draconian laws on people of colour, but they were my constituents and I had to go out there and face them because no one from the Commonwealth was coming up. No one from the Commonwealth Parliament was walking there on Gulkala country saying, oh yeah, this is why we've intervened on your life. So on the 3rd of August 2007, I walked in on that ceremony ground and I got eaten alive. First Nations people were so hurt, so angry, and they let us know it. And they turned to myself and my parliamentary colleagues from the Northern Territory Parliament and they said, you did nothing, you did nothing, and our lives we're all being treated like we're pedophiles, we can't feed our children, we don't care for our children, we don't work, we're all druggies and alcos. You did nothing. And as we walked away, some of my colleagues said to me, but we couldn't do anything. I said, yeah, we could have. Constitutionally, we mightn't have been able to. We're a self-governing territory. Commonwealth can intervene on us any time it likes. But we could have protested, we could have marched the streets, we could, could have had civil disobedience, but we did nothing. The hurt was palpable. The anger has never gone away. That sense of deep oppression, of racism, has gone on for 13 years since that intervention and in the policy of the Basics Card and more across the Northern Territory. Oh yes, I heard all the arguments. Ah, oh, but millions of dollars is going into the Northern Territory now. Millions of dollars. You know, we've got all these uh, Canberra public servants flying back and forwards, assisting with the establishment of uh, uh, safe houses, safe places, uh, even you know, a few extra police stations. Uh, you know, there's millions of dollars going in. And I turned around and I said, "Yeah, but we needed that anyway." Why did you have to intervene on people's lives to give them what they rightly deserved in the first place, to have decent homes, to have safe houses for their families, especially the women, to have more police protection uh, like any other Australian community? Why is it that First Nations people always have to feel like we are grateful for receiving something that is a basic right for any other Australian in this country? So when the government comes to the Senate and says not only does it want to make those four trial sites across Australia for the cashless debit card permanent, it now wants to include every single one of those families under the basics card. 25,000 extra people. On what grounds? On what basis? There has not even been an evaluation of the basics card in the Northern Territory since 2014. That's six years ago, and even that evaluation proved that it was not working. The basics card was not working. So when I raise in the Senate here, where is the evaluation for those families who've felt completely 
undignified for all of this time. Their children have had to grow up over the last 13 years feeling like oppression is our future, oppression is our life. That doesn't give hope. And I expect better of this Senate, and I expect better of the minister, and I expect better of the government. At least have a decent, good reason as to why you're doing what you're doing. But you don't, do you? You've been sloppy in the way you've gone about uh, getting any evidence. And in fact, worse, you've given an abrogation of responsibility to Australians by not even looking at the $2.5 million of evidence that you called for. And you still brought this legislation into the Senate and you passed it in the House. You had a member on your side telling you that this legislation was wrong. I wish she had had the courage of her convictions to cross the floor because we would not be having this conversation in here if she had done that. And I know that the Bridget Archer MP is not the only one who has that view in the House. So it's left to senators to show some courage, not just some, but a hell of a lot of courage. Even if you like the cashless debit card, even if you think purchasing goods from 900,000 outlets across Australia is a wonderful thing, I ask you to consider this. Do not reward a government who has been lazy inefficient and abrogated the responsibilities of this Senate in having the right kind of evidence to bring to the Senate and respecting the Senate and senators here to be able to make wise and just decisions on behalf of all Australians. Because what you have brought in here in this legislation is not that. You have failed. You have not even spoken and given the opportunity to the people of the Northern Territory to tell you how they feel on the basics card, let alone just expecting them to roll across onto the cashless debit card. There is no decency in that. It is so un-Australian. It really is. You know, we do pride ourselves here in the Senate of trying to examine and investigate everything from every perspective. And I do urge senators to recognise that even if you do like this cashless debit card, you cannot make a decision on behalf of thousands and thousands and thousands of Australians where no evidence has come forward in this Senate that says the cashless debit card works. At the very least, you should condemn this government for its failure. You should condemn this government because of the position that it's put the Senate into and the position it's put senators into. It is not our place to fix your mess. And I say to the crossbenchers, this legislation is wrong. It is unjust, it is racist and so un-Australian. Vote no. Vote no to this legislation and compel the government to do its job, to get off its backside and get out there and actually do your job. Listen to the Australians out there who are crying out for your empathy and to recognise the hardship that they are experiencing. Take the sand out of your ears and let's hope we can soften your hearts because all this legislation does is push people further and further in the ground. Please, please, senators, vote no to this horrendous legislation. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. I recognise there are strong feelings on this, but I do just remind senators to address their remarks through the chair. Senator Gallo, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I 
rise to uh, make a contribution on the Social Security Administration Amendment continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020. And I'd like to associate myself with that, that incredible um, speech from Senator McCarthy. If there's a speech that's going to convince other senators uh, to uh, vote no to this bill, um, that's the speech uh, to listen to and refer back to. Labor will be opposing this bill. The reasons that underpin our opposition to imposing the cashless debit card on communities without their informed consent or adequate consultation have been extensively canvassed in this place and through committee reports and contributions to debates such as those made just by, uh, then by Senator McCarthy. Indeed, senators from across the political spectrum have rightly found fault with the approach engendered in this and related bills over recent years. In fact, many of the concerns we've been flagging since the coalition government embarked on its rollout of the cashless debit card have regrettably been realised. And further to that, there is now an exhaustive base of evidence which has affirmed our opposition to measures in this bill. The income management regime the Morrison government is seeking to impose, in many cases on some of the most vulnerable and isolated social security recipients and communities in the country, with this legislation, has a number of irredeemable flaws. Put simply, it doesn't work, despite the government's continued but baseless assertions that it does. Thankfully, there are those in the coalition party room that recognise this, and we've heard comments uh, from um, the member for Bass this week. More than a decade has now passed since the Howard government's intervention in the Northern Territory and its accompanying welfare quarantining measures, and there is just no evidence that compulsory, broad-based income management works. The evidence suggests quite to the contrary. Not only has the cashless debit card and compulsory income management policies more generally been found wanting in their effectiveness, but as Labor members have been highlighting, there is actually evidence of significant harm. And it cannot go unsaid, in fact it should, must be at the forefront of our consideration of this bill, that this legislation is racially discriminatory. We know that more than two-thirds of the people who will face increasingly severe restrictions and controls under this bill would be First Nations Australians. In fact, half of all welfare recipients impacted by this legislation would be First Nations people in the Northern Territory. What's abundantly clear with the Morrison government's wholesale and flagrant disregard of the publicly available evidence is that its cashless debit card policy is firmly, if not exclusively, based on ideology. And we see that playing out here this week, that this bill is the one that's most important to this government. It's the cashless debit card on their program this week in the Senate that, that is their priority bill, and I think that speaks everything about this government. It certainly cannot claim to be by supported by the data or the lived experience of Australians who have been subjected to it. It should be noted, too, that this bill is meaningfully different to others we've had before us. It rushes to make the cashless debit card permanent in the existing trial sites, rather than seeking to extend the trial period, as the government had originally sought to do. That key difference betrays another motivation implicit in this bill. The government is determined to proceed with their scarcely concealed plan to roll this card out right across the country, irrespective of the evidence, and with it make life harder for millions of Social Security recipients. Anyone who is in receipt of Social Security in this country uh, should be worried by this bill. Make no mistake, that's clearly the direction this government ha is headed, or how else we account for the Morrison government making the decision to forge ahead with this bill in the way that it has done. The minister herself admitted at Senate estimates that she had not even read the $2.5 million evaluation of the program before deciding to make the cashless debit card permanent. That's an evaluation the government itself commissioned. The very same report senators in this place have not seen, despite being asked to vote on this bill today. Clearly, it is not, ev it is not evidence that is motivating the approach from the Morrison government. And if that is not sufficiently telling about the government's true intention, at estimates we discovered the establishment of the so-called CDC Technology Working Group. That group includes the likes of ANZ Bank, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, National Australia Bank and Westpac, as well as Coles, Woolworths, Metcash, FPOS and Australia Post. It's not difficult to deduce the scale of the government's ambition of a future CDC rollout with groups of that size involved. I mean, why would they? 
be involved unless there were greater plans afoot. Regrettably, this is also another case of, of movement and action in lieu of substance and delivery from the Prime Minister. It's a pattern Australians are growing wearily familiar with. The Prime Minister attempts to chalk up a win, grab a headline that on the face of it might suggest meaningful action, and then quickly move on to the next announcement. If it helps shore up support internally by appealing to the ideological biases of the hard right wing of his party, then all the better to do it. But what Hello, we've learned— Senator Gallagher, uh, that's an imputation of an improper motive, which I'll ask you to withdraw. Um, I'll, I'll withdraw according to your Thank ruling. Thank you. You have the call. Uh, but what we've learned and what Australians are quickly discovering is that once the sugar hit of a headline has dissipated, any close review of those policies expose that the chronically under-deliver or are even counterproductive, as is the case with this legislation. And that's certainly part of the Labor's opposition to this bill. It's also that it's an enormous missed opportunity, a classic case of opportunity cost. And that before factoring in that too many of the people and communities this bill would impact most heavily were experiencing long-term or intergenerational disadvantage well before the pandemic arrived on our shores. And yet the Morrison government's focus in this final parliamentary week of the year is not evidence-based policy that empowers or supports some of the most vulnerable in our community. Instead, it's seeking, with unjustified haste, to push through another ideologically motivated program. I'd like to turn to an issue um, that I have uh, alluded to uh, earlier, and that's about the bill not being supported by evidence. Analysis from a broad range of specialists, many of whom contributed to the recent Senate inquiry, have provided compelling evidence that when they've compulsorily imposed, the cashless debit card and similar schemes have not worked. Professor Drees, director from the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research at the ANU, succinctly characterised the evidence supporting both the cashless debit card and the basics card as, I quote, flimsy and largely anecdotal, not rigorous and reliable. The evidence does not stack up. On the contrary, he asserted that 13 years of compulsory income management practices in the Northern Territory had produced a very large amount of evidence that has shown that it has had, and I quote again, almost no positive impact. These findings are supported by the University of South Australia's recent independent analysis of the CDC trial in Sejuna, South Australia. With explicit reference to the issue of gambling and substance abuse amongst welfare recipients, which is often proffered by proponents of compulsory scheme as justification for intervention, UniSA's independent analysis determined the CDC policy had no substantive effect on the available measures for the targeted behaviours of gambling or intoxicant abuse. We've also heard from the preeminent experts in addiction that the approach championed through this bill by the government is completely wrong-headed, particularly its focus on compulsion, rather than employing proven methods which leverage voluntary involvement and positive reinforcement. The Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists stated in their submission that there was not clinical evidence to support the CDC. We are concerned at the continued pursuit of this policy against the advice of addiction specialists. More than 50 years of psychological research shows that positive reinforcement strategies are more effective than punitive strategies in bringing around behavioural change. So why is the government proceeding in the face of this evidence? It's especially be bewildering when you couple not only the highly questionable effectiveness of the program against its costs. Dr Luke Greenacre's more recent research with the University of South Australia examined the change in targeted behaviours following the introduction of the scheme in South Australian trial area, finding no statistically significant improvement in any behaviour. Dr Greenacre's research suggests the CDC offers marginal, if any, return at all on government investment. We found no substantive impact on measures of gambling, drug and alcohol abuse, crime or emergency department presentations. So there you have it from the experts, but this government isn't listening to them. The Liberal member for Bass, uh, Bridget Archer, Archer MP, has spoken out against the government's cashless debit uh, welfare cards, saying that there isn't enough evidence to justify the associated harm the program causes. In her contribution in the other place, the member for Bass said, and I quote, 
I have been a recipient of government assistance myself at different times in my life, and I can understand the stress that so many forced onto this card would feel. The rhetoric that surrounds social security and systems like income management plays into the very worst of human nature. We are essentially inviting people to look at their fellow Australians as something other or less than. Whenever you approach a human program by inciting shame and guilt, you have already lost those you are seeking to help. I'd like to associate my, myself with those thoughtful remarks and reflections brought out of her personal experience and which mirror my own. Ms Archer's dissent has also been supported by the Liberal member for Monash, Russell Broadbent, who has registered his concern about the bill, specifically questioning the merit in singling out communities for a cashless debit card. I certainly hope that members of the Senate crossbench, and indeed whether there are any members of the Senate coalition in this place who are listening to these contributions and listening to the evidence, and will have the courage of their convictions to join us in opposing this legislation. Because let's be very clear about what's happening here. The Morrison government are seeking, through this bill, to permanently establish the punitive cashless debit card, despite knowing it does not work, despite knowing it unjustly and disproportionately targets First Nations Australians, despite having to, f to adequately consult with affected communities, despite having failed to invest in job creation, housing or adequate community services, despite knowing this bill is yet another step in a barely concealed plan to roll out this regime on welfare recipients right across the country, and despite members of their own, the government's own members, having conceded in parliament that all of this is true. And why is this bill the government's number one priority this week? Why is this the Prime Minister's number one priority, to impose the cashless web, um, debit card disproportionately targeting First Nations Australians? That seriously is his number one issue this week. When we have so many people unemployed, so many businesses struggling, so many families trying to make ends meet, shouldn't that be the focus? But no, it's this one. And at the same time, we have the Prime Minister saying we prefer to let Australians make decisions about how they spend their money, and he's been saying that all week, then turns around with legislation like this, which takes that right away from, from those uh, communities where this is going to be imposed on them permanently and then rolled out across the country. So he says one thing to one group of people in this country and then acts this way towards some of the most vulnerable, isolated and marginal communities in this country. Instead of working with them, listening to them, you know, God help us if you actually listen and ask and work with communities about how to support them and respond to some of the challenges that they may be experiencing in their homes and their uh, communities. Uh, we've got it right here. We won't listen to uh, the experts. We won't listen to um, the report that we've commissioned. We won't even read it. We'll spend two and a half million dollars of taxpayers' funds on commissioning a report that the minister herself has acknowledged she doesn't read before she takes this decision to permanently impose this on a number of communities in Australia with a long-term view of rolling it out across the country. This is the priority of this government. It's mean, it's nasty, it's playing to base politics, and they won't listen because this is exactly what they want to do. They want to, all the way to the next election, they seek to marginalise, disenfranchise, demean, in the eyes of other Australians, the rights of some of the most vulnerable communities in this country. The Labor Party will not be a part of it, and we will call it out, and we will call it out all day, and I know many other senators in this place will call it out too. And like Senator McCarthy said, I urge the crossbench, do not be bullied into voting for this bill because the government has got itself into a problem about timing because they've mismanaged their own program. 
don't help them out. They don't deserve it, and the communities that are going to have this imposed on, it, on them don't deserve it either. Senator Thorpe. President, I rise to speak on the cashlet debit card, the CDC continuation bill. This degrading colonial type bill will in introduce Move. the CDC as a permanent Move. program, not a trial to replace the current basic cards for about 25,000 people in the Northern Territory and Cape York region. There won't be any cap on how many people will have their income support managed by the government and allegedly for their own good. I'm not surprised that the government is trying to rush this through this place because about 82 per cent of people who will be put back on rations through the CDC are First Nations peoples, particularly those that are living on country in remote areas. The sovereign first people of this country are going to be put back on rations in the Northern Territory and Cape York. It's shame. It's 2021 rations, because that's what this is. Let's tell the truth. It's putting black people back on rations. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the governments of this country introduced legislation to regulate the lives of our people. These laws were commonly referred to as the Protection Acts because we were told that they were to protect our people. These acts existed and were used until the 80s as a means to forcefully separate our families, create division, disempower our people, try to destroy our cultures and assimilate the oldest culture in the world into settler colonial societies. We were doing just fine before those ships sailed into your country to plant their flags on their soul and use our people's country as a prison without consent. We weren't the ones needing assimilation. We were fine. And yet these so-called protection acts were used as a way to control the lives of our people. And now it's back to the future with this bill before us today. In the second reading speech, of this bill, the minister said that this new rations program is, and I quote, helping welfare recipients with their budgeting strategies and reducing the likelihood that they will remain on welfare and out of the workforce for extended periods, end quote. What a joke. What a joke. If the minister cared for our people, they would be bending over backwards to fully fund and resource our Aboriginal community-controlled organisations to provide services to our people, because the people know what we need. This government is just blocking our path and our right to self-determination. Self-determination must drive how this government engages with any issue that affects us. Our people need strong, culturally safe and self-determined supports and services. Services like Aboriginal controlled financial management, social support, education, childcare and legal assistance services. But since our people are not property developers or miners, then this government gives us nothing. Well, that's not true we get the 21st century equivalent of rations and this new Protection Act. Our people have not forgotten the protection regime that they were forced into, especially the Northern Territory Aboriginal people. By 1911, 10 years after this country was federated, every state and territory except Lutruwita, Tasmania, had a so-called Protection Act, giving the chief protector of Aborigines extensive power to control our lives. In the Northern Territory, in particular, the chief protector of Aborigines was made the legal guardian 
of all Aboriginal children displacing the rights of their own parents. Our people have been caring for our young ones and our babies for millennia, and now the chief protector controlled our children and our babies because he said so. These protection acts included powers to direct our people off their lands and to live on reserves and missions. Our people were enslaved, something that the Prime Minister himself conveniently forgot. He must not have seen the pictures of our senior lawmen and women in chains and shackles. I'll be happy to provide them to him so he can understand history properly. Our women were abused, assaulted and raped. The police services of this country stole our children from their families and put them to work. The government then turned around to tell us that we were the bad parents. They did all this in the name of protection. What we needed protection from was colonisation. Our people were subject to near total control of movement over who they could marry and when or the jobs that they could do. Our wages were stolen, our savings were taken and our property was seized. Then they put us on rations. They paid for us for our labour with flour, tea, sugar and clothes. These foods that we did not have in our diets and that our bodies were not used to. Foods that are still killing our people earlier than they should be. Our people wonder why we are angry. You should be lucky that all we want is a fair go. All we want is everything that was denied to our ancestors. Oh, and how mad they get when we tell the truth, because there is nothing so fragile as white supremacy. I can see people in this chamber bristling at me even raising white supremacy in this place. Don't forget that one of the first laws in this very parliament passed was the Immigration Restriction Act, also known as the beginning of the white Australian policy. And here I stand in this place, along with Senator McCarthy and Senator Dodson, as a proud black person standing up for our people and our rights. We're dismantling the supremacy this country was built on, because we have seen this type of protectionist, colonial interference in our lives before. This is not the first time that the government wants to control the income of our people by regulating access to and payment of social security. Our people were mostly denied from receiving any income support, like child endowment payments, maternity allowance and old age pensions when they were introduced. This parliament even made amendments to legislation that meant that although our people may have been entitled to income support, this could be paid indirectly to a third party like a mission or a government agency. The Child Endowment Act of 1941 provided that the child endowment payment would not be made to Aboriginal natives of Australia who were nomadic or where the child was wholly or mainly dependent on the Commonwealth or a state for support. From 1912, a maternity allowance of five pounds was paid to mothers on the birth of a child. Subsection 6 of the Maternity Allowance Act of 1912 specifically excluded the payment of the maternity allowance to, and I quote, women who are Asiatics, Aboriginal natives of Australia, Papa, Papua or the islands of the Pacific, end quote. The invalid and old, uh, Invalid and Old Age Pension Act of 1908 specifically excluded and I quote, 
Aboriginal natives of Australia from receiving the old age or invalid pensions. End quote. The Commonwealth scheme for unemployment and sickness benefits came into operation in July 1945. Under that law, and I quote, Aboriginal natives of Australia was disqualified. End quote. And now here we are in, with all the Social Security Administration Amendment continuation of cashless welfare bill 2020 and the new protection acts being introduced into this place by the chief protector of aborigines don't be fooled when they tell you that this is for our benefit it's not management of income is racist and colonial nonsense all over again and it's demeaning to us, a proud people. So many people have shared their stories with me, like Annette Stokes, who was awarded the Order of Australia for her dedicated work for mobs in Western goldfields regarding genetics. Once her contract had finished, she had the right to apply for income support while looking for work and then was placed on a management card. She does not drink or take drugs and is practicing culture. A Christian woman who attends church alongside her brother, Pastor Geoffrey Stokes. Annette sings beautiful songs in church and lives an honest life, also a wonderful mother and friend to many, but is being placed on a 21st century ration. Also, Grant Gannett, a proud Aboriginal man who was in tears about how cruel this card is to his people. I also want to speak to the story of a sister, Jamara King, who was, one of the, who was on the card in Queensland and tells me that it took this government two months to send it to her, and by that time she was so far back in her rent that court proceedings to evict her from her home had already started, so she, so she had to move in with her parents in a crowded home. This is shameful. We are condemning proud black people to rations and income management and 21st century protection acts. And we are proud. We have been proud for over 80,000 years. I love being black. Our people love being black. We are deadly. That's why they try to control us, right? Control what we buy, when we buy it and where we buy it from. We are the oldest living culture in the world. Maybe that's the reason why they are always trying to control us. The government is always big at how staunch we are, how proud we are, and that we are still here. The strength of our matriarch still runs through this soil the resilience of our people is stronger than anything you have ever witnessed. This is, why we are, this is why we will not be voting for this protectionist bill. We are still here. You didn't wipe us out, even though that was the agenda, and we will continue to resist. If this government was serious about helping our people, then resource us to work towards treaties. Fund our community-controlled organisation. Fund co culturally appropriate homes for our people. Stop deciding what type of home we have to live in. Resource our legal services. Give us our land back. Restore the dignity of our lawmen and women and our cultures. 
This card does not do that. Our people have not forgotten being forced into missions, having our wages stolen, having our backs broken uh, and our Thorpe, families your time has separated. Expired. Please resume your seat, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, I join today in the chorus of voices in this parliament to oppose the cashless welfare bill of 2020 uh, and uh, the continuation of the cashless welfare bill that we've seen many iterations of this legislation come through this place in various forms. And we know that the government seeks today uh, in this legislation to make the cashless debit card permanent in the trial sites in which it currently operates, as well as roll it out to the Northern Territory. And I share absolutely the anger and frustration of many on this side of the chamber and around the country, many participants on the card and many communities. We know that the CDC has been the subject of any number of inquiries now. Those inquiries have consistently found that there is little evidence to show that the program works. But now we find that the government wants to make it permanent in some communities, but also that you want to roll it out in the entirety of the Northern Territory. And I have to say, it's disappointing when we see the good work that's been done in this parliament in securing the representation of the Northern Territory and helping it maintain two lower house seats in the House of Representatives, enfranchising Territorians, that the government ignores the community feedback about the cashless debit card from the Territory. This is no small point. The history of the Northern Territory in 1911, when it was split from South Australia, the history of the Northern Territory, it lost its democratic voting rights. You know, if the Northern Territory had 12 senators of its own or participated in electing the 12 senators to South Australia, this legislation, I don't believe, would be here before us today because the enfranchisement of First Nations people in the Northern Territory would have had an entirely different visibility and basis to it. But why was the Northern Territory uh, back in 1911 you know, managed by the Commonwealth as a remote territory? Well, frankly, because the thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of the of people. We don't actually know statistically how many people lived in the, in the territory at the time. But the many thousands of people that lived in the Northern Territory didn't have the right to vote at that time. And I reflect on the fact that had the people of the Northern Territory back in 1911 been white, if they had been white, then, of course, the Northern Territory would have had representation here in the federal parliament back at that time. And here again, we are paternalistically and in a patronising way seeking to say and distinguish that we in this place know best, know best what is best for the people of the Northern Territory. But this punitive micromanagement, it does nothing, absolutely nothing, to build the capacity and resilience of people and communities. The focus on making the cashless debit card compulsory is implicitly and overtly racist to do this to the Northern Territory. And I draw on the example of the lack of voting rights within the Northern Territory historically as a, as a parallel example of this. If we had proper participation and no paternalism in these policy debates, then these policies wouldn't be here before us. 
68 per cent of the people who will go on to the card uh, in the Northern Territory are indeed First Nations Australians. And the failure of the government to consult with these communities is uh, disappointing in the extreme. No, no, I, I but I can see why the government isn't consulting with people in a meaningful way. They're ideologically motivated to implement the cashless debit card. Ideologically motivated, despite the lack of evidence. When it comes to these debates, we must leave the cultural authority and leadership around finding things that work for community in the hands of those communities. Canberra is too far away and too remote. It's not them that are remote. It's not the Northern Territory that's remote. It's not the communities of the Kimberley that are remote. It is us that is remote from them. Many of those communities have had continuing cultures of many thousands of years. It is us that is remote from them. We've given these communities no real voice uh, on these issues. We have to talk about those issues in their communities in a way in which they determine uh, positions and their voices on it. I note that an evaluation undertaken by Adelaide University uh, was not even made available to the Senate committee that inquired into this bill for consideration uh, during their inquiry. Uh, and I find uh, the fact that, that the kind of evidence that the government asked for in terms of evaluations if it didn't suit, if it didn't suit your agenda of wanting to support the card, your own uh, evaluations have Senator been hidden Mayor, away. I just ask you to make your remarks through the chair. Thank you, Mr. Deputy uh, President. Labor's opposition is not ideologically driven. It's driven by the evidence that demonstrates that the scheme doesn't work. And so I ask through you, Mr Deputy President, rather than pursuing ideological policy that's not based in evidence, governments should be partnering with communities to support the health and economic well-being of First Nations Australians. A genuine attempt to partner with communities and listen to First Nations Australians, partner with communities to build their economic resilience and listen and work with them to deliver on community-driven health strategies. There's a very relevant uh, saying uh, within HIV communities, and we've seen it uh, in the context of COVID as well. If you're going to have proper strategies that work within community, the saying is, nothing about us without us. And this, is, this could not be more true in the case of uh, communities and First Nations communities. We've seen when governments say they don't trust their own communities, that things, that's not the kind of management that works. We shouldn't be simply saying that people can't be trusted to use their unemployment support uh, wisely. We shouldn't be saying the government simply knows better. A national independent study that ran over three years was funded by the Australian Research Council. It made a series of absolutely damning findings. The survey participants, 67 per cent of them, reported that they had no trouble at all managing their money before being placed on income management. 87 per cent of participants reported they did not have a problem with alcohol. And I suggest if you take your average welfare participant and you take your average senator, there's 76 of us, if you were to take 76 job seekers, I can tell you which cohort of people would spend more money 
on alcohol and it wouldn't be job seekers. Most cardholders felt income management has forced them, uh, for, was forced on them with minimal assistance and support to help them use it to their advantage. The research showed uh, that pe well, people had told researchers that income management had not only failed to alleviate the challenges of their lives, challenges that were largely non-existent in terms of issues like drugs and alcohol anyway, but it had caused financial problems that did not previously exist. Not having enough cash for essential items, difficulty providing for children and other family members because respondents did not have access to sufficient cash, difficulties participating in the cash economy because of lack of access to cash meaning you're unable to purchase second-hand goods, for example, and difficulties paying rent and other bills because of glitches with processing payments, particularly via the cashless debit card. I want to highlight in the context of, for example, remote communities in Western Australia, uh, there's a, a range of goods at the local store, but if you want to buy furniture, you have to travel a long way to get it from the nearest town, and more often than not, it'll be traded secondhand in a cash economy. So how is it that you buy furniture for your family in the context of not having access to sufficient cash? What's the point of micromanaging the finances of people who simply don't have enough to live on Anyway, and I can't help but uh, you know think about the context of the legislation before us, uh, where the cashless debit card, the government wants to see it rolled out across the Northern Territory, at the same time as reducing the welfare payments of people on it. I'm highly concerned, frankly, the astronomical amounts of money that have already been spent on the trial. Between 2015 and 2020, some $33.6 million was spent on the hotline, the management of the card, merchant management, administration, processing support, etc. Now that's a lot of money that could have gone into expanding uh, support services and giving people a better deal um, in their income support payments. The evidence from the West Australian Council of Social Services says attempting to address complex social issues with a blunt instrument like the cashless debit card is simply misguided and fails to meaningfully target the causes of the issues being experienced in the regions the card has been introduced. They said instead of a policy like the cashless debit card, the investment and focus for these regions should be on job creation, providing appropriate culturally accessible services that support people to maintain a basic standard of living and care for their families, address alcohol and other drug misuse problems uh, when those problems are present and maintain affordable and secure housing. Now, this card does none of that. And so in closing, I'm just going to reflect on, you know, people do have drug and alcohol problems in, in their lives. And for those that do have those significant problems, there's always a way around it. A Yalata figure told re ANU researchers. They said they're trying to stop people from drinking when they made this stuff. The person reflected with poignancy on the introduction of alcohol as part of the colonisation process. They made the alcohol and it never stops. You can't stop people from drinking. We've lost our vision. A card cannot give vision to the community. We know that we need uh, to empower uh, communities around the country, and we need to empower individuals. But this is not what the card does. 
Another person in this trial uh, said, I know from my ex-partner, he went away for rehab. He was missing his family. He got out and went back on heavy drugs. If there was a rehab centre here, he could have probably put his mind to it. So that was from Sejuna, and the nearest residential drug and alcohol facility is located some 500 kilometres away, Mr Deputy President. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Social Security Administration Amendment Continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020, um, which I think we call the cashless debit card. Now, this bill would make the cashless debit card a permanent program, not a trial, and it would replace the current basics card for about 25,000 people in the Northern Territory um, and for those in the Cape York region, uh, where there's no cap uh, on the number of participants uh, in that region. All up, about 82 per cent of people who will be transferred onto the cashless debit card in the Territory are First Nations people and most of them are living in remote communities. Now, income management um, from its outset was clearly racist because it was targeted at First Nations communities. And the response of the government was not to revoke this racist policy, but was to extend it to white communities so that it remained bad policy, but now it applied to more cohorts of people. Now, my home state of Queensland was um, one of those uh, test sites for the extension of the card. And the impacts of that trial on actual human beings, um, many of whom I've spoken with, as has Senator Seward, make it clear why the program should not be continued and certainly should not be expanded. The staggered rollout of the card in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay um, started in uh, January of 2019 um, and the rollout completed in mid-May of 2019. Queensland's peak social services body, the uh, Council of Social Services, or QCOS as they're known, conducted surveys in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay at the outset of the trial, after it had been running for several months. And contrary to the government's claim that the trial had support, the initial survey indicated 65 per cent opposition. That grew to 81 per cent during the trial. So the lived experience of being on the card or having family members on the card or working at an organisation whose clients were subjected to it hardened people's opposition. People with experience of being on the card reported problems with health or mental health issues. They reported uh, rent problems. And Senator Seawitt's already gone through some examples where rent was not paid uh, by uh, the administrators of the card, leading to uh, potential eviction by people who, through no fault of their own, had their rent mismanaged, thanks to those uh, running the card. Uh, people who uh, were on the card also experienced stigma and discrimination. They experienced cards being declined and cash-only opportunities missed. Some of the responses are truly heartbreaking, and I quote, My cards declined at supermarkets and petrol stations. I've been publicly shamed when using my card. Rents declined, missed out on second-hand goods. I can't shop at roadside, roadside stalls or markets. My kids have missed out on tuck shop and fundraiser school events. Uh, the next person who uh, corresponded with us and who wanted their story shared said, I quote, I feel embarrassed to pull my card out and pay at places, so I will often avoid shopping on busy days as the added stress makes my anxiety unmanageable. A third person says, I've personally been called a junkie and a doll bludger at the supermarket. Uh, now, Naomi, who wrote to me and is a Queensland single mum who has multiple sclerosis, uh, wrote to me when the news spread that the CDC trial could be expanded to other regions of Queensland. Naomi was terrified by what this card would mean for her and her family. Her youngest son had just finished uh, year 12 and was acting as her carer. He's a talented athlete, and Naomi was only able to afford the amount of nourishing food that he needs to stay fit and healthy by shopping at local farmers markets, something that I'm sure many of the people in this uh, chamber do regularly. Naomi was terrified that if CDC rolled out to her region, she'd have to forego healthy, affordable, locally grown produce at uh, markets where you pay with cash, and instead that she'd be forced to buy overpriced um, and much older and less fresh uh, supermarket food. 
She was worried that if her son had to contribute to those costs, that he would no longer be able to use the small amount of carer's allowance that he gets to pay for race entry fees. His athletics career would be over. These are the legitimate fears of a Queensland single mum with MS who is petrified about the effect of this card being rolled out across our state. Um, Catherine Wilkes lives in Bundaberg in Queensland. And she's been a fierce campaigner against the card for years. She's dispelled the mistruths. She's supported her community to speak out against the disaster of this program. Um, I visited Catherine, as has Senator Seawitt, and many others in the Bundaberg and Harvey Bay region, and we've heard stories uh, from people who've been forced onto the card. We've heard directly about the impact that it's had on their lives. Their experiences were all different, but they shared the view that the card had made their lives worse. It's punitive, and it does nothing to actually help people get a job or live with dignity. QCOS agrees, and they said, I quote, we believe addressing complex health and social issues, such as alcohol, drug or gambling problems, through the welfare system is fundamentally flawed. Evidence indicates that the cashless debit card is ineffective, expensive, harmful, unsupported, discriminatory and paternalistic, end quote. These experiences in Queensland serve as a warning. The cashless debit card should certainly not be made permanent and it should not be rolled out more broadly. My colleague, Senator Seawitt, um, and several of the other speakers have outlined the issues with compulsory income management more broadly and with this bill in particular. And she listed the many, many First Nations organisations that oppose this card. Of course, my colleague, Senator Thorpe, also gave us a very powerful speech about the disproportionate impact on First Nations communities of this policy approach. Um, this bill perpetuates a racist one-size-fits-all policy that targets First Nations and vulnerable people. It, uh, the bill and the rollout in the NT contradicts the closing the gap commitments. Changes introduced by this bill will make it even harder for people to get off the card, and it allows ongoing monitoring of a person's well-being even after they've managed to get off the card. This bill is not supported by any robust evidence that the card has met any of its objectives. In fact, the ANAO found that there was no evidence that there'd been a reduction in social harm at the trial sites. No evidence. The final evaluation of income management as part of the NT intervention found that it had met none of its objectives. And of course, we don't know what the University of Adelaide study that cost the taxpayer two and a half million dollars says, because not only is this government not releasing it into the public domain, but as I understand it from some of the other contributors, the minister herself has admitted she hasn't even read the report. I mean, this is just farcical in the extreme. This card is denying people their dignity and their quality of life. The cashless debit card is a punitive program that punishes people simply because they are on income support. Its impact has been to stigmatise and demean those who need support. And now, in the middle of a pandemic and an economic and jobs crisis, now is when the government decides it wants to make the cashless debit card permanent. Well, the government uses economic uncertainty as a basis to defer decisions about raising the rate of job seeker permanently, but it's happy to try and lock in compulsory income management. The inconsistency will cause a lot of human misery. The bill ignores the root cause of people's struggle to budget when on income support. And the root cause is the fact that they're trying to survive on inadequate payment amounts. Surely a better way to reduce hardship to support budgeting strategies and to return dignity to those on income support and increase their prospects uh, of gaining employment is to raise job seeker and youth allowance above the poverty line once and for all. Instead, we see this government spending millions uh, on an evaluation report that it won't release and on the privatised administration of this card. The astronomical amount that's been given to a private company to administer people's own money and to do so very poorly with multiple examples of stuff-ups that have had real-world consequences for people and their housing security. What a waste of money. That money that they've spent on privatising this card 
could have been a down payment on a permanent increase on JobSeeker. Now, as my colleague Senator Seawitt has said, it's kind of inconsistent to, uh, if you think that people uh, on no money can't manage money, how do you think they would learn to manage money if you are taking away their autonomy to do that? So there's a logical inconsistency. Uh, but more importantly, that is such a fallacy. People that don't have enough money know down to the last cent how to manage that money. They have to. Every single day they make choices, choices that no Australian should have to make, about whether or not to provide dinner for their family, for their kids, or buy their kids the latest textbook that their public school requires. Now, I don't imagine that anyone on this side of the chamber has ever had to face that sort of decision. And I know it's a cliche to say that they are out of touch, but I'm afraid in this instance it is true. They'll go off and have a nice, cosy Christmas holiday where they don't have to worry about where their next meal's coming from, and they don't have to have someone else telling them how they can spend their limited you money, have no and they will have absolutely no concept. You cannot make that comment. And I will take that interjection from Senator Hanson, who I this. believe is speaking next and will no doubt unleash a tirade of stereotypes and abuse and criticism of my fellow this. Queenslanders. And I would ask that she desist in interjecting, and we will attempt to do the same on her vile views when she shares them with the public. Order. But I will continue on. Um, the other misnomer that this card is based on is the assumption and the, and the um, abusive stereotype that people who are receiving income support, uh, firstly, that it's their own fault that they can't get a job, or secondly, that they're, they're druggies or alcoholics. If there are concerns with addiction, why don't you help people with a health-led response that actually addresses any of those addictions that might exist? But no, the approach is just a punitive income management approach. That won't actually solve any of those addiction problems where those problems do exist, and they are by, far, by no means universal. Most of the people on this card are single mums. Single mothers in my view, are the hardest working group of people in this nation. And the reward that they get from this government is an inadequate amount of income support and now a uh, paternalistic taking away of their dignity and their ability to make decisions on how to spend that limited amount of money. This card punishes people for not having work when what this government should actually be doing is creating jobs. I think the latest figure is that there are 13 people for every job available. There are 13 applicants for every single job going. This government washes its hands of job creation. I've heard them say on numerous times they think that's industry's job. No. You could actually be investing in positive infrastructure uh, to create jobs and solve other problems at the same time, like building schools, building hospitals, building renewable energy. You could be creating jobs. Instead, you punish people without jobs, you try to claim it's their own fault, and then you do nothing to fix the predicament that they're in. And then you try and mandate how they can spend their limited money. It is just out of touch in the absolute extreme. This card is punitive, it's ineffective, it's discriminatory, it's paternalistic, it's racist, and this government won't even release the report that says whether or not it works, when all of the other reports that have been released say that it doesn't. And the minister had the, <laughs> had the audacity to confess that she hadn't even read the evaluation report that she spent two and a half million dollars of public money on. It is absolutely outrageous. And now, five seconds before Christmas, they want to ram this bill through in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a jobs crisis, where they still haven't said what the final rate of job seeker will be, where they've condemned people on job seeker to poverty for so many years—24 years it went without getting a raise, and it was under the poverty line, and under this government it would drop back down to beneath the Henderson poverty line. Rather than fix that problem, they're handing out tax cuts to the very rich and to big corporates, and they're saying that job creation is not their problem. I, I just I cannot I cannot even fathom this government anymore. Um, I would like to foreshadow um, a second reader amendment, a second reading amendment, which stands in the name of Senator Seawitt, um, and I believe that we may well speak to that. It's been
it has been circulated in the chamber. Thanks very much, Deputy uh, President. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, the cashless debit card, the fact that this bill is apparently going to struggle to get supported is a very sad indictment on who we have become as a nation and, more importantly, what we have become as a Senate. It should be passing with strong support from all sides of the chamber. The cashless debit card trials have made sure that some of the most disadvantaged people in Australia have meals in their stomachs. They and their children have clothes on their backs and shoes on their feet. Thanks to the car, there is fuel in the cars and a roof over their heads because their rent and household bills have been paid. The cards do this by ensuring 80 per cent of the social security funds they receive are spent only on the necessities of life. It only applies to welfare recipients of working age and excludes those on age and veteran affairs pensions. It seems harsh and controlling to some. But if there is ill-disciplined spending that leads to significant health and social problems, the controls are beneficial. Without that control, many cardholders would slip back into a life dominated by alcohol, cigarettes, drugs and gambling, with the well-reported problems that go with those, including addictions. As we know, that you, uh, if you have the basics, you are more likely to participate in society generally, go to school, work well in a job, build a career, have a better life, and more likely to, to transition welfare to, um, off welfare to your own income. These are among the outcomes that Australians want from the social welfare system. We don't mind supporting those in need for a time, but we also want positive outcomes. We certainly don't want the taxpayer-funded social welfare handouts to be wasted through poor spending choices. Income management for many welfare recipients in North Territory, Cape York and Doomadgee in the Queensland Gulf have helped to generate the same positive outcomes. The basics card that is held by those in the, in the NT and the Cape on these schemes ensures a, a predetermined proportion of a participant's welfare funds are spent on the basics of life, including health items like medicines, hygiene products, some product public transport services, certain bills like electricity, doctor's appointments, and as well as school meals for the children where they are provided. Cardholders can also make purchases at department stores and even use the funds to pay off bigger items through services like lay-by if they choose. The basics card can be used at 15,500 participating outlets around Australia. The cardholder can have 60, 75 or 90 per cent of their regular fortnightly payments managed, as well as 100 per cent of any advances or lump sum payments. The overall aims of these systems are to support the needy through good financial management and to ensure that kids are safe, fed and educated. This lines up uh, with one Hansen, of my personal— Senator Hanson, please resume your seat. I would ask senators not to interject. The senator has the right to be heard in silence, um, and I would ask that you refrain from making comments out loud. Please continue, Senator Hanson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This lines up with one of my personal platforms in all my dealings with welfare recipients, including those who are Indigenous Australians. The Cape York Welfare Reform aims to address dependence on welfare and support people in the communities of Arakoon, Cohen, Hope Vale and Mossman Gorge to resume primary responsibility for the well-being of their family and their communities. The control mechanisms also mean the welfare funds cannot be directly spent on alcohol, pornography, tobacco products, gambling, home brew systems and ingredients, or gift cards that can be swapped with others in exchange for cash, credit or goods. The goal is for the sordid symptoms of such purchases to also then be reduced, like alcohol abuse, domestic violence, including abuse of children, drug purchases and drug use, hunger and poverty. The cashless debit card has been trialled in four places around Australia. Firstly, in the Sedona region of South Australia and in Kununurra and Wyndham in the East Kimberleys of Western Australia from mid-2016. Um, in 2017, an evaluation report of ORIMA research found the cards had considerable positive impact in the two trial communities. 41 per cent of those who drink alcohol were reported drinking alcohol less frequently. 37 per cent of participants who binge drink reported binge drinking less frequently. 48 per cent reported gambling less. 
48 per cent reported using illegal drugs less often. The evaluation also found many related benefits, such as 40 per cent of those surveyed said they were better off better able to look after their children. 45 per cent said they, had, they have been better able to save money. And feedback from the communities revealed a decrease in requests for emergency food relief and financial assistance in Sejuna. These are the reports that have come back. It is, has the percentages which I've just read out. But if you listen to others in the Senate, they actually have um, raised uh, issues that they don't have the freedom. It hasn't had uh, any impact whatsoever. This clearly shows that it has. And increased purchases on baby items, food, clothing, shoes, toys and other goods for children. Community leaders reported a reduction in crime, violence and harmful behaviours during the trial period. It was rolled out in the Goldfields region of Western Australia from March 2018 and has been on trial in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay in Queensland, where it has the additional restriction of applying only to those 35 and under. Welfare recipients are given the chance to opt into this system, and many choose to do this themselves because they recognise the benefits of enforcing more focused spending on the money. Those on age and vet veteran affairs pensions can apply for voluntary inclusion in the scheme. And what I have spoken about before is that it's a term that they use in these Aboriginal communities. It's called humbugging, where they actually, a family member, comes and insist that they hand over money to them. And that's why they are quite happy to be on the card, <clears throat> because they can say, I can't give you money, I haven't got it. So then those families uh, Senator have Hanson, the money. Please resume your seat, Senator Thorpe. Deputy President, I bring your attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, yes, quorum required. A quorum has been reached. Senator Hanson, please continue your remarks. Thank you very much. As I said, the term was humbugging. So actually, this is in these communities. So they know that their family members are actually coming, taking the money from them. Um, now, I just want to turn to something here because we're talking about cashless debit card, and I can't let what Senator Thorpe said in this chamber earlier about, you know, um, her comments was it's her land. Well, and. And I remember her comment to me yesterday. We're talking about the Indigenous community, and it has been raised that they're saying they're racist. This is against, you know, and, um, this is racist legislation. Well, it's not because it's not just directed at Aboriginals, but I, the fact is saying it's her land. No, it is everyone's land who was born Hanson, here. Senator please resume your seat. Senator Thorpe. Point of order. Uh, what's sorry? What's your name? Um, Senator, Senator Hanson. Hanson. Oh, whatever. Uh, order. So, What's your point of um, order, Senator Thorpe? Point of order. Uh, I find it uh, offensive that we be called them, they, Senator Aborigines. Thorpe, that's a debating point. Thank you. Please resume your uh, contribution, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. As I was saying, you know, they, they make comments that this is racist. It's not racist at all, as all, at all. It's about doing what is right for the people in our communities, Australia-wide. And if it's these communities that have asked for it, and I've speaking to, spoken to the Indigenous people, the elders, and different ones that want this because it's helping their communities and it's stopping the abuse that's going on. Domestic violence. You know, the Greens in this place are all the time about domestic violence and they notice this emotion. Wouldn't they want to address this so that there is no alcohol abuse? 
the drinking that's going on, which causes the alcohol abuse, you know, domestic violence, they're not interested in that. And when Senator Thorpe talks about her land, well, what's about the white part? Where's her white father and all this? Who I should say is a member of the One Nation uh, Party. Senator Hanson, I'll remind you, it is um, not appropriate to uh, refer to other senators. Um, so I would ask you to withdraw those remarks. Thank you. Well, I don't need to withdraw, withdraw those Senator remarks. Senator Hanson, you are not debating with me. I've asked you to withdraw the remarks. What the remarks? Which, which remarks? I am not repeating the offence. Re there was with no offence. Senator Hanson, are you arguing with the Deputy President of the Senate? Because I've directed well, you to withdraw those remarks. Well, I need to know which remarks, because I made a, line, I made a few comments there. Senator Hanson, I am not going to repeat what well, you the said. Part of is her Senator Hanson, please right resume your part... seat. Senator Hanson, please resume your seat. It is my responsibility under the standing orders of the Senate to ensure that debate is within the standing orders. I further remind you of a statement the President made on several occasions in this place about how this is a workplace and how we need to respect one another and to not uh, refer to other senators in a personal way. So I would ask you to withdraw the remarks that you made about Senator Thorpe's family. Thank you. I'm not asking you, it's not a debating point. I'm directing you to do that. So please do that. Sorry. Um Madam Acting Deputy President, to make uh, reference to her father. Senator, is, I am not white. the Acting De Deputy you know, President. I've, I'm the Deputy President. I've directed you to withdraw the remarks. So please well, do if, so. Uh, uh, if it suits you, I withdraw the remarks. Thank you. Now please continue. Fine. Order. Senator Hanson, please resume your seat. No, please resume your seat. This is a very difficult debate, and I appreciate the sentiments on both sides. But Senator Hanson is entitled to make her contribution, and she's entitled to make it in silence with, with the consent of other senators. If you don't wish to listen to Senator Hanson's remarks or any other remarks of senators, you are quite free to leave the chamber. I would ask that Senator Hanson be given um, the respect to continue her remarks in, with the silence and consent of other senators. Please continue, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. As I said, this, the cashless welfare card is a benefit to all Australians, and it's going to help those people. And I, and I outlined the reasons here. You know, I don't like the debate in this chamber that's been directed because it's racist. It's about looking after and caring about Australians and helping them with their spending. There is problems in these communities. I have been to these Aboriginal communities. I've spoken to the people. I've spoken to the to the business leaders, I've spoken to the councils, I've listened to the people's concerns. This isn't just plucked out of air that, we've, that uh, we should actually be denying these people the right to, to spend their welfare pay payments, but when it has an impact on the children, if we really care about the future generations, then why aren't we doing something about it? You know the problems are there, so we've actually got to do something about it. And you talk about their rights and their human rights. Well, you know what? So many people and former prime ministers in this country have said, well, you know, the best thing to do is go and get a job. If you get a job, you earn your money, you go and spend it whichever way you want to. And I'll tell you the feelings of many taxpayers. And one woman said to me, she said, I walk out of my house of mourning. She said, and the neighbour's next door, Sydney's porch, and he says, oh, bye, love. He said, have a good day. So then she goes to work all day. She pays her taxes. She comes home. Oh, the neighbour says, oh, hi, love. I hope you had a good day. And he's sitting there with the beer in his hand. He's had a wonderful day. He hasn't had the responsibility to go and get a job. And uh, is, so this is the attitude of a lot of people on welfare payments. They have no responsibility to the taxpayers. And I tell you what, the taxpayers of this nation have a, had a gutful getting taxed more and more and more, and their money goes into welfare. Our bill in this nation is nearly to $190 billion in welfare payments. Now, those people on welfare have a responsibility to the taxpayer, and why shouldn't they actually have to be responsible? You know, a lot of workers out there in mine sites, they actually have to have drug testing. You can't have drugs in your system if you're going to attend a lot of workplaces. 
Why shouldn't these people be accountable to the taxpayer that they are not spending taxpayers' hard-earned dollars on alcohol and drugs and gambling? Why shouldn't they? What is the problem with that? What the government's cash card is ensuring this, this money is spent on food, clothing, essentials that they need, that their rent is paid. That's what this card's about. It's not about talking about a person's rights. When you go on this card, you basically lose your rights as well. If you, if you, go, on, if you go on a welfare system, you've lost your rights. You have a responsibility to the taxpayer of this nation. And that's a big problem. We've got third and fourth generation that are on welfare because it becomes a, a way of life. And that's not good enough. That's not what I want for the Australian people. There are, there are real benefits in this. If you actually vote against this and you don't support this card from, from January 1, this is actually going to fall over. You are going to find that in these communities they will go and spend their money on alcohol. You will have an increase in domestic violence. You will have more problems in these communities. And you don't give a damn about that. That's what's a big concern about all this. You have to understand the impact of not supporting this card. There is no evidence from the government whatsoever that they intend to roll this out um, Australia-wide to anyone else, any other areas, other than where it is now before the next election. These communities, they were just plucked out through a dart at the border in Australia and said, we're going to put this cashless debit card there. They actually have asked for it. These communities asked for this trial. You've got people that have signed up to it. They don't have to be on it, but they signed up to it. Why? Have you really asked yourself these questions? Because you've got a few letters from people saying, oh, well, you're denying us our right. We can't spend the money how we want to. And you talk about they go to the, go to the markets and they can't buy fresh food because they, they don't have the card there. They have 20 per cent of their money in their pocket. 20 per cent of the money is in cash. They can spend it how they want to. And yet you're denying that. Yet I don't see any rhyme or reason why you're actually doing this. But I'm, I will not sit here in the Senate and hear other senators claim that it's their land. This is racist, that um, you know, you're picking on a certain uh, number of people. Like I said, you have in some of these communities, which are, um, you know, the the population is truly um, Aboriginality, but that is the problem. You really need to go and look at these communities. You need to travel through them. You have to understand. But it's not that in Harvey Bay and Bundaberg. It's for everyone. It's for Australians, and I'm sick and tired of hearing the division in this nation of whether it's Indigenous or non-Indigenous. This is about helping Australians regardless of the colour of your skin. It's about trying to make a difference for, for many people here. Now, this, um, this card is also, um, like I said, it will finish in January the 1st. I, it was very important. I did to give you the percentages uh, with regards to this. And the, I was talking about the, um, the basics card. The advantage of those basic card holders is that a number of the outlets they can purchase from jumps considerably to 900,000 retail, retailers and outlets. So those senators that are opposing this card, you know, I've just got to say to them, what you've said in the past is go and get a job. That's right. Go and get a job. And, you, and to hear other senators say, well, the government should be providing the incentives and starting infrastructure. I totally agree. You know, we should have these infrastructure projects and make jobs and get jobs for people. But you've got to also understand that there's a lot of people out there who don't want to work. And I've spoken to a lot of business people. The jobs are available, but they don't even apply for these jobs. A lot of businesses are applying. Farmers can't get workers here in Australia. And the whole fact is they can't get workers because the welfare is too good. It may look poor in our eyes because we are fortunate enough to have very good jobs that pay very well. 
but a lot of us have worked hard to get here. But many people are quite happy to live on the, the welfare payments thank that you, they Senator receive. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, Labor opposes this bill, and Labor rejects the statements made by Senator Hanson in this chamber today. So many people from around the country have contacted me to let me know that they oppose this bill too. I want dignity and respect, not the cashless debit card. These are the words of Hannah from Nunawading in Victoria, and these words, this sentiment is repeated time after time in letter after letter and email after email that my office has received on this scheme. People do not want this card. Hannah knows, as do all the people who have contacted my office, that this bill lays the foundation. It lays the foundation for a punitive and compulsory income management to be rolled out across the country. This is yet another government policy, another government scheme that proves clearly that this government's policy towards low-income people is to disrespect them, to disempower them, to demonise them. This is the reason why the government are still pursuing the compulsory rollout of this card. First Nations don't want it. Australians don't want it. And every test, every review, every piece of research has told us that this card does not achieve its stated aims. It doesn't work. This bill and this scheme is straight out of the Liberal Party's bottom drawer. It's straight out of their old, tired, nasty playbook. It is designed to drive people down, not to lift them up. And the bill is a stalking horse for a national rollout of the cashless welfare scheme. The bill will make the card permanent in the existing trial sites of Seduna, the East Kimberley, the Goldfields and Bundaberg Harvey Bay. In the, in the Northern Territory, it permanently replaces the Basics card with the cashless debit card. Uh, and in Cape York, it replaces the Basics card with the cashless debit card too. Across these sites, the bill will lead to over 34,700 people on the cashless debit card, permanently, without any choice, compulsory income management. And we also know that government ministers have previously backed a national rollout of this scheme. We know that the government continues to invest in the back of house technology that would allow it to conduct that national rollout. And we know that this government has an ideological obsession with income management, regardless of the facts and regardless of the evidence. This bill is a step towards the national rollout that this government so desperately wants, a national rollout that would impact over 1.6 million Australians on unemployment payments, many of whom have just lost their jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic. The government argues that the cashless debit card scheme for social security recipients reduces hardship and deprivation, helps with budgeting strategies and reduces the time recipients spend on welfare and out of the workforce. And they hope to achieve this by forcing recipients to use a cashless card, a card which quarantines 80 per cent of their social security payments. And we know that it isn't working. The cashless debit card and compulsory income management have been the subject of multiple inquiries, multiple inquiries that this government has chosen to ignore. It's pretty clear that this scheme is causing harm, it's causing hardship, it's making budgeting more difficult and it's penalising people who are already doing it tough. A recent independent study using data from the Seduna trial site was the latest to prove just how ineffective this scheme is. They found no impact on the outcomes the government says it is trying to achieve. No impact in a trial site where this government wants to make the scheme permanent. It was found to have no impact. Dr Luke Greenacre from the University of South Australia and one of the researchers on this study summed up the scheme by saying this. The card offers very little, if no, return on investment, and the cost of implementing and administering the card isn't producing substantial community benefits. Another study from early this year wrote about how this scheme was causing more harm than good. 
that it was causing feelings of stigma, shame and frustration amongst participants. Professor Greg Marston from the University of Queensland said that when interviewing participants for the study, and I quote, they would become visibly upset, recalling incidents where they've been called out for being on the cards and the way in which they hide the cards when they're making transactions in shops. He goes on to say that most participants never had issues with managing their budgets or spending, but that their biggest problem was that they just didn't have enough money for essential items. The study concludes that the case for continuing the scheme is weak. And last year, Dr Elise Klein from the University of Melbourne told a Senate committee, if we are serious about evidence-based policy making, we must stop the ongoing operations of the cashless debit card or make it entirely voluntary. Again, if we are serious about evidence-based policy making, we must abolish the card or make it entirely voluntary. So it is clear. Many years after the first mandatory income management was introduced, five years since the cashless debit card was introduced, it does not work. And it is clear that this card, this scheme, is having an overwhelmingly negative impact on people's lives. Emily from Bundaberg is already on the card. She says that hearing that the scheme would become permanent was hard to take. When asked how it made her feel, she said, I guess hopelessness is the best way to describe it. Hopelessness. And those on social security elsewhere in the country are terrified that the card will be rolled out nationally. Hannah from Nunna Wadding, who I mentioned earlier, says being forced onto the cashless debit card will further disempower me. And Leslie from Katoomba says, I resent the fact that the government believes that responsible people like myself are unable to manage our own finances. This card takes away our rights, our independence and more. People who have the card don't want it. People who might have to have the card in the future, they don't want it. And we know that all the evidence that has been collected points towards the card not working, not achieving the government's stated aims. But it gets worse because this scheme and this card are clearly racially discriminatory. Out of the 34,700 people this bill would put on the card permanently with no choice, 68% are First Nations people. And First Nations peoples, organisations and representatives say the policy is just yet another government imposition. Senator Dodson and Senator McCarthy have spoken in this chamber today and described how this card takes away the autonomy of First Nations people, how it takes away their self-determination. And this is just another policy without adequate consultation imposed on First Nations, without adequate consent from the community, compulsory income management, it is racially discriminatory. And all Australians want a government that delivers practical solutions for their lives, not tired old ideological positions like this one. But what they have is a government whose only plan for their future is to take away their ability to empower themselves, to make their own decisions, to find their own solutions to the problems that they face. But the government just doesn't seem to care about that because this bill is just another example, another example of how their approach to low-income Australians is demonisation. Because this government thinks that if you fall on hard times, it's your fault. According to Social Services Minister Senator Rustin, in her own words, giving people more money would do absolutely nothing. Probably all it would do is give drug dealers more money and give pubs more money. And according to the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, as we all know, if you have a go, you'll get a go. The harder you work, the better you do. And if you're good at your job, you'll get a job. These are their own words. And we all know what they're really saying. If you're poor, it's your fault. If you fall on hard times, it's your fault. If you're poor, you can't be trusted with your own money. This is the kind of thinking that drives their old, tired, nasty 
policy positions, policy positions that are straight out of their playbook, policy positions that have nothing to do with evidence, nothing to do with facts, nothing to do with what is actually proven to work, policy positions that end up causing pain despair and disempowerment. The cashless debit card is not the first program to cause this level of hurt to vulnerable and low-income Australians. We have just seen the government forced into repaying over a billion dollars to the victims of robo-debt, a scheme that hounded and harassed people, that caused them anxiety and stress, a scheme that derailed lives, a scheme that destroyed lives, a scheme that targeted vulnerable, low-income Australians. Robo-debt was deeply flawed. It was illegal. The government knew it for years, but they insisted that that scheme go on anyway. Based on the evidence and the research, based on the stories and concerns of those on the cashless debit card already, we can see that this scheme is really no different, no different to robo-debt, because the government actually knows that it doesn't work. It knows it has a negative impact on vulnerable Australians, but it's going to push it forward anyway. Why? Because this is a government that goes after poor people. This is a government that hounds poor people. This is a government that harasses them. They attack their dignity. They invade their privacy. This is a government that relentlessly pursues poor people and drives them into the ground. And that tells you everything that you need to know about this government. The cashless debit card takes this approach so far that even some of the government's own MPs have got cold feet about this bill. The member for Bass, Bridget Archer, was damning in her assessment of the scheme. She said the scheme was punitive. She said that there is just not enough evidence that supports this program to justify the associated harm that it causes. And the member for Bass, she summed it up pretty well when she said, whenever you approach a human program by inciting shame and guilt, you have already lost those who you are seeking to help. The member for Monash, Russell Broadbent, also admits concerns about the cashless debit card scheme. So the government are just, uh, they are not only ignoring the experts on this bill and on this program, they're not just ignoring the communities that this is going to impact so negatively, they're also ignoring now their own backbench. Just like they ignored the warnings about robo-debt, they're ignoring, ignoring the warnings about the cashless debit card. And this scheme, as we know, is straight from the Liberal Party's bottom drawer, straight from the bottom drawer of their nasty, tired, old, ideologically driven playbook. This is the government's priority right now for this country, this bill. This is the bill the government wants to pass this week. This is the bill that they want to focus on when they should be lifting people up, not driving them into the ground. This is the bill that they want to pass this week when they should be focused on a big, bold, inclusive plan for Australia's recovery, not a plan that is discriminatory, a plan that is inclusive and that lifts everyone up. They should be focused on a plan which empowers people, which empowers people to find work, a plan that creates good, secure jobs. Um, a plan with real heart. That's what Australians are looking for from this government this week, in this last sitting of this parliament. They're looking for a plan with real heart, not a plan that demonises people, not a plan that drives them to absolute despair. Australians are looking to this government for a plan that gives them hope, hope for a better future. Uh, and instead, what we have this week, in this last sitting of parliament for this year, is this bill, this bill, which we know is racially discriminatory. They're focused on this bill, a bill which takes away autonomy and choice for First Nations and for all people who are pushed onto this card. They're focused on a bill which has Social Security recipients around the country alarmed, alarmed that the card 
is going to be imposed on them too. Uh, this is a bill that lacks basic evidence. It's a bill that lacks support around the country. It's a bill with damaging consequences. Thank you, and Senator I urge the Senate Walsh, your time to reject has expired. it. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Social Security Administration Amendment, continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020. The Greens strongly oppose this bill. The Greens and I completely reject Senator Hansen's disgraceful contribution to this bill by referring to and bringing in a family member of Senator Thorpe's in her speech is a new law for Senator Hans Hansen. Senator if Senator Fariki, Hansen has Senator a scary... Fariki, please resume your seat. Senator Hansen was asked to and withdrew that remark, so it's not appropriate to continue to refer to it. Thank you. Pauline Hansen's One Nation Party epitomises what is wrong with this bill. Racism and discrimination. This bill will make current cashless debit card trial sites permanent and extend the card to the Northern Territory and Cape York to replace the basics card. Compulsory income management is paternalistic. It is cruel. It victimizes people. It punishes people for being poor and unemployed. Compulsory income management in Australia has been cynically and disgracefully targeted towards First Nations communities, from the introduction of the basics card as part of the Northern Territory intervention to its expansion to trials in communities with higher than average proportions of First Nations people. This bill is racist. This <coughs> bill is discriminatory. This bill further punishes people who have been targeted by governments <coughs> for more than 200 years. The government has provided no evidence that compulsory income management improves people's lives. As the Greens' dissenting report to the bill inquiry points out, the government continues to rely on debunked data from a single flawed evaluation to justify compulsory income management, while ignoring other independent studies that question the card's utility and find that it causes stigma, shame and frustration. The evidence base for continuing or extending compulsory income management is just not there. What we do have is the testimony of people who are directly affected by this terrible policy, people who have already been hurt and people who will be hurt if this bill passes. The Senate inquiry into this bill heard from people who have either experienced life on the punitive cashless debit card or who are terrified of being forced onto it when it is expanded. The inquiry heard criticism and concerns from First Nations people, disabled people, single mothers, people who have struggled with their mental health, and people who have suffered as a result of unemployment and a broken social security system. Um, and I want the Senate to hear what some of these people had to say. You should all know exactly what you are being asked to vote on in the words of the most important people those who have been and who will be harmed by the passage of this bill. There are too many to fit in my speech today, but I will read out some of them, and I'll start with a couple of excerpts on racism and discrimination. I know myself it was targeted to Aboriginal people, but for the government to sort of keep their nose clean, they involved everybody else. So it didn't have to be didn't look like it was pointed directly at Indigenous people. But we know, as Indigenous people, that's what it was. In my point of view, it's racial discrimination and a human rights breach, because this card was really aimed at Indigenous people. The card was designed to control the alcohol, but it hasn't. And the people that are doing good by it, we are getting the full punishment. It's just racist and violates our human rights, and it's not fair. Some people reflected on mental health, saying, having experienced the difference in my mental and emotional health, both participating in the cashless debit card trial, I can unreservedly say that the trial was one of the lowest points in my life. 
The fear of possibly being forced into it again is absolutely debilitating to my mental health and it has prevented me from fully appreciating the freedom of being taken off the card. The stigma of the card has increased my levels of depression and anxiety. It will be, con it will be a consistent reminder that I am unable to gain paid employment because of my disabilities, which I was born with. I didn't have a choice on the matter. I feel that this card will make me feel like a third-rate citizen who is perceived as not being able to manage my own money. Other people described some of the most terrible of the impacts. Over the last five years, I have watched as people have become homeless, become hopeless, been medicated, tried to kill themselves, have opportunities ripped away for self-employment as Hindu refused to allow access to their cash to be able to buy back stock, etc. I have seen people bullied, reduced to tears. I have seen Hindu staff try to trick young people into giving out bank and credit card information for their parents without consent. The women and their children are copying the brunt of the stigma, exclusion and financial destruction caused by being forced onto the card. The Hindu card makes life as a single mother more difficult than usual. You just lose any control in your life. You can't even properly manage your budget and go shopping with confidence. And others reflected on disability. I have enough to deal with already being disabled. My life is already horrible and my family is brought down by my disability. It's demeaning and an awful way to live. I don't need the card making my life more miserable than it already is. I feel my depression would become unbearable if there were more restrictions put onto my life and my husband's life. And so many people reflected on the shame and misery that this card brings. The day I applied for this income support is the day my world changed, as my life became one of shame. In the eyes of politicians and the Australian public, I was someone to be vilified and demeaned. The thought of being put onto forced income management and the Hindu card horrifies me, and the economic control it represents fills me with anger. This card spreads misery and suffering. To support the cashless debit card and compulsory income management requires either supreme ignorance or intentional malice. I do not know which would be worse, though given that the result is the same either way, I guess it does not matter. Please show the public that you are better than that. I wish I had time to read more of these, so the people who are supporting this terrible, cruel, punitive bill that punishes others in the community could listen to more of what people had to say. This rubbish card and this rubbish bill is all about controlling the lives of some people. And we know exactly whose lives this government wants to control. The lives that they want to control are the lives that they don't think are deserving of the same dignity and the same rights as they are. So I ask you all today, and especially the crossbenchers, to have some empathy, to listen to, and actually hear the people that you are effectively punishing if you vote for this bill. The Greens and I vehemently oppose this bill. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Green. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I'm joining this debate today to, to talk about, uh, as many speakers have done, the personal stories of people who uh, have been on this card and are looking uh, through this legislation at the possibility of um, permanently 
being on the cashless debit card and the impact that that has had on their lives and will continue to have on their lives going forward. But I also want to take some time today to address some of the misconceptions about the way that this program is operating in Cape York, because I know that that has been referenced on many occasions. And um, I've actually spoken to the people who are running this program, and so I want to spend some time to talk about that today as well. I want to respond to some of the pretty disgusting things that uh, Senator Hanson said about people uh, on this card, but also just people generally who, who at times in their lives need to seek support from the government. Uh, and ultimately, we know that this legislation uh, will be voted on uh, and decisions will be made by our crossbench senators. So I want to take some time today to appeal to those crossbench senators about this legislation because we know that it is a big decision to make and a lot of pressure would be bearing down from the government on those senators to make a decision to support this program. But can I say that this is not, this is not the legislation to let the government off. This is not the legislation to let the government get away with thuggish, cruel behaviour that treats vulnerable people as if they are worthless. This is not the legislation to let the government get away with pushing through a policy with no evidence in the last week of the parliament because they want to get this done before they go home for Christmas. This is not the legislation. We know that the Prime Minister is the architect of the robo-debt scheme. This is not the legislation for our crossbench senators to let this Prime Minister get away with yet another scheme that will hurt vulnerable Australians. But it is the personal stories that we need to listen to today, because the government will make assumptions or uh, assume um, that they know best. But we need to listen directly to the people who are affected by this legislation. Karen Griffiths, a mother of four from Queensland, told 7.30 report, I feel like in the government's eyes I'm a lesser person. In the public's eyes it's much, much worse. What have I ever done for the government to treat me this way, to treat thousands of other people this way? We've been branded as drug addicts and alcoholics and gamblers and doll bludgers. Most of us are just doing the best we can to get by. Extraordinary words. The government eyes I'm a lesser person. This government is treating people as if they are worth less. Bundaberg resident Emile Randall, who is 28 years old, was placed on the card in November 2019 after she finished full-time study and moved on to the job seeker payment. She said the decision to make the card permanent where she lives was difficult to accept. It's hard to put into words, she said. I guess hopelessness is the best word to describe it. I was putting everything into them ending the trial in December. I am really frightened for what it means for the future. Hopelessness. This is what this program does to vulnerable Australians. And the governments, governments are supposed to look after vulnerable people, not punish them. And if the government won't protect our most marginalised and disadvantaged Australians, then this Senate has to step up and do that job and block this legislation. That is the job that this Senate must do because we know that this government won't. This bill and this program has not had an evaluation made public for senators to consider about whether it even works in the first place. We've received antidotal evidence uh, from people who support the legislation, people who have an interest a very big interest in getting this legislation passed. But the Social Services Minister, Anne Rustin, admitted in the Senate that she didn't even read the report before deciding to make the cashless debit card permanent. The Morrison government has spent $2.5 million on a University of Adelaide report and didn't even wait for its findings before deciding to proceed. And that is because this is legislation 
That isn't about evidence-based policy making. This is about ideology. This is about treating people like they are worthless. This speaks to the government's ideological obsession with income management and attacking the most vulnerable. It is the same ideological obsession which led to robo-debt and the harm, the mental harm that robo-debt caused. There have been many inquiries and reports into the effectiveness of income management in the past, and what the evidence has shown is that compulsory, broad-based income management is causing significant harm to communities. The Auditor-General has found no evidence that cashless debit card works and recommended better baseline data collection and monitoring. Independent analysis of the card by the University of South Australia made several findings, including that it has had no impact on reducing gambling or intoxicant abuse. Yes. Uh, it doesn't work. It is not doing what the government says it's going to do. And that is one of the reasons why the crossbench senators, senators in this chamber, should not support this legislation. The study found that the costs of implementing and administering the card came with little to no return on investment. So it costs money to deliver this card and to deliver this program. And we're talking about value to taxpayers because taxpayers provide this welfare in the first place. But it's actually taxpayers that are being ripped off because there is no return on investment for a program like this, because it doesn't set out to do what the government wants to achieve. It actually has the opposite effect. Very large amounts of evidence show that 13 years of new income management in the Northern Territory has had almost no positive impact. No positive impact, and yet the government is still trying to push this legislation through. The cashless debit card will affect two areas of Queensland directly, and I want to talk about both of those communities today. The Bundaberg and Harvey Bay on the Fraser Coast and communities in the Cape York region. And they're two very distinct communities, and the government has chosen to make the trials permanent in those two communities for various reasons, but they will have the same impacts. From the outset, can I say it reflects very poorly on the members in the other chamber who represent these communities in Queensland that they didn't have the guts to step up and speak about this legislation. They voted for it. They sat on the other chamber and they voted for the legislation, but they didn't have the guts to stand up and say why they were supporting it. And that's because they know that in their community there is no support for this card. They are waving these changes through without questioning or making it clear to the parliament where they stand. Now, those two personal stories that I read out at the beginning, they're from locals from the Bundaberg and Harvey Bay area. Many, many members of the community in Harvey Bay and Bundaberg have campaigned against this card, but they are not being listened to. The member for Hinkler and the member for White Bay have completely gone missing on this. And it really does go to show that in the last state election, these two areas swung towards Labor, and they were two areas where Labor actually picked up seats in the state election. And I mention that because it's a warning to this government that if you go down this road, if you go down this road, the community will respond. They will respond to this. You're not giving them an, a, a jobs program or a jobs plan, a way to create jobs. Unemployment is through the roof in these areas. They don't want income management. They want jobs. But that's not what this government is doing. If I can make some brief comments around the Cape York program, because it's very important that this Senate understands that this program in Cape York is completely different from what is being considered by this government to be rolled out across the country. There are 128 people in income management in communities like Arakoon, Cohen, Doomadgee, Hopevale, Mossman Gorge. Importantly, the decision to move to income management is only made 
after case management and discussions with the person involved. It is also regularly reviewed, and this is completely different from how the cashless debit card operates in other parts of the country. It is not okay for this government to tie that program to the rest of these programs across the country to try to say that this legislation needs to be pushed through, otherwise that program in Cape York could fall over. We support that program in Cape York because the community members support that program. It is operating in a completely different way from the rest of the country. And if the government wanted to do the hard work, they could have taken that program out of this legislation and dealt with it separately. But they've put it in this legislation to try to put a timeline on passing this broader program through the Senate. Again, cruel behaviour, thuggish behaviour from this government. We know that this bill will impact First Nations people more than any other group. And it was disappointing to see those comments from Senator Hanson today. I know that maybe she has visited some of the communities in Cape York, but she certainly hasn't listened. She certainly hasn't listened to them, because if she did, she would not be supporting a broader rollout of this program. Even the members of Cape York understand that their program is separate from the one being rolled out across the country. And they don't like the idea of this government using them to justify putting more First Nations people in the Northern Territory into a difficult position. I started this speech by talking about personal stories. We have heard from people directly affected by this scheme. Can I say many of them are single parents? I grew up in a single parent household and I am proud of our life that we had and I'm proud of where I came from. I'm proud of the lessons that it taught me and the truth that comes from knowing that you're not better than anybody else and no one is better than you just because you had the luck to be born in another suburb. But I understand feeling just like Karen when she says, I feel like in the government's eyes I'm a lesser person. And the problem with feeling like that, feeling like you're worthless, is that it becomes self-defeating and it becomes self-fulfilling. It is hard to step up and to step out of poverty when you are treated like dirt by this government. There are many single parents who have fled their homes to escape domestic violence, and this card will prevent those families from starting a new life. I know I was a kid bundled into a car to leave. I've, I've stood there with friends and, and gotten all of their belongings together so that they could leave a home of domestic violence. One of the most important factors is having financial security. And if this government wants to tell people how they can and can't spend their money, then it will definitely impact on those single parents and the kids that they are seeking to protect. There are many, many single parents out there who this will impact. And I honestly understand what it's like to feel embarrassed, but I don't understand why a government would want to embarrass people. Governments are meant to lift people up, not make them feel worse about themselves. So I'm asking the crossbench, and particularly Senators Lambie and Senator Patrick, to not let this government get away with making people feel like this. They've done a dodgy job on this program and this legislation from the beginning. There's no evidence. They haven't even read the report. They've left it to the last minute. Well, let them wear it. Let the government wear this problem. Let them fix the problems that not passing this legislation creates. Let them cop it. Because if we pass this legislation, the people that are going to cop it are the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in our entire country. Don't let the government get away with this. Do not let the government get away with ma making people feel absolutely Thank you, worthless. Senator. Thank you, Senator. Senator Billick, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President.
I rise to speak on this bill, which is purported to be about reducing the rates of alcohol, drug and gambling addiction, but is actually a triumph of ideological posturing over evidence-based policy making. The bill will make the cashless debit card permanent in the existing trial sites of Sir Junior, the East Kimberley, the Goldfields and Bundaberg, Hervey Bay. It will also permanently replace the basics card with the cashless debit card in the Northern Territory and in Cape York and extend income management in Cape York until 31 December 2021. Madam Acting Deputy President, this is an ill-conceived, racist and un-Australian bill seeking to implement a poorly thought-through policy. It also contradicts the government's stated approach to Indigenous affairs. First Nations people were told by the Prime Minister in his Closing the Gap speech in February that his government's approach to closing the gap would be one of partnership with First Nations people. He said they would be listening to First Nations people, empowering them, handing back responsibility. Well, those words are completely meaningless if Mr Morrison's government doesn't practice what they preach. And this bill is a great example of policy being imposed on First Nations people rather than engaging in the promised partnership approach. The bill also runs counter to evidence. We've had plenty of time to review this evidence. It's been 13 years since the Howard government's so-called intervention in the Northern Territory. And the evidence shows that compulsory broad-based income management does not work. Not that the Morrison government is the slightest bit interested in whether the cashless debit card actually works. Ever since it was first proposed as a trial, it was always the intention of the Liberal and Nationals to have a broad-scale permanent rollout of the card, and who knows how far else it may extend. After all, the Minister for Social Services, Senator Rustin, told Senator McCarthy in estimates on 29 October that she had not read the Adelaide University report on the Goldfields trial, even though this bill was introduced to Parliament on 8 October. Yep, you heard me correctly. The government spent $2.5 million on this study, yet the minister presses ahead with making the cash debit card permanent without even bothering to read the report. I'm not sure what outrages me more, whether it's the fact that there was a wastage of $2.5 million in taxpayers' money on a report failed to be read by the minister, or her decision to press ahead with the change that is going to impact 34,000 Australians without making sure she has all the facts before her. The Community Affairs Legislation Committee inquired into this bill, and the inquiry received a lot of interest, attracting 145 submissions in a short period, including 61 from organisations. Labor senators, in their dissenting report, outlined some of the evidence to show that the cashless debit card and income management more generally lacks effectiveness. Professor Tony Dryce, who is director of the Australian National University Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research, um, gave evidence in a private capacity, though, told the inquiry, and I quote, the evidence supporting the impact of both the cashless debit card and the basics card is flimsy and largely anecdotal, not rigorous and reliable. The evidence does not stack up. It does not show that the cashless debit card has had a positive impact, and a very large amount of evidence shows that, after 13 years of new income management in the Northern Territory, it has had almost no positive impact. The Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists told the inquiry that there is also no clinical evidence to support the cashless debit card. In their submission, the college wrote, and I quote, we are concerned at the continued pursuit of this policy against the advice of addiction specialists. More than 50 years of psychological research shows that positive reinforcement strategies are more effective than punitive strategies in bringing about behavioural change. Evidence given to the inquiry about the ineffectiveness of the cashless debit card has been backed up by many studies. An independent analysis, analysis of the cashless debit card in Sojourner found, and I quote, we have shown the CDC policy to have had no substantive effect on the available measures for the targeted behaviours of gambling or intoxicant use. Commenting, commenting in The Guardian in Australia, one of the report's authors, 
Dr Luke Greenacre said, and I quote, from the more quantitative economic whole of community perspective, it suggests the card offers very little if no return for investment. The Auditor General has also found in his report on implementation and performance of the cashless debit card trial that there is no evidence to support the government's claim that the card reduces social harm. Not only is compulsory broad-based income management not affecting in reducing harm, but in some ways it could actually cause significant harm. Now, during the inquiry's public hearing, Mrs Catherine Wilkes from the lobby group No Cashless Welfare Debit Card Australia detailed some of the harms that have been reported to them by people subjected to income management. She said that because Indu, the provider of the card, refused to set up continuous payments, people defaulted on their rent and ended up blacklisted or on the streets because of it. Women escaping family violence who had, to work, who had worked hard to gain their financial independence were suddenly finding that it had been stripped from them because they were required to have a cashless debit card simply because of their postcode. Mrs Wilkes also said she had been told of multiple stories of money being stolen from Indo accounts through hacking and scams, including a sole parent who had $942 stolen from her account. General Manager of Community Services for the Salvation Army, Stuart Foster, told the same public hearing that the mandatory participation of people on social security payments in income management was leading to, and I quote, negative outcomes including poor mental health, social isolation Thank and you, stigma. Thank you, Senator Billick. You will be in continuation when we return to the legislation. We will now move to Senator's statements. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. The great civil rights campaigner Martin Luther King said, I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the colour of their skin but by the content of their character. Of all his famous quotes, this is Martin Luther King's finest because it goes to the heart of what really matters, the individual and not the identity. And that is the difference between the Coalition and the Labor Greens Alliance. We believe in the individual based on mutual respect, whereas they prejudge people based on identity and then attack that identity. Liberal democracies are built on the notion all people are created equal. Respect for the individual and how that individual treats other individuals is the foundation of a fair society. It was this belief that drove great thinkers like Locke and Voltaire and great statesmen like Washington and Jefferson to argue and fight for the right to give people the right to vote, the protection of property and the right to freedom of speech, freedom of thought and freedom of association. Who can forget the words of the great American forefathers when they wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Contrast these quotes with Senator Wong's provocative comments. We are no longer trapped in the ignorance of our own assumptions and prejudice, based on the underlying supremism of the narrative that white people know best. Senator Wong shows her own ignorance and prejudice by assuming non-Indigenous Australians are ignorant and prejudiced. To assume that non-Indigenous Australians believe in some supremist narrative uh, Senator, is in insult to Senator, our tolerant you way of life. raising a point of order. Point of order. I would ask that the senator withdraw that He's, he is reflecting on another, another member of this chamber. Senator Reddick, uh, would you like to uh, consider the comments that you made? I don't want you to repeat them, but would you consider withdrawing those? No, because I didn't reflect on the person. I reflected on the comments that are in Hansard. It would be appreciated if you... Sorry. Senator Rennie, can I ask you to reflect on the language that you are using? I think we've had demonstrated in this chamber this morning some unparliamentary comments. So I'd ask you to reflect on the language that you're using. You now have the call. So do I continue or not? You continue, okay. Senator Thank you. I don't see it. Okay. So to assume that non-Indigenous Australians believe in some supremacist narrative is an insult to our tolerant way of life. 
I don't see it reflected amongst everyday Australians at all. And it certainly wasn't in my maiden speech when I paid tribute to the Middle East civilisations, and I quote, as the birthplace of writing, irrigation, astronomy, algebra and our major religions, the Middle East is the cradle of civilisation. Furthermore, I said, the undeniable truth I learnt from my travels is that we are all the same. We all want a roof over our head, food in our stomach and a better life for our children. What binds us together is much more than what drives us apart. We must promote a unified Australia, Australia rather than ideologies that seek to divide us." End of quote. And there was nothing supremest about our pioneering fathers when they came here as convicts, refugees or fleeing famine like my own ancestors, seeking a better life like many of today's first-generation immigrants. People shouldn't be prejudged by a label, by a race, by a religion, by their sexuality or where they came from. Furthermore, furthermore, they shouldn't be held to account for the actions of their forefathers who lived in a different time and different circumstances. Yet that is exactly what many others on that side of the chamber seek to do play identity politics instead of governing for all people. Those who complain about our past, especially in this chamber, have no right to belittle our pioneering forefathers, whose toil and sacrifices, albeit with flaws and injustices, made this country what it is today and is the reason why they came here. It is not how I choose to, to remember those who became before us. Indeed, thanks to technological advances, due to empirical science and discovery that flourished under the Reformation, the last 300 years has seen life expectancy double and slavery abolished in most parts of the world. If those opposite really cared about the welfare of Indigenous Australians and wanted to help, they would speak up about child abuse and neglect in those communities. As per the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, Aboriginal children are more likely to be victims of ch child abuse neglect and sexual assault. During 2011-12, Indigenous children aged 0 to 17 were nearly eight times as likely as non-Indigenous children to be the subject of substantiated child abuse or neglect. In 2012, rates of sexual assault reported to police among Indigenous children aged 0 to 9 in New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia and the Northern Territory were two to four times higher than rates among non-Indigenous children in these jurisdictions. Virtue signalling about the location of flags, words in a national anthem or another chamber in this place is avoiding the real issue. The welfare of every person in this country, regardless of the colour of their skin. What matters is that children are safe in their homes, are healthy, are educated and, most importantly, have the love and support of their communities and parents. There is no place in this country or this chamber for hate, blame or guilt. Identity politics cloaked behind virtue signalling over empty gestures and false arguments will do nothing to close the gap and is not the way forward. The Morrison government is committed to closing the gap, to dealing with the issues that really matter. We live in the greatest of times. No other time in history has seen humans enjoy so many comforts, such good health and so many freedoms. Yet there is a destructive act activism promoted by those opposite who want to destroy these hard-won freedoms and in, in order to impose their views and will over the people. They are doing this through identity politics in order to divide and conquer those who value th free thought and individual liberty. Statements like always was and always will be will do nothing to promote inclusivity and tolerance. The idea promoted by the likes of SBS that you're in someone else's country is wrong and intimidating. This country belongs to every Australian, regardless of their race or background. It's time for a new dialogue in Australia, one that looks to mutual respect between individuals and future opportunities free from identity politics. It's why the Labor Party should replace Senator Wong with Senator Polly. Senator Polly's commitments to tolerance and inclusivity was demonstrated earlier this year when tweeted, every life matters no matter what the colour of your skin is. 
and the Labor Party's commitment to intolerance and divisiveness was demonstrated when they made her take that tweet down. Is there no Labor politician who has the courage to push back on identity politics? Where you were born doesn't define you. What defines you is your attitude and your willingness to treat people with respect and without prejudice, especially as to where they came from. To quote former LNP senator and niece of the great Neville Bonner, Joanna Lindgren, who previously said in this chamber, for those who harbour internal guilt due to past injustices or those who think they are doing good, let me say this. You are creating division and resentment. We want education, opportunity and employment, not songs. Songs or flags will not change a single thing. Will playing that song at a Doomadgee State School or in the Doomadgee area change the alcohol problem they struggle with? Will playing that song at Woodridge raise the, un raise the employment opportunities? Will it help the Kwandamooka people of Stradbroke Island have employment when the sand mining is brought to an end? What hope is generated from this? As an Aboriginal person, I want to see my culture and language preserved and represented not used as a political football." End of quote. Thank you. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak uh, in terms of the Northern Territory and also uh, those uh, hundreds and if not thousands of families in the trial sites across Australia for the cashless debit card. And the trial sites, uh, just again for the record, uh, two in WA, one in South Australia and one in Queensland. And one of the areas that uh, I'm certainly focusing on in terms of uh, this particular uh, issue that we are uh, debating before the House, uh, before the Senate, is really I, I wanted to bring to the attention of the Senate uh, some of the important information that has come through numerous uh, inquiries that we've had and important information where those people who've given evidence uh, have given evidence to the senators throughout uh, a couple of years of inquiries. And I'd like their voices just to be on the record. Receiving social security support predominantly through cashless debit cards may impact the ability of victims and survivors to leave violent relationships, given the lack of disposable cash. If a woman has children, the available 20 per cent may be even further reduced, considering all necessary school and other child-related expenses that cannot be paid via direct debit. That particular concern around uh, women being able to leave violent uh, relationships in particular uh, has been a concern that was raised uh, over the years that we had the, the inquiry. It is a legitimate concern that it continues to be raised uh, through organisations like the Australian Council of Social Services, the, the Northern Territory Council of Services, but also through women's shelters uh, who talk about the need uh, for, for women to be financially able to, to leave those situations. It is important the Senate is aware of that uh, because uh, there have been views and uh, anecdotal uh, comments uh, saying that uh, if we don't have something like the uh, income quarantining or forced income quarantining of cashless debit card, uh, it will uh, not help these situations. I'd like to put on the record, Madam Acting Deputy President, that having uh, a forced income management actually exacerbates uh, those particular unsafe environments uh, for women and their families uh, to be able to leave uh, those environments. Olga Havnan from the Danila Dilba uh, service, medical service in, in the Northern Territory also gave evidence to the Senate inquiry uh, in 2019, and I'd like to uh, put her comments on the record. More than 23,000 Aboriginal people have been subjected to income management or income quarantining since 2007 in the Northern Territory. The original objectives of income management were supposedly to improve the health, well-being and education outcomes of Aboriginal children and to protect women and older people from humbugging and violence. During the period 2007 to the present time of 2019, when she gave evidence, 
there is an absolutely astonishing lack of credible evidence that income management has made any significant improvement to any of the key indicators of well-being, child health, birth weights, failure to thrive and child protection notifications and substantiations. There are no improvements in school attendance and certainly nothing we can see would suggest that there has been a reduction in family or community violence. Our concerns with the proposal to transfer current recipients of the basics card to a new cashless debit card is that we're going to get more of the same, and it fails to fundamentally address the significant structural flaws of the scheme, namely disempowerment, failure to address underlying structural issues, and the cost of implementation and ongoing management of the scheme. This is a failed experiment and should, I believe, be abandoned. The numerous so-called trials are expensive. They're an ineffective, phony that have caused untold misery and hardship. It's an outrageous waste of millions of dollars of public money that could have been better used to provide targeted and tailored supports. For example, things like parenting programs, treatment and support services for people with addiction and gambling problems, improvements in health and environmental health programs, and more funding for health, education and employment. There are a multitude of real evidence-based initiatives that could have been supported to improve the lives of Aboriginal children and families." End of quote. That was evidence given to this Senate inquiry in 2019 to do with the cashless debit card by Olga Havnan, the CEO of the Danila Dilber Medical Centre in Darwin, which covers a huge population of First Nations people, but also beyond uh, the Darwin boundaries. Walter Shaw from Tungandjira Council in Central Australia. Tungandjira Council is an organisation uh, that looks after the town camps around Alice Springs. There are uh, between 14 to 16, 17 town camps around Alice Springs. And so they have a co an organisation in which a town camper is represented on the Tungandjira Council. So Walter Shaw is the CEO of that organisation. And I quote his evidence uh, to the committee inquiry. I was only made aware 10 minutes before they walked into my office, and he was referring then to federal agency staff doing consultation of sorts on CDC. Mr Shaw says, I refused to sit down with them during that conversation. After the fact of that conversation that was held, I think Mike was in the meeting alongside my chief operations officer. As about three weeks later, they requested rounds of consultation with town campers. They wanted to do a cluster approach of providing a level of community engagement and awareness that the cashless debit card is going to roll out and it's going to affect the affected people that are currently on any welfare or Centrelink program or Centrelink income. End of quote. Where Mr Shaw was coming from was that this was a, a complete surprise. There was certainly no uh, request about how they were going. Uh, no interest in uh, what kind of uh, life people were having on the current system with the basics card. And this is, this is quite critical, again, as I emphasise with the Senate and to senators, uh, that there is already a legislation, a piece of legislation in place called Stronger Futures, which covers the Northern Territory and it covers uh, this policy of the basics uh, card. What is needed, senators, is a thorough inquiry and evaluation of the basics card. We need to understand in the Northern Territory what has worked, what hasn't worked, and we need to know what the families themselves uh, feel and think about this particular regime that they've been forced to live under for 13 years. You see, the inability of the Senate to recognise that you want to bring in another policy over the top of one that you haven't even checked out whether people have uh, achieved the outcomes which were supposed to have been set at the beginning of that in 2007, again shows a failure of the parliament, of the Senate and the government in particular, that you don't care. You don't care. It's, it's almost like you go out and say, look, we want you to live 
like this. Oh, but then we're going to move you to this. Uh, but then we'll move you over here to this. We, we don't know why, but it looks nicer and shinier over here, and we think you should move from that spot to that spot uh, because it actually works for us. It doesn't matter about you. I mean, that's, that's how the people of the Northern Territory feel. And it's imperative, uh, I think, for the dignity of the Senate uh, that we base our decisions, our collective decisions, on information that comes from the people of Australia, that comes from those families who experience what it is like to be forced into having their income quarantined, to be forced in a situation where they feel so disempowered but worse, that their disempowerment cannot be listened to as part of what the Australian Parliament should be doing in evaluating whether the particular policy that you've imposed on a people has actually worked and reached what you intended it to do. Best case scenario, even with your best interests, you haven't even bothered to find out. And so when people say, it's not working, please listen to us. You choose to turn away, you choose to turn your backs, and you say, too bad, too sad, you're stuck with it. That's not the Australian Senate I want to be a part of, and I urge senators to make sure of your decision today. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Chair. I rise today to speak about the ongoing logging of native forests in my electorate. As I said in this chamber earlier this week, our people are not from country, we are of country. I call this place's attention to the ongoing and senseless destruction of forests in Victoria, which had bushfires ripping through them less than one year ago. Country our people have called home for millennia. The colonial project in this country has had a lot of damaging and destructive impacts on our people and our country, but logging our old native forests for a low value wood chips has got to be the, one of the worst examples. My grandfather was a logger. He, was also, he also worked in the coal industry. He died of black lung as a result. They were the only jobs in those days that blackfellas could get. But even he knew that it was only for a short time and that he had to transition also because it was bad for country. This is not about taking people's jobs away. It's about transitioning them into jobs that will sustain them and our future. We know that East Gippsland's communities are still hurting from last summer's bushfires. Those fires and their devastation will never be forgotten. The people who lost their lives will never be forgotten. And I want to send my love to those families and neighbours still grieving for their loved ones. I'm fortunate to have seen and known the giant sacred trees that remain in East Gippsland. I've spent a lot of time out in those beautiful parts of country. It's an ecosystem that has been there for countless centuries. After the fires that ripped through I want these forests to recover. As much as possible, they should be left to regenerate and return to their natural state. I want my grandkids and everyone's grandkids to be able to see these magnific magnificent forests, to understand that they are the life support system of our country, the life support system of our earth. This logging addiction that we've got in Victoria is so wrong so backward and unsustainable. If the Victorian Labor government wants to keep logging, then this federal government needs to step in and say no. No to letting Vic Forest restart logging in bushfire-ravaged countries such as Biddle, Gunai, Monero and Nagario country in East Gippsland. No to destruction of the remaining wildlife habitat and carbon stores of these forests. This also includes our totems. No to continuing logging while the state government's own major event review of the bushfires is happening. Under the regional forest agreements, 
This logging and destruction is done on this government's watch. Those agreements are signed by both Victoria and the federal government, signing away our country for a quick buck. It will, it will all mostly end up as wood chips and printer paper. Shame. It might be the Victorian Premier's own logging agency doing the bulldozing, but it's also on this government's head. Let us not forget that. Thankfully, there are dedicated forest defenders on the ground in East Gippsland to keep watch on Vic forests. I thank Goongra Environment Centre and the many forest protectors across Victoria for your work exposing the plans of Vic forests to move in and log bushfire affected forests. Shout out to Chris Taylor. Your FOIs, your legal cases, your wildlife surveys and blockades on the ground have shone a light on what's really happening. The reports in the media this week have been scathing, and rightly so. We know that Vic Forest was already found to be logging illegally earlier this year. The federal, government, the federal court said so. Now that they are in the forests of East Gippsland doing more damage, allowing logging to continue in the landscapes that were burnt by the megafires of last summer is outrageous. It's greedy and it's short-sighted. The loggers claim they are cleaning up after the fires, salvaging logs that are otherwise wasted, but this is kicking an ecosystem whilst it's down. Removing burnt logs takes away hollows and habitat that the remaining wildlife need to stay safe and sheltered. The science and Indigenous knowledge is clear on this. Research shows that logging forests after bushfires increases future fire risk and it can make the forest uninhabitable for wildlife for decades. We heard this week a report from WWF that confirmed almost three billion animals were killed by last summer's bushfires. These fires burnt through 70 per cent of East Gippsland's forests and 78 per cent of Victoria's remaining rainforest, and 244 endangered species lost over 50 per cent of their habitat. The Victorian Labor government and this federal government have together announced a major event review of the bushfires. This is going to assess the impacts of the 2019 and 2020 bushfires and how those events affected the regional forest agreements in Victoria. There is no doubt we need a review. Those fires had enormous impacts on these forests. We need to know exactly what state they are in and how to protect them into the future. But the logging should stop while that review is happening. How can we say that these forests are so disturbed by fire that it constitutes a major event and then say, OK, business as usual, happy for you to go on and keep logging? This makes no sense. I note that the Victorian state government has indicated they would welcome traditional owner voices on the review. This major event review should have traditional owners represented properly as part of the process, not a tick and flick tokenistic gesture. It's got to have free prior and informed consent. So much of this destruction is happening because consent was never sought from First Peoples. We need assurances that First Nations voices will be heard in this process. How can the Andrews government be negotiating treaty in Victoria in good faith while he continues to log our country. This push to go in and log after the fires is a desperate move from a dying industry. The writing is on the wall for the native forest logging industry. We can get what we need from sustainably grown plantation timber. The vast majority of the domestic paper and pulp already does come from plantations. So why not leave these forests alone to recover from the bushfires? We need to make the transition out of native forest logging, not in 10 years, now. I worry so much about the desecration and destruction of country. I worry that my kids and my grandkids will inherit a ruined landscape, water catchments that have dried up, native animals sent to extinction. 
the Victorian Labor government and this federal Morrison government need to wake up. Only the Greens are fighting for these forests and speaking up for these life support systems. We call on our fellow parliamentarians to join us. We know that without these forests, we have no air to breathe, no clean water to drink, no wildlife and habitat. But that's not affecting you now, so that's not in your, uh, at the front of your mind. But it will be in your grandmothers, in your granddaughters' minds. This is our job to make a safe future for everyone. Logging in East Gippsland and across Victoria needs to stop now. No trees, no treaty. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Last week in the United Kingdom, a momentous judgment with international implications was handed down by the High Court. The court found in favour of the arguments put forward by the mother of a child with gender dysphoria and Kira Bell, a brave 23-year-old woman who had at 16 been prescribed puberty blockers after three short appointments with the Tavistock Youth Gender Clinic. The judges in this case have observed that prescribing puberty blockers to children with gender dysphoria is an experimental treatment with real uncertainty over the short and long-term consequences of the treatment, with very limited evidence as to its efficacy. Given the potential lifelong effects on fertility, sexual function, bone density and development, as well as a lack of evidence of the full long-term impacts, the court found that children are very unlikely to be able to adequately understand and give informed consent to these experimental treatments. This judgment has profound implications for Australia. Not that you would know it from the muted, in some cases non-existent, coverage by many Australian media outlets. Let's look at what's happening right now in Australia and how out of, out, out, how out of step it is with what has been found in the UK High Court. Last month, Bernard Lane in The Australian reported on the family court removing an Australian child from their parents because they wanted psychologists to consider other possible factors in their child's gender dysphoria and the potential for other non-invasive treatments. The parents told The Weekend Australian that state authorities have said it's dangerous for their child to come back to their house because they want a thorough assessment by an independent psychologist and they haven't consented to testosterone treatment. The parents know their child needs help and support and they want it to be provided by medical experts in an evidence-based way. For this, the child has been taken away from them by the state. The mother told the Australian newspaper that their family and their friends were shocked at their story. They just can't believe that it happens in Australia. Last week, just as the UK High Court was finalising its findings that puberty blockers are an experimental treatment which young children are unable to give informed consent for, the Victorian government was introducing legislation which criminalises discussion of the very same issues highlighted by the court. The Victorian legislation makes any conduct or practice that is not seen as gender-affirming potentially illegal. The definition is so broad that it includes conversations and online discussion. Under this bill, Kira Bell, a woman who has been through the transition process and had a court uphold the legitimacy of her concerns regarding the process, could be charged with a crime if she discussed her experience with a young Victorian experiencing gender dysphoria. If the bill passes, the Victorian Human Rights Commission will be given extraordinary powers to launch investigations into people questioning gender change practices and to, I quote, take any action it considers appropriate after conducting an investigation. They will also offer education to persons and organisations engaged in change or suppression practices, practices which, as the bill makes clear, can include conversations about gender identity theory and the risks of experimental medical treatment on children. Everyone familiar with how these commissions operate around Australia can foresee how these powers will be used and abused. Another round of guidance will be issued threatening that it's against the law to question unproven medical practices such as puberty blockers. 
Investigations will be launched into parents and medical experts who question the single focus on gender-affirming medical interventions. More pressure will be applied to media not to report on any debate that questions medical interventions in children who have nothing medically wrong with their bodies. If this legislation isn't Orwellian and dangerous enough on its own, it has been introduced by the Victorian government at the exact time that states are supposed to be working together to develop a service model for safe and appropriate care and treatment of children and adolescents with gender dysphoria. How can the Victorian government play a central role in developing an evidence-based model of care while simultaneously introducing a law criminalising any treatment which is not gender-affirming? How can they take this position when the UK High Court has just handed down findings that puberty blockers are an experimental treatment for which children are unable to give informed consent? The same questions, frankly, have to be asked of the Queensland and the ACT governments who have also forced through similar laws in the past year. In Australia, just as in the UK, the number of children and adolescents being treated for gender dysphoria with gender-affirming medical interventions has skyrocketed in recent years. Patient numbers at the Tavistock Clinic in the UK rose from 97 in 2009 to 2,519 in 2018. We know from FOI data that referrals to Victoria's Royal Children's Hospital Gender Clinic rose by more than 1,700 per cent between 2012 and 2019. We have no idea what the national figures are because states do not release the data on how many children have been given puberty blockers, hormone treatment and surgery. In fact, we don't even know if this data is kept. If states do have this data, then they need to release it publicly now so that we can get a full picture of what's happening. The UK High Court, in their judgment, expressed extreme surprise that the Tavistock Clinic was not able to produce data on the treatment provided to their own patients, including the proportion of those on puberty blockers who move on to receive cross-sex hormones. Surely state governments have an obligation to find out if their own clinics are operating with the same absence of data. We all want the best possible care for all children and adolescents who are suffering from any form of emotional distress. This care must be based on the most thorough, evidence-based approach so that mistakes aren't made which have longer-term consequences for these young people, consequences which Kira Bell and so many other detransitioners have bravely detailed on the public record at great personal cost. It's clear from the Kira Bell judgment that there are many valid concerns about medical interventions on children experiencing gender dysphoria. Yet for many years, people raising those exact concerns, both here in Australia and around the world, have been labelled as hateful and transphobic, accused of pushing children towards self-harm, just as those with legitimate, evidence-based concerns about women's sport and women's services have been defamed as transphobic and ignored by the mainstream media. Thanks to the bravery of Kira Bell and the efforts of her supporters, the world can now see that silencing and pushing aside these concerns does not guarantee better outcomes for children who need care, support and the best possible medical assistance. This must be a turning point for Australia, away from silencing and slurs and towards proper evidence-based outcomes and proper public discussion. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And uh, I rise to give my uh, last speech of the year that's not on legislation, um, where I get to actually determine the subject matter that I might discuss. And I promised myself earlier in the year that I would uh, give a speech about the plight of the Uyghur people uh, before Christmas came. And I do that mindful that I am a person who lives in a democracy where freedom of religion is absolutely my right. And it's in democracy that we find an expression of one of the core beliefs that Christianity delivered into the world. Uh, and, I'm, and I am a Catholic, and it's that notion of equality, the, the common dignity of every human person. Other people find uh, in other faiths and from no faith ways to express their belief in egalitarianism. 
and freedom and fraternity. Uh, but people who, who will be celebrating Hanukkah and Christmas have particular languages around faith that are, we are free to use. Words that enhance my life and I'm proud to bring to my role here in the parliament. But there is no freedom for a particular group of brothers and sisters in this world who are in the People's Republic of China. And I speak of the mass detention, surveillance, forced sterilisation and torture of the Uyghur population of northwest China. The People's Republic of China has enacted the largest incarceration of an ethnic or religious minority since the Second World War. While this crackdown was purportedly launched on the flimsiest claims of stopping terrorism and extremism, it has instead become a cruel and brutal expression of state terror and cultural and religious genocide. For those listening to this debate in the Australian Senate today as we approach Christmas in the year of 2020, this is a shocking tale, and the truth is many Australians will not know that this is happening. For those who haven't heard about the Uyghurs, they're a Turkic-speaking minority group who predominantly reside in the northwest Chinese autonomous region of Xinjiang. Uh, in, there are around 11 million Uyghurs in China, and international observers now estimate that up to 2 million, nearly 20 per cent of the entire population, are now in re-education camps or jails. The Chinese government has repeatedly barred international observers and journalists from visiting the region and consistently lied about the internment camps until satellite photos uncovered their insidious and startling growth. This campaign to forcibly assimilate the Uyghur culture is being carried out in silence and brutality, with China wielding its economic might to silence any nation or people that may dissent. I have seen the drone footage of hundreds of Uyghurs being led onto trains, blindfolded, shaved and in prison uniforms. And I'm imprinted in my own uh, Catholic education by uh, teachers who made sure that we didn't look away from the Holocaust and how similar the images of people being herded, herded into, into cars, trains and taken away from the places in which they have a right to live. These appalling images corroborate the stories of those on the ground, of Uyghurs and other minorities such as the Kazakhs that have managed to flee the terror in Xinjiang. In practice, in the PRC, the outward signs of citizens that are deemed to be showing uh, extremism are frankly ridiculous. At some things as simple as travelling abroad not smoking or drinking, growing a beard, having a foreign social media account or praying are worthy of a detention in jail. Many detainees who undertake these simple practices are forced to work in intensive labour camps to produce goods for, China, for Chinese export, while also being forced to recant their culture and their faith. The mass internment has been accompanied by a cultural genocide designed to suppress the Uyghur culture and traditional practices, and the Uyghur people are predominantly adherents of the Islamic faith. The destruction of dozens of Uyghur grave site, graveyards and religious sites, the banning of the Uyghur language in Xinjiang schools, the blacklisting of Uyghur books, films and music has been calculated move by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party leadership to erase the entire Uyghur culture. Uyghur children are being fined roughly about 40 Australian dollars for speaking their language at school. Sitting on the floor in a traditional manner is banned. The wearing of headscarves and long dresses are prohibited, and any government employee who speaks Uyghur is promptly fired. This is an outrage. It's something so deeply unfamiliar to Australian citizens that it's hard for us in our democratic country to believe that such practices are going on in this time, in a place that's not that far away. Chinese officials are now even forcing Uyghur women to take birth control or be forcibly sterilised. According to a recent Associated Press report, 
At the same time as forcing that restriction on Uyghurs, the state is uncovering, encouraging Han women, women to have more children. The report shockingly revealed that, and I quote, the state regularly subjects minority women to pregnancy checks and forces intrauterine devices, sterilisation and even abortion on hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs. Even while the use of IUDs and sterilisation has fallen nationwide, it's rising sharply in Xinjiang. Birth rates in the Uyghur communities have plummeted 60 per cent between 2015 and 2018 and a further 24 per cent in 2019. Uyghur children are being taken from their parents and indoctrinated in preschool camps with prison-style walls, surveillance and electric fences where they're raised completely separately from their Chinese counterparts. The enforcement of these abominable practices is widespread. Uyghur parents are often threatened with jail for having too many children. They're constantly monitored by invasive fertility tests and surveilled constantly on the streets and in their homes. This is a slow, creeping genocide as outlined by Article 2, Section C through E of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide as the Chinese state is deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. The People's Republic of China is signatory to this convention of the United Nations, and I urge them, indeed I implore them, to live up to their obligations and stop the persecution of the Uyghur peoples. The People's Republic of China cannot live up to its true potential as a nation while it continues to commit these crimes. It's a stain that will last for generations. It will be forever tied to the current leadership of Xi Jinping. I urge the PRC leadership to end the persecution of the Uyghurs and allow these people their basic freedom to practice their culture and religion as they deem fit. And that is all that, all that it takes for evil to prevail is for good men and women to look away. We cannot look away. We cannot condone. We cannot tolerate such calculated brutality and oppression of cultural and religious freedom. To ignore the plight of the Uyghurs would send a signal to every nation around the world that Australia doesn't care about human rights as long as its powerful trading partner is trampling on them. We must speak out against this, and more importantly, we must act. And that is why, in my uh, Christian um, message here for the Australian Parliament at Christmas, I'm saying to the Uyghur people, uh, I see you. Australia sees you, and we will not look away. Australia was among the 22 countries which signed a joint statement to the UN Human Rights Council calling on China to stop detaining Uyghurs. I commend the government for that important statement, but Australia must go further in its actions to stop the genocide. I know that the United States Congress has passed the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act and is currently debating the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which would boycott goods made in labour camps sanction Chinese officials that have participated in this vast campaign of surveillance and detention, freeze US-based assets and restrict access to visas. Uh, I note uh, recommendations in a recent bipartisan parliamentary inquiry into the Magnitsky sanctions here in Australia, which offer a way to advance the discussions about this important matter with the PRC. As Nobel Prize laureate and Holocaust survivor Ellie Wiesel said, when human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Wherever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion or political views, that place must, at the moment, become the centre of the universe. Senator My Christmas Anil, prayer is for you. our... Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on electric vehicles, and I do so because the government is not speaking on electric vehicles. Australia's electric vehicle policy is actually battery dead, and it's in desperate need of a jump start. The reality is the nature of transport is changing. Electric vehicles are the future, and we have some choices to make about Australia's role in that future. Now, I know people understand or have an apprehension in respect of range anxiety with electric vehicles. 
these things are changing with technology. And the, the use of electric vehicles is positive in almost all respects. In terms of productivity, uh, businesses, people uh, in their own private cars uh, will enjoy the low operating costs of electric vehicles compared to internal combustion engine vehicles. People will enjoy the fact that most electric vehicles have very few moving parts, no pistons going up and down, uh, th those sorts of things. And uh, again, that adds to uh, productivity. We also um, uh, would see electric vehicles assisting us in our fuel security. We, we have an awful fuel security problem here in Australia. We've got something like 26, 27 days of fuel uh, stored here in Australia. In the event of uh, 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 perhaps the, uh, an event like COVID, but worse, or, or indeed a conflict of some sort, uh, we would find ourselves very rapidly running out of the fuels we, we are so dependent upon. Uh, it, it, and also in that respect, it helps balance the trade. If we're not importing fuels, that assists us in that uh, economic uh, metric. We also um, would enjoy a, a lowering of emissions, and I know that's off-putting to the to the uh, coalition government. But this is a this is this is this is free. You get better productivity, you get a better outcomes, a cleaner environment, as you're improving the economy. And of course, there are less pollutants that come from the exhaust pipes of. Uh, electric vehicles because they don't have them. So, uh, you know, we we uh, we find overall uh, some of those noxious chemicals that are still being emitted from cars simply are not there. The world is shifting away from internal combustion engines. So this is not a decision that the government has to make. It's a decision that's actually been made by the car manufacturers who have announced they are moving away from ICE cars, internal combustion engine cars. So they're basically saying they're not going to be making them anymore. We could end up the dumping ground for outdated ICE technology. We'll also see that other countries have taken the step of also announcing the, that the sale of, um, of ICEs will in fact be, uh, will be banned. So uh, we need to think very, very careful about, uh, carefully about this. We need to be investing in the future. We need to be getting the infrastructure in place necessary for the rollout of electric vehicles. That includes uh, more than just charging stations. It includes the configuring of, of parks. It, uh, you know, where I live in Adelaide, it's a relatively old building, and you have to actually. Uh, uh, you have to commission significant uh, uh, works to be able to get a car charging uh, uh, capability next to your car park in an apartment building. These sorts of things ought to be being built into building codes, getting ourselves ready for the future. And the other problem we've got is we've got now things like um, uh, uh, plans to tax uh, electric vehicles on a use basis. Now, actually, I don't think anyone's got a problem with that. But right now is not the time to do it. Right now, we want to be giving incentive to people to switch across to electric vehicles, as they've done in a number of countries around the world, and particularly places like Norway, that have fantastic incentives and they have fantastic uptake of electric vehicles. But right now, we've got South Australia, we've got Victoria. Uh, uh, imposing electric vehicle taxes and uh, others considering it and my understanding is they are uh, collaborating with uh, with each other on this uh, on this particular issue I get that we have to deal as these vehicles come on the scene with a lack of fuel excise to pay for our roads but we want to do that in a consistent national uh, way the same with charging 
the charging arrangements that might be on electric vehicles that can vary, whether it be the nature of the charging station, uh, the nature of the grid technology that allows uh, cars to return energy back to the grid in, in situations where the, the vehicle is sitting idle and the price for electricity is high. And then, of course, at some later stage when the price is low, the bid price is low, the electric vehicles can recharge themselves. There's all sorts of really smart technology uh, that is out there. But we're going to end up with the same situation we had with, uh, with our rail gauges, where each state has a different gauge. It's not helpful. It's not helpful. We need to have uh, a sensible, standalone national electric vehicle strategy to maximise the economic, environmental and social benefits that electric vehicles can bring. We need to have a national strategy that actually um, uh, intersects and, and operates with and is worked uh, up in conjunction with the states, because you've already seen how I've been talking about you know, uh, 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 the, the grid arrangements perhaps in each state, uh, the building codes in each state. We need to get ourselves into, into a co coherent uh, position. We should be uh, setting EV targets and we should also be uh, legislating to, uh, to get clear fuel efficiency standards to give certainty to, to the private sector. We should also be backing our own manufacturers to build uh, our own EVs rather than just importing them. And I will congratulate the government for uh, uh, providing some funding to, um, to, to ACE electric vehicles uh, to, to look at setting up uh, electric vehicle manufacturing in South Australia. That's a shiny light in an otherwise pretty dark place. We should also be using our own natural resources to create load capacity in battery manufacturing and uh, value chain um, supply activity. So you know, we, we take our lithium out of the ground and we just ship it off overseas. We ship it off overseas where the value add comes and we pay a huge price on the way back in. And that price is not just the monetary value, but the loss of Australian jobs that could have been in place, um, you know, producing batteries. We could be in investing in R&D in relation to uh, vehicle-to-grid integration and other uh, overarching system integration. We should establish and fund apprenticeships and traineeships in the local EV manufacturing, maintenance and, and su uh, support sectors. So, you can't take a mechanic who's used to working on pistons and, and, uh, and the, the rotating um, elements that you find inside a normal engine. You've got to bring in specialists who now work in batteries and permanent magnet motors and, and such uh, technologies. So the, the opportunities are glaringly obvious, yet the government has decided to ignore them. What makes it worse is that these opportunities were made crystal clear in the final report of the Select Committee on Electric Vehicles in January 2019. I suspect that that report is sitting somewhere in, uh, in uh, uh, government offices gathering dust, and that's not acceptable. Uh, the fact that that report has been tabled and nothing done in two years means we've lost two years. We've lost two very important years. That's two years of dismal failure. Two years with no electric vehicle strategy, no vision, no action, no idea. Senator McGrath. Thank you. Uh, Acting Deputy President, as our nation hopefully rounds the corner from coronavirus, I reiterate my call for the in introduction of online transparency portals for government spending as a necessary measure to tackling wasteful, unnecessary spending and the growing size of government. Considering the economic and budgetary challenges confronting us, we must ensure there is much transparency as possible when it comes to government spending. Every Australian should know where their taxes are being spent and what they are being spent on. 
It is only fair and reasonable that Australians who are working hard for their money and are, are given insight into how their taxes are being spent. The transparency portal approach, which has already been used overseas, would allow taxpayers to find details down to the payment level how, much, to whom, for what and when in a format that would be simple and universal across all government departments. And obviously, there would be exclusions for areas like defence and intelligence expenditure for the sake of our national security. But by bringing in a system of online transparency for government spending accessible to the individual, there can be greater accountability and more responsible spending by government departments. This would lead to less wasteful spending and, I believe, reduce government spending by openly highlighting the how, what, why and when of government spending of the departments and where these agencies are actually spending their money. If anything, it will be an ongoing reminder to public servants and departments that the source of their expenditure is not the Treasury coffers or some, or some magic money tree here in Canberra, but those who contribute to them, the taxpayer. With easily accessible information, every Australian taxpayer can become an auditor of how their government is spending their money. For, from this increased transparency and the resulting accountability, a reduction in wasteful government spending will offer greater opportunities for savings or to fund the essential investment we need as we rebuild our proud, open and free, prosperous nation. Acting Deputy President, it was brought to my attention in my role as chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters that the Australian Broadcasting Corporation commissioned Kerry Blackburn to review the national broadcaster's coverage of the 2019 election. Following a series of questions through the committee's inquiry into the 2019 election and subsequently through Senate estimates, it has been established that the ABC paid $52,000 for this report. This is $52,000 for a report that they are now refusing to release. The ABC claimed to support the public's right to know, but time and time again it fails to practice what it preaches. So I wrote to the ABC asking them to, to bring this report to light. They refused. Subsequently, my office lodged an application under the Freedom of Information Act only to have it rejected by the ABC on the grounds that this report related to programming. And there have been news reports suggesting that this review did in fact find issues of bias in the coverage of last year's federal election. If that is the case, surely our taxpayers who pay for the ABC have a right to know. And if that is the case, why is the ABC keeping this, this review secret from the taxpayers who contribute over a billion dollars a year to the ABC? And as such today, I will be moving a notice of motion in the Senate for an order for the production of documents requiring the ABC to produce this report because Parliament and the Australian public have a right to know, even if the ABC thinks we don't. Acting Deputy President, last Wednesday I, I launched, alongside the Labor member for Jellybrand, Tim Watts, the Parliamentary Friends of Video Games. And as a, a noob or a newbie, or as people know me now as Senator Noob, um, I am very honoured to be part of, a, of supporting this growing industry across Australia. In a particular, and as promised at the launch, I'd like to call out Honk in honour of the angry goose in the Untitled Goose Game. But it is quite serious. Why would me, someone who knows very little about computer games, uh, who knows very little about the video game industry, want to get involved? And the, and the answer is, is very simple. There are so many opportunities for jobs and skills and businesses within the growing gaming industry in Australia. And this parliamentary group, which has members across the chambers in it, recognises the growing importance of the gaming industry and the many millions of Australian households who, who enjoy gaming. In fact, Acting Deputy President, over 65 per cent of Australians identify as gamers. And as a nation, we are spending billions of dollars each year on, on games and, and, and gaming hardware and software. 
and there are many opportunities to support the game development industry as it grows. However, as a government, there is so much more we can do to support this very important industry. For example, video games are explicitly excluded from the tax offsets that are accessible to the film industry. And that's wrong. And I've previously called for the video game industry to be able to access these, these tax offsets. A 30 per cent tax offset for the video game development industry will build a new information-based export industry and create thousands of jobs. In Canada, over 25,000 people are employed in the, in, that, in the industry. In Australia, it's a little over 2,500. There are so many jobs for us to find. There are so many businesses us for us to grow. And I look forward to continuing as co-chair of this new parliamentary friendship group and advocating for ways we can foster the development of the Australian games industry. It is said that when you get a puppy for Christmas, that it's for life and not, for Chris and not just for Christmas. And it's the same with video games. They're not just for, for Christmas. They are for the coming years to help grow the Australian economy. Acting Deputy President, on a more solemn note, I'd like it to take a moment to recognise and respect the contribution made by all defence personnel, be it those in current service or those veterans who have served us. We sleep safely at night because of the sacrifices of, of those men and women, and we owe our all to those men and women. And today I'd like, in particular, to pay tribute to the Australian soldiers who have served and those continue serving in Rifle Company Butterworth in Malaysia, who recently marked the 50th anniversary of its establishment. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of the veterans involved in the second Malaysian emergency against communist insurgents between 1970 and 1989 and the protection of RAF aircraft, families and facilities at the airbase at Butterworth. From 1973, Army troops in infantry company groups were deployed from Australia to Butterworth and had orders from the RAF commander of the airbase to provide a quick reaction force that could be activated at short notice to repeal attacks by communist insurgents. The Army troops received intelligence briefings on the nature of the insurgency threat to the airbase. They carried weapons and live ammunition and had orders to use lethal force should it be necessary and regularly practice in responding to potential threats. It is undeniable that our Army troops were integral with the Malaysian forces in protecting the, uh, the air base at Butterworth from the threat of attack by communist insurgents. Now, despite acknowledging the threats posed by the communist insurgency and the need to deploy Army troops to carry out protective tasks to assure the safety and security of the air base, the Defence Committee of 1973 made recommendations to the government that the decision to deploy Army troops be presented publicly as being for training purposes and underplaying their real role. Many rifle company Butterworth veterans have since campaigned to no avail to have their service recognised as warlike service given the strategic importance of their role and the threat of conflict in the region. I would like to acknowledge and thank the extensive efforts by Rifle Company Butterworth veterans since their involvement to have their service recognised as warlike service in light of the critical role they played in the defence of Butterworth. And following the reconsideration of the awarding of the VC of Teddy Sheehan, which is, is well deserved and a decision that, that I support and everyone in this chamber supports, I would ask the government to consider the Butterworth Veterans Endeavour to claim appropriate recognition for their service. Thank you. Senator Lyons. Thank you. Um, Acting Deputy President, today I rise to speak about aged care, and I particularly want to focus my remarks today on the aged care workforce. And I say uh, at the beginning, as an organiser with uh, my union, United Workers' Union, I initially started out as an organiser in aged care. And so <clears throat> most of the care homes in Western Australia I've visited, and uh, even though that was a long <clears throat> time ago now, most of those employers are still the same. But um, from when I was organising aged care workers uh, to now, there's a stark difference in what's going on. 
Yesterday um, I had a Zoom meeting with aged care workers right across Australia, proud members of United Workers Union, and I spoke to uh, Delilah, Tracy, Donna, Evia and Emma, <clears throat> and a male I'm going to refer to as Joe, because to use his um, real name would be to disclose to, him, to his employer something he's doing, which is frowned upon. These are workers who absolutely care about the job they do. And uh, up until the uh, COVID pandemic, it's fair to say that these workers were fairly overlooked. They did their jobs, they're low paid workers, they work part time, uh, they've got a real challenge in the work they do, but they do care for the residents that they're um, asked to care for. And many aged care workers have told me that sadly they're the last person. Um, some aged care residents speak to before they pass away. I've heard um, my good friend Jude Clark in WA describe residents as dying in her arms because family members uh, are not there or, or are aged themselves. And certainly during COVID, um, that was much more difficult when um, many families could not visit their uh, loved ones in aged care. So these workers are really dedicated, but they are really low paid. And even when I was organising in the sector many years ago, it was common for aged care workers to work two jobs. Now their hourly rates, um, the most you can earn as an aged care worker is $25 an hour, $25 an hour to do the work that they do. If you work in food services or in cleaning, you'll earn less than that. And most of them <clears throat> rely on weekend penalties, but none of the workers I spoke to yesterday, including the worker who works full time, earned enough to survive on. Not one of them. Because even if you work full time, you will earn less than $1,000 a week, which is about $300 a week below what Australians describe as the medium average, the median average for people to earn in this country. So they're, they are way below what, uh, what most workers would expect um, to be paid. But pay is not their number one concern, surprisingly, and from my perspective, sadly, they're really worried about the parlous state of aged care. And they've got, um, they've got five demands that they've, they've made. So the first one is they want more funding, but they want to see that funding directed uh, to caring and not to profits. As most in this um, Senate would be aware, Aged care in this country is predominantly run uh, for a profit. Uh, there are uh, community and church groups involved in aged care, but the vast majority of homes in our country are run for profit. They want mandated staffing, so staffing that uh, the employer has to put in to ensure quality care. And uh, surely there's no one in this place that would um, deny that. They do want a decent wage. It's not enough to say, as some have now been saying, let's make those full-time jobs, because the full-time job for an aged care worker on $23 to $25 an hour is not a living wage. It is still not enough. <clears throat> they want to be able to do one job. They just want to be able to do one job, and they want a voice for fairness. They want their delegates and their union to be recognised by the employers. Not massive asks, not radical asks pretty decent asks. What uh, we've seen during the pandemic and, the, and, sadly, the very high deaths we've seen in aged care in, in Australia, and I know that the government likes to say, oh, in comparison to what's happened elsewhere in the world, uh, our deaths are low, but I find that a hollow statement because anyone, anyone who lost a loved one in this country would be insulted by that comment because a death is the loss of someone who's loved by a whole range of people. And there were unacceptably high numbers of um, aged care residents who passed away. And uh, we seem to have in the Morrison government and indeed the minister uh, uh, not much caring going on. So what came to be highlighted for these workers is that they work two jobs. Some of them work three jobs, and certainly all of the people I spoke to yesterday, bar one, work additional jobs. The person I'll refer to as Joe has four children to support. He works as a cleaner in an aged care facility. 
In the morning, he also does school cleaning, and in the afternoon, he does school cleaning. So school cleaning morning and afternoon, and cleaning in an aged care facility in the middle of the day. Now that's uh, been frowned upon by most. But if Joe doesn't do that, and he's not been honest with his employer, if Joe doesn't do that, he can't make enough money. He barely makes enough money now to survive in his family with his four children. So <clears throat> there is no point in criticising aged care workers for having more than one job. They have to work additional work to um, make ends meet. And there is no point in um, saying, well, we'll give them full-time hours because it's still not enough when you're only earning $23 an hour. And we saw that really mean gesture earlier in the year from the Morrison government when I think uh, people stood up and said, we're going to pay, pay a supplement to all aged care workers. And when the rubber hit the road, that supplement was only paid to the caring staff. So of the workers I spoke to yesterday, two of them would have got the supplement, and the rest of them, including Joe, who works two jobs to make ends meet, would not have got that supplement. So it is time for the Morrison government to seriously look at, at the wage, wages of aged care workers, to have a minister who actually cares and commits to doing something proper about the parlous state of aged care and the disgraceful rate of pay that committed workers who are risking their lives at the moment in, in those environments to raise their wages to a decent wage. Not a fantastic wage, they are just asking for a decent wage. And when you earn between 25, when your maximum you can earn is $25 an hour, that is not a decent wage. And it's time the Morrison government recognised that. Thank you, Senator Lyons. It being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions without notice. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission (ASIC) has advised that the ASIC Act 2001 prohibits a credit or debit card being sent to another person. I quote ASIC's advice that a person must not send another person a credit or debit card. What does this prohibition mean for the Morrison government's proposed rollout of the cashless debit card in the Northern Territory? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Mm. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator McCarthy for her question. Um, well, um, I actually. Um, would like to, to uh, advise the senator um, that um, the, the premise of which she's based her question about um, the cashless debit card being contrary to section 12 DL of the ASIC Act uh, 2021 um, is actually um, is, is, is not actually correct. Um, the power actually is a protection to prevent financial institutions. Um, from signing people up to products um, such as you know, credit cards with pre-approved limits uh, without first obtaining their approval. So um, just as when you know, social security payments are made by another means you know, via cheque, um, it's clear that directing someone's social security payment— order. Senator to Rustin, or Senator Wong, on a point of order? Um, a point of order, but actually I'm seeking leave to table the letter from ASIC, which might assist the minister in answering this question. Yes. because. Uh, it doesn't appear that our answer is consistent with the is, advice that's is received leave and granted? received. Is leave granted? No. I'll call Senator Rustin to continue. Okay, so I understand that will be considered not at the moment. Senator Rustin to continue, or have you concluded your answer? Um, no, well, um, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. So, um, just to, to, to finish off in, uh, this particular um, question is that uh, it's clear that directing someone's social security payment to the cashless debit card does not fall under the provision which uh, Senator McCarthy referred to, and that is why in 2016. Uh, that ASIC provided the government with a no action letter for the purposes of the cashless debit card trial. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given many communities do not have Centrelink services and the nearest towns are hundreds 
of kilometres away. What will happen to people who don't have a cashless debit card? Will they simply have no money, no food and no way of getting it? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McCarthy for her follow-up question. Um, as Senator McCarthy would be um, well aware, what we are proposing to do um, with the uh, rollout of the, um, the cashless debit card into the Northern Territory and Cape York is, I suppose, the, the best description of it is to, to give the people who are currently on the basics card a technology upgrade. At the moment, um, we believe that it's probably around 16,000 places where the basics card is able to be operated in Australia. The cashless debit card works in nearly one million outlets um, and basically is able to be operated in any premise that has an FPOS machine. So um, the, the inference of your question um, is completely misplaced. Uh, in the sense of the only thing that this um, legislation seeks to do is to provide um, recipient or people who are currently on the basics card uh, the added utility and functionality of being able to use a card that's universally recognised. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Uh, Mr. President, I do seek leave again to see if we can table the letter from ASIC, uh, which refutes all of what the minister is saying. Um, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. The coalition government has been proposing the rollout of the cashless debit card across the whole of the Northern Territory for 18 months. How is it that the Morrison government has failed to properly consider that fundamental elements of Mr Morrison's proposals are prohibited by legislation according to this letter from ASIC? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you much, very much, Mr. President. Well, I will beg to differ with the, um, the, the interpretation that is being made um, in the question as to what the, the letter um, says, according to my advice. But, however, um, I, I have the letter now, and, uh, and I will refer to it uh, in the future. But I just wanted to make it very, very clear that what we are seeking to do with the legislation to which the senator refers is to enable people who are currently on the basics card, and I've got to say it's a really well-named card, it's pretty basic. Um, it is also very obvious for people who are on the basics card that that's what they're on. The new technology that works in every outlet that has an FPOS machine um, will be completely and utterly neutral in its appearance. People can use the card without anybody knowing that, that the type of card it is. Uh, and, and in fact, um, we are currently in discussions with the traditional credit union in the Northern Territory um, to make sure that we can assist those people in the Northern Territory who wish to bank with their own credit union to use that as Order. the issuer Senator as well. Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Rennick. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Senator Watt, restrain yourself. Uh, Minister, in the wake of a year of unprecedented challenges, how has the Morrison government taken action to support small business through the COVID-19 pandemic to keep their doors open and to keep their employees in jobs? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Rennick for the question. And Mr President, to say that 2020 has been a challenging year for small and family business is an understatement. Uh, they are the lifeblood, as we know, of our communities. Uh, every single day, their hard work and dedication now sees over six million Australians go to work in a job, and they contribute around $418 billion to our national economy. COVID-19, though, has had a profound impact on them. In the wake of COVID-19, many, many, many small and family businesses have faced unprecedented challenges. Government mandated shutdowns because we needed to protect the health of Australians has meant that many small businesses around Australia have faced disrupted supply chains and unimaginable, unimaginable trading restrictions when they were told that because of the decision that we had to implement to protect the health of Australians, they would need to close their doors when we shut down parts of the Australian economy. The disruption, of course, was no fault, was no fault in relation to the 3.5 million small and family businesses around Australia. But, Mr President, the Morrison government, we moved decisively and we moved quickly to put in place historic levels of economic support to help those small and family businesses get through COVID-19. And as we know, our JobKeeper payment that has provided those small and family businesses what was needed to keep their employees on their books. Around 3.6 million Australians they maintain that connection with their employer. 
the cash flow boost. It is now supported more than 800,000 employing small and medium businesses with $32 billion in terms of a cash flow injection. And of course, our supporting apprentices' wage subsidy has now delivered over $741 million and is keeping around 104,500 apprentices on the job in training Order. where we Senator need them cash. to be. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any examples of how the programs and supports the Morrison government have implemented have supported small business to rebuild, recover and play a key role in Australia's economic comeback? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, I can give you the example from Senator Rennick's home state of Queensland. Uh, it is a gentleman by the name of Paul, an electrical small business owner and operator in Toowoomba. As a result of COVID-19, Paul, like so many others, was looking to downsize his business. But when the government announced the JobKeeper policy, that gave Paul the incentive and the optimism to invest in his business. The wage subsidy gave him the cash flow that he needed to take on two new apprentices, Mr President, and he utilised the expanded and now extended instant SF write-off, and he was able to invest in a new ute to support his work. So when COVID-19 hit, Paul was looking to downsize. But with the support of government policy, he not only was able to invest in his business and buy that new ute, he was also able to utilise the wage subsidy and he has now brought on two new apprentices. That's what the government is all about, backing small and family Order, businesses. Senator, Cash. Senator Rennick, final supplementary question. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's Go Local First campaign is working to support small and family businesses, including over the Christmas and New Year period. Senator Cash. And, and Mr. President, certainly as the Minister for Small and Family Business, my message to all Australians this Christmas in the lead up to it as we go into the new year in 2021 is to go local first. The Go Local First campaign, this is all about raising that awareness across Australia to actually spend with our local small and family businesses. Why? Because when you shop locally in Australia, you support a local community, you support a family, you support a local sporting club. I am pleased to acknowledge that many senators and MPs across all sides of politics are, are proudly supporting the Go Local First campaign. And in terms of the lead up to Christmas, uh, if we do have that ability to go out there and to purchase something, just remember. It might be something small to you, but to that small and family business who has been doing it tough, it means a lot to them. And so my message to all Australians is support our small and family businesses and go local first. Senator Stirl. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On Monday in question time, the Prime Minister refused to guarantee that no worker would be worse off as a result of his industrial relations changes. Can the minister confirm no worker will be worse off? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. I thank Senator Stirl for his question. And indeed, uh, our ambition is to ensure that Australian workers on the whole are better off, and in fact, that there are more Australian workers as a result of the types of reforms that our government seeks to bring forward. Because that is the crucial part of the challenge we face at present coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, that we make sure that we get more Australians into jobs once again. The recovery has begun, the comeback has begun, but it has a way to go, Senator Mr President. Watt, on a point of order. On, on relevance, Mr President, the question wasn't about whether workers on the whole would be better off. The question was about whether every worker would be better off or whether no worker would be worse off. To be directly relevant to this question, I've allowed you to restate the question, Senator Watt. I will listen very carefully to the minister. And to be directly relevant to this question, an answer that was strictly defined by discussion of the, the bills that were introduced that were the subject of this, I'll listen carefully. I can't instruct him how to answer a question. I heard interjections asking for a one-word answer. That is not appropriate for me to attempt to instruct an answer of the question. But I'll listen very carefully to the minister continuing. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Now, in the height of the pandemic, our government sought to bring together unions and employers to engage in discussions around workplace relations legislation in a spirit of cooperation, not conflict. 
And I thank all of those parties who came together. Our government is grateful for the cooperation that has been shown during the pandemic, for the engagement through those processes, even though getting universal agreement to every issue, of course, proved immensely challenging. We welcome the fact that parties order. came Senator, together. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. Uh, the minister has had over a minute and a point of order on relevance. He was asked to confirm whether or not can he confirm no worker will be worse off. Like the prime minister, he is avoiding the question, which is telling in itself. Senator, telling in itself. But I would ask him to return to the question. To be. I'm listening to the minister. He, he was turning to the legislation or the bills or the topic, the direct topic. I, I cannot instruct him to answer a question in specific terms. If, however, he is defined, he's narrowly speaking about this particular piece of legis proposed legislation, then I do consider that directly relevant because the question is about that particular piece of legislation. Obviously, without foreshadowing something on the notice paper, um, but I call Senator Birmingham to continue. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. So our approach and our spirit in this has been to try to achieve cooperation as to how reform can best be achieved to get the most number of Australians into employment and into jobs. Those opposite clearly already want to choose the path of conflict. We have chosen the path of cooperation. In relation to the better off overall test, in relation to the better off overall Order. test, the same two tests, Order. the same two tests that currently apply will continue Senator to apply. On a point of order? On relevance, this is the fourth time we have asked the minister to confirm that no worker will be worse off. It's a pretty simple question. Senator Watt, the minister was actually talking about tests contained in the announcement at that point. I, I do consider that to be directly relevant, um, even if it's not in the terms the opposition would like. There's an opportunity after question time to debate the answer. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. As I was saying, in relation to the better off overall test, the same two terms that the, that the opposition put in place when they were in government will apply in the future in terms of the majority of employees needing to agree and, of course, the independent umpire, the Fair Work Commission, signing off on Order, any EAs. Senator Birmingham. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Uh, Mr. President, I have a very precise supplementary. Thank you. Minister Birmingham. Why is the Prime Minister refusing to guarantee that no worker will be worse off? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our government has very clearly outlined our ambitions in relation to this reform. The senator comes in here and asks about a guarantee. Well, the guarantee that we give is that every policy we are pursuing is about getting more Australians into jobs once more. That's the guarantee that we are pursuing. We went to the last election proudly during the preceding six years, having seen, having seen one and a half million additional Australians gain the opportunity, the dignity, the value of employment. That job creation record was unparalleled in Australian history. COVID-19 has hit that, but we have seen a comeback of more than 600,000 jobs to date. And our intention Order. is to pursue the types of policies Order. that Senator will get Watt. more Australians back into jobs again into the future. Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. At a time when almost 1 million Australians are unemployed, 1.4 million Australians are underemployed, and for Australians with jobs, wages growth is at record lows. Why is the Prime Minister being dishonest? about the impact of these changes, which will cut take-home pay and leave workers behind. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. I had some hope through the first few parts of Senator Stirl's supplementary there that he had Senator been Watt. listening and that perhaps he did recognise, did recognise the point the government was making, which is that these reforms, the COVID recovery industrial relations package, coming on top of our budget measures and all of our other support measures are all about getting more Australians back into jobs, are all about Order. ensuring that employers have the confidence to employ, that employers have the confidence to invest and create more jobs. We've been pleased to see the rate of jobs growth over recent months. Order. It is crucially Senator important Watt. we see that rate of jobs growth continue, that we get more Australians back to the position that we were in prior to the pandemic by getting them into work, 
by getting them into jobs and by creating those jobs through having the strongest possible economy, the strongest possible investment environment Order, and Senator indeed Watt. the most effective workplace relations systems possible built through Order, collaboration Senator and discussion between Order, parties. Senator, Senator Watt, learn to count to ten slowly again. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. A fire has been burning on the World Heritage Site on Fraser Island, Gurry, since October 14. That's eight weeks, destroying some 80,000 hectares, 60 per cent of the island, and killing the wildlife who call it home. What has the Prime Minister done to provide support to help save this precious forest, biodiversity and the animals that live there? Or, Minister, is it a case that he doesn't hold a hose so it doesn't matter to him? Senator, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Well, that's just a cheap and pathetic question coming from the Australian Greens, a cheap and pathetic question that tries to score a cheap political point in the face of something that is actually very serious. That is actually very serious. I'm not, I'm not Senator even. Wong. Se Senator, Wong, Se Senator Wong, I'm sure. Uh, Senator Wong, I'm sure that's where the supplementary questions will go. But that wasn't even the nature of this question. Senator that Wong. wasn't even the nature of this question, Senator, Senator Wong. Wong. Se that wasn't Senator even the nature Wong, of this question. Senator Birmingham. Now, we've got the cheap political points coming from there and from there and all over the place. Mr. President, Mr. President, in relation to Order. in relation to Order. the fire on Fraser Order. Island, the category B, Order, Wong. category B, Senator assistance. Birmingham, please resume your seat. I can barely hear Senator Birmingham's answer. Uh, Senator Wong, when you're injecting to that degree across the table, I think it, it interjecting. Sorry, it's been a long year. Interjecting, um, I think it's a bit much to expect a minister to not respond in a disorderly way to a disorderly interjection, but there were lots of interjections across the table. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. In relation to the Fraser Island fire, government has declared Category B uh, uh, emergency in that regard. That results in various assistance being available uh, for states and territories under the agreed uh, formulation of assistance and work in conjunction with states and territories. I gather the Queensland officials have also identified the difficulties in relation uh, to that fire, uh, the particular difficulties in terms of accessing the difficult terrain uh, and the limitations that they have in that regard. Of course, the Commonwealth stands ready to assist, work and cooperate uh, with the Queensland Government where we have the resources or ability to do so. It's why the action has been taken in terms of making the declaration already, uh, and we will respond to any further requests that come from the Queensland Government as swiftly as we can. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This is the fourth World Heritage Area in Australia to experience the catastrophic destruction because of climate fuelled fires in the past two years. Why has the government done nothing to stop climate change and to protect these globally significant sites? And what are you doing to take scientific advice to act now before it's gone for good? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, what we have done in relation to climate change is, as a country, as a country, businesses, farmers, Australians, leading the world in many areas in terms of emissions reductions. That's what we've done and what we continue to do. As a country, we have delivered 13 per cent reduction in our emissions between 2005 and 2018, compared with 8 per cent reduction in Japan or 1 per cent reduction in New Zealand or 10 per cent reduction in the US. We've led in all of those cases. As a people, as a per capita contribution, it's by far and away much greater than that, Mr. President. Our reductions over that period of time equate to 29 per cent on a per capita basis. That exceeds Germany at 16 per cent, Japan at 7 per cent, Canada at 13 per cent. So, as a people, Australians have made contributions in reducing emissions far, far greater than the rest of the world, and in doing so have met and exceeded Order, our commitments. Senator Birmingham. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Order. 
The World Heritage Committee warned the Environment Minister over a year ago that climate change was a threat to Fraser Island. The minister failed to act, and now the island is ablaze. Where is she? Where is she hiding? And will the Prime Minister get her to work? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, again, it's the type of cheap headline grabbing stunts that you would expect from the Greens. Uh, no doubt to be sliced and diced for a social media video on which they can grandstand, uh, taking cheap shots, ignoring the facts or the evidence, uh, ignoring, of course, the efforts that are being made that I was just referencing in relation uh, to climate, climate and emissions reduction. They ignore all of those things just so that they can grandstand. They ignore, of course, the fact that climate change is a global challenge, that Australia doing our bit in meeting and exceeding on the commitments that we make, but it also necessitates other countries to do more, to actually reduce their emissions to the same types of degree as Australia has. They're the types of things that we will continue to work internationally to engage in while investing record sums in terms of the technology roadmap and transformation necessary at home, as well as helping to build adaptation and resilience Order, in crucial areas like Fraser Island. Time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on the Morrison government's support for female-led start-ups across the country and how this will help build a stronger economy following the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Chandler for her question. Uh, just this week, Mr President, uh, the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, uh, Minister Karen Andrews, and I have announced the first 51 grant recipients uh, in the Boosting Female Founders Initiative. These are grants which are going to help some of our best and brightest women uh, launch their ideas for the future. The initiative supports these women entrepreneurs to grow their businesses and ultimately to create jobs for all Australians. We do know that female-founded startups do face additional challenges in getting the finance that they need to establish themselves and to grow as businesses. Through the 2020 Women's Economic Security Statement, we've invested over $35 million in the Boosting Female Founders Initiative. That will provide grants of between $25,000 and $480,000 to 282 startups that are majority owned and led by women. It will also provide tailored mentorship and advice to up to 4,300 women entrepreneurs. Mr President, the businesses are very diverse. They include businesses like Champion Life Education, uh, a health education technology company uh, which facilitates the development of lifelong health healthy habits in young people. It includes the award-winning Wool Cool Australia, which is uh, an innovative, sustainable packaging business that uses Australian wool for its products. It includes a really interesting New South Wales business uh, based in The Hunter, run by uh, a, the owner and operator is Sheree Johnson, an Aboriginal arts and education consultant who works on Aboriginal cultural capacity training, on cultural workshops, uh, amongst other things. Mr. President. So, Amongst the 51 uh, grant recipients, there's an extraordinary diversity of activity, there's an extraordinary diversity of businesses, and it's because, Mr. President, we believe in private sector-led economic growth as well Order. as in boosting, boosting Payne, women's workforce. Senator Payne, Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate of the government's initiatives to help skilled women across regional Australia get back into the workforce or stay employed? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I know that, uh, being from uh, Tasmania, the, um, the senator will be very interested in this particular question, Mr. President. Even if some opposite are not, this government is committed to boosting the confidence of rural and regional women in returning to paid work as well as in supporting businesses to retain skilled women workers. The Minister for Employment, Skills and Small and Family Business, Senator Cash, and I recently announced the second intake of regional businesses that will benefit from the Career Revive pilot initiative. Under this initiative, Mr. President, business owners receive expert advice on how to improve their business practices and policies in order to remove the barriers that exist to women's workforce participation. It does help them to develop tailored options, tailored action plans, I should say, to attract and retain skilled women. And through this measure, 
regional businesses will be able to attract more women back to work after they've had an extended career break. It will help strengthen regional business, boost women's employment in regional areas and rebuild Order, our Senator national Payne. economy. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister also advise what the government is doing to support women and girls across the Indo-Pacific region, particularly with respect to peace and security? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. This year we have, uh, with Samoa, co-hosted two Pacific women-led virtual meetings. Over 30 women from more than 18 different countries to discuss our responses to the issues challenging the region during the pandemic, a really important opportunity for those views to be heard. And I hope to host a further meeting before the end of the year. With the United Nations, we're also supporting local women's networks and peace builders to address gender-based violence, to reduce isolation and exclusion. In the Solomon Islands, for example, we've supported increased involvement of women leaders in vital provincial roles helping with disaster management. We also know the risk that COVID-19 poses uh, to women's health and safety, as well as on their economic empowerment, leadership and resilience. This is a central priority of our very, very important partnerships for recovery strategy, including in our individual country programs in the Indo-Pacific. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister confirm that under Mr Morrison's industrial relations changes, employers will be able to cut the wages and conditions of their employees? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, in the terms in which Senator Watt comes in and presents that, I certainly cannot confirm that's the case. What I can confirm, Mr President, is very much that the reforms we're putting in place are about getting more Australians back into work, building on the strong jobs growth that we have had in recent months and ensuring that continues into the future. In getting more Australians back into work, the different pillars of our COVID economic recovery are built upon ensuring that we have the strongest possible economy. We have that economy through the budget incentives to drive further investment, through the support for Australian households and families by bringing forward the tax cuts that will benefit those families and put more money back into their pockets to be able to invest as they see fit. Through the types of measures in skills reform, in the job maker program that we have made sure we are outlining and implementing to give every possible incentive for people to be work ready and for employers to particularly invest in employing young Australians. And we build upon those reforms. We build upon those reforms, Mr. President, by ensuring that we have industrial relations and workplace relations systems that offer the capacity for employers to employ with confidence, that offer greater certainty for employees, for example, casual employees, in terms of their rights and their opportunities to convert into permanency of employment, uh, that indeed maintain the better off overall test under a framework where changes require the approval of a majority of employees, changes require the approval of the independent umpire, that we have these frameworks in place and the scare campaign those opposite are seeking to start is just a sign of their desperation and desire Order, to pursue Senator Birmingham. conflict unnecessary. Time for the answers expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. A very specific question to the minister. Will it be possible for every worker at a workplace to be worse off because of Mr Morrison's industrial relations changes? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Australians will be better off as a result of there being more Australians in work. Australians will be better off as a result of every employer in the country having greater confidence order, to Senator invest. Birmingham. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Mr President, you'll note that that was a very specific question, and it was about whether every worker at a workplace will be worse off, not about workers generally, not about anything else. Um, workers at a specific workplace. Thank you, Senator Watt. I've allowed you to restate the question. Again, I, I come to the test of direct relevance, which is a narrower one than broad relevance that was in place until several years ago. In my view, to be directly relevant to such a specific question, the answer must refer to this particular aspect of the package of legislation. Now, that do I don't necessarily 
that shouldn't be taken as instructing a minister to answer in the terms that the opposition seeks. But um, I do think that a specific question of this nature requires an answer about this aspect of the policy in question. Um, but again, I say that doesn't have to accept the nature or the terms in which the question is asked. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Now, as I said, in relation to the primary question and in relation to earlier questions on this matter today, the better off overall test remains under the reforms the, that our government is proposing. And under that test, under that test, the majority of employees need to endorse a change. The majority of employees. So when the senator comes in here and asks a question about what happens to every employee, well, the test is remaining that the majority of employees need to agree to the changes. It can't be any clearer than that for the senator, but that's not the only safeguard because the Independent Fair Work Commission needs to agree as well, Mr. President. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I know that Senator doesn't want to answer this, but I ask again, can he give a guarantee that under Mr Morrison's industrial relations changes, no worker will be worse off? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, we do keep coming back to the same desire for the opposition Order. to narrow a complex area of reform. <laughs> Mr President, our intention Order. is to make sure that Australian workers are better off all Australian workers are better off by virtue of there being more jobs for Australian workers. The more jobs there are for Australian Order. workers, the more confidence Order. every Senator Australian Birmingham. worker should I've have. I've got Senator Watt on his feet. Order. Uh, Senator Watt is on his feet. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. I could not have made the question more specific, Mr. President. It's very simple. Can the minister guarantee that no worker will be worse off? Um, and Senator Watt, I think, with respect, when the minister is talking about part of it, like the better, I don't I hate I hasten not to get into the language of it, but the the boot tests and aspects like that, I do think that is directly relevant um, because that is the part that it addresses the specific question, but not in the terms you seek. You can debate that afterwards. And I think the minister on that this question and the previous one when I mentioned that did turn to that specific nature and was directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. So the fact is, Mr. President, that every Australian is better off when we have a stronger economy. Every Australian is better Order. off when we have more jobs being Order. created. Every Australian will have more job Senator security Watt. when there are more job opportunities across the Australian economy. Every Australian will be better off in terms of the services that can be provided, in terms of the potential for wages growth, Order. when we have the highest possible rates of employment in this country. That's what we are seeking to do right across Order. all of our economic Senator reforms. Birmingham. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing Order. the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. The Australian forestry industry is the ultimate renewable industry growing raw materials that make the fibre-based products we use each and every day. The industry contributes 6.6 per cent to the nation's manufacturing output. Can the minister outline the economic benefits the forestry industry delivers to regional communities and what the Liberal and National Government is doing to support our world-class forestry industry, particularly as we work to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and build a stronger Australia? Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator McKenzie, for her question and her absolute long-standing interest in all agriculture, but particularly our amazing forests in Australia. And I know, growing up in a regional town in Victoria, um, Senator McKenzie knows firsthand how tremendously important our forestry sector is to our regional communities. And Senator McKenzie, forests and trees are the ultimate renewable resource. Um, they grow. Um, and can I also acknowledge um, Senator Dunningham as the Assistant Minister for Forestry. 
um, for his extraordinary work and passion in making sure that this industry continues to have the potential to grow, to support the Australian economy, but most particularly to support our regional communities. You know, whether that be in Inbil, whether it be in Tubert, it might be in Portland, it might be in the southeast of the state where I come from, Bunbury over in Western Australia. Our timber and forestry industries are absolutely a vital part of our economy and a vital part of our uh, regional area. But these timbers, they are sustainable. They're sustainably managed and they are provider of a massive amount of employment across Australia, particularly for those people that are employed in regional areas. 52,000 Australians take home pay as a result of working directly in our timber industry. And in Senator Mackenzie's home state of Victoria, more than 15,000 people are directly employed in this particular industry, uh, which is worth more than $23 billion a year to the Australian economy. Um, we acknowledged last year that the, uh, the industry was heavily impacted by the season's bushfires, um, and this has obviously been compounded recently by the impact of COVID uh, and recent export disruptions. So that's why we have worked with the industry, and, and I acknowledge AFPA and the, and the industry, um, to provide $65 million to target support to the industry Order, going forward. Senator Rustin. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Absolutely, Mr President. Thank you, Minister. Great news. Can you outline the significant environmental benefits that are delivered through sustainable forestry operations in Australia and how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting the industry to continue to deliver these benefits to the environment globally? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, Senator McKenzie, absolutely this government supports the sustainable development and expansion of sustainable uh, plantation forests across Australia. Um, every year, 70 million new trees are planted, um, and these forests they capture carbon, they grow jobs, and they provide the timber that Australia needs, as well as an export opportunity for this country. And we're absolutely delivering on our election commitment for the forestry sector uh, by making it easier for plantations and farm forestry projects to generate carbon credit through the $2 billion Climate Solutions Fund. And this will drive $4 billion worth of investment in emissions reduction projects in Australia. So we're reducing red tape for projects located in our five regional forestry hubs, so it will make it easier for the private sector to invest in new Australian forestry products, create jobs and reduce emissions at the same time. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister. I'd just like to recognise the Chair of AFPA, Greg McCormack, and all the forestry workers that have been in. Uh, Sally McManus hasn't been the only one talking to real workers today in Parliament House. Can the Minister outline the risks to the future growth of our world-class sustainable forestry industry and how the Liberal and Nationals government are working to mitigate and overcome these risks? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I too acknowledge the Chair of AFPRA uh, and say how much I miss not being your minister anymore. Um, but the Morrison government, as I said, is absolutely committed to the long-term sustainable management and conservation of our forests, and that's why we have sought to extend all our regional forestry agreements so that we can make sure that we have the best mechanism in place to balance the environmental and economic and social demands of the communities and the Australian economy to make sure that our forestry sector can play the role that we know it can play in the Australian economic uh, future, but also making sure, once again, that we create those jobs, because it is about creating jobs and supporting our regional communities. So, um, RFAs are a modern way of being, us being able to manage our forests through increased transparency and making sure that we are focused on reporting outcomes and making sure that we continually review the management of our forests so that we can get the best out of our forests and Order. maintain Senator sustainability. Rustin. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr President. My question without notice is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the report of Aotearoa, New Zealand's Royal Commission of Inquiry into the terrorist attack on Christchurch Masjid was released. This report makes for highly disturbing reading. It details how an Australian man was radicalized and came to commit this horrific terrorist attack. It makes clear that the terrorist, who murdered 51 people, began forming his extreme right-wing Islamophobic ideology in this country from a young age. 
including through engaging with online far-right groups based in Australia. While the report focuses on New Zealand, there are lessons in it for the way Australia approaches terrorism, security, online extremism, and racial and religious hatred. Has the Prime Minister read the report, and how does the government intend to respond to it? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Faruqi for her question uh, on, of course, the very serious issue of the New Zealand Royal Commission of Inquiry into the terrorist attacks on the Christchurch mosques. Uh, the government is obviously uh, aware of the report into the attacks and that it has been made public. It is a lengthy report with 44 recommendations contained within it. Uh, our understanding is that the New Zealand government has either agreed or agreed in principle as part of its interim response to the report. The New Zealand government has committed that it will deliver a final response to the report in the new year following consultation with members of the New Zealand community. Uh, our government has a strong partnership with New Zealand when it comes to countering terrorism, all forms of terrorism, including through our joint membership of the Australia-New Zealand Counter-Terrorism Committee. I give the Senator, indeed all Senators and the Australian public, the commitment uh, that our government will examine the report thoroughly, all 44 of its recommendations thoroughly, the final response of the New Zealand government to the report thoroughly, and will engage with the New Zealand government on how it is implementing the recommendations of the report and consider any and all implications for the operation of our own counter-terrorism policies and practices. Yeah. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, the report details the man's associations with various Australian far-right groups and his donations to extremist media organisations, which have regularly been given platforms and crossed over into mainstream politics and media in Australia. Some of these groups have targeted my office and planned to disrupt events hosted by me. Is the government concerned about the normalisation of far-right politics in Australia? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, let me be very clear. Our government condemns terrorism in all of its forms, in all of its forms, has no tolerance for such behaviour and, of course, has no tolerance for any form of terrorism, right-wing, extremist or otherwise. Government and law enforcement agencies are committed to addressing such forms of terrorism. This year, I am advised that extreme right-wing individuals comprised between 30 and 40 per cent of ASIO's priority counter-terrorism investigative subjects. Our agencies take these issues seriously, regardless of the ideology that may be the motivating factor or otherwise. Australia's counter-terrorism legislative framework is agnostic towards ideology. As with all forms of terrorism, we continue to pursue investigative activities, disruptions and prosecutions and invite the cooperation Order. of all Senator Australians Birmingham. to assist Time in doing for so. The answers expired. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, several of the recommendations of the report relate to properly criminalising hate speech and tracking hate crimes. The report acknowledges a link between hate crime and terrorism. In Australia, our hate speech laws are very narrow and we do not track hate crimes at the national level. Will the government change the law to stamp out hate speech and start tracking hate crimes properly? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, as I indicated in response to the primary question, we will work very closely, both with the New Zealand government in relation to understanding all aspects of the report and all aspects of the actions and implementation arrangements that New Zealand takes in relation to this report. In doing so, we will be thorough in terms of our assessment. Order. Senator, Senator Faruqi, sorry, I was passing point of order is to relevance, um, President. I asked a very specific question about hate speech laws and will the government actually change the laws to stamp out hate speech? Um, the, the question contained a a preamble to that specific part at the end, Senator Faruqi. Um, I'll listen carefully, but I believe the minister was being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thank, thanks, Mr. President. Well, indeed, Senator Faruqi, from my recollection, your question asked about recommendations in the report that went to matters of hate speech. 
and associated laws and regulations. So when I say uh, that we will examine the report carefully, that we will work with New Zealand, that we will seek to understand the action that they take in relation to implementation of recommendations, uh, and of course we will assess all of that against ensuring we have the strongest possible preventions, protections and disruptions available to ensure Order. all forms Senator of terrorism Birmingham. are Time prevented so much expired. as possible. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Why is the minister pushing a plan to allow people to qualify for some trades with no on-the-job training? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, and in response to the question, uh, the premise of the question is false. Uh, that is not what is occurring. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The National Centre for Vocational Education Research released a report last week that showed on-the-job training was critical to helping Australians get work. So why is the Morrison government doing the opposite? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, perhaps you uh, did not listen to or understand uh, my answer to your primary question. Order. The answer to your question, the premise of your question is false. Um, and I know who you've been talking to, so that's fine. That's not a problem at all. Um, the government has no plans. Let me confirm. Order. No plans Order. to ban. Please, resume your seat, please, Senator Cash. I must say, if I had to pick a voice in the chamber, I would, ha would not have trouble hearing. It would be Senator Cash. There is way too much noise. I meant that as a compliment, Senator Cash. But if I can't hear Senator Cash, there is way too much noise in this chamber. Senator Cash, please continue. Uh, thank you. The government, despite what you have been told, has no plans to ban on the job training and in fact we believe in fact we are firmly of the belief that workplace requirements are a critical part of developing the skill set required and an important element of competency based training in Australia Senator Urquhart a final supplementary question So given the government has presided over 3 billion dollars in cuts from TAFE and the loss of 140,000 Australian apprentices, isn't dropping on the job training just the latest example of the Morrison government leaving Australian apprentices like Isabel from Temco and John from INCAT, who are in the gallery up here today, behind? Senator Cash. Uh, well, the answer to your question is no. And again, what I'd say to both Isabel and John, I understand uh, they met with my office today. I was unable to meet with them, but I congratulate Order. them on the work they are undertaking. Uh, the premise of the question Order. is false. Uh, the government has no plans to ban on-the-job training. And in fact, as I've already stated, we value workplace requirements and we believe they are critical um, to developing skills and they are an important part of competency-based training in Australia. Uh, but more broadly, you've actually asked Ms Quill's question. Thank you. That is fantastic. What has the Prime Minister said? Vocational education and skills. They are at the forefront of our economic recovery from COVID-19. That is why, that is why the government is investing this year alone almost $7 billion, colleagues, almost $7 billion in vocational education and training. That is why we have put in place the supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy. That Order. is why we Senator have put in Cash, place the, for the boosting answer apprentices. Has expired. Thank you, Senator Cash. Time for the answer. Please resume your seat, Senator Cash. Please resume your seat. I, please, no, no, sorry, Senator Cash. I was calling the minister to resume their seat, and um, I was. I've been ignored much more while I've been calling for order generally across the chamber. But ministers should actually resume their seat when I say time has concluded. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the Minister for, De for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister provide an update on the benefits of our involvement in the global F-35 program to Australia and Australian industry? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I sincerely thank Senator Hughes for that question. Sometimes in this job you have uh, challenging days and sometimes you just have simply great days. And today is certainly a great day. 
The global F-35 Joint Strike Fighter program is delivering the most capable and best value fifth generation multi-role fighter to meet Australia's uh, air power needs. The JSS introduction into service is progressing well. In fact, I'm delighted to say it is progressing very well. Of the 72 aircraft are being acquired, 30 are already in service in Australia and we have three more on the way. This capability will be the backbone of Air Force's future air combat operations. This important program is now also delivering unprecedented economic opportunities for businesses right across our nation. Opportunities that Australian companies and Australian workers are seizing. This morning I announced that Australian companies have signed contracts worth an astonishing $2.7 billion under the Global Joint Strike Fighter program. Over 50 Australian companies have participated in the program to date, and it is expected to support around 5,000 that's 5, Australian jobs by 2023 Order. alone. Australian-made parts are now installed on every single joint strike fighter globally. That is 600 aircraft so far and counting. Whenever a joint strike fighter takes to the sky anywhere around the world, it does so relying on Australian know-how. This has not just happened. This is a very deliberate part of the Morrison government's plan to strengthen Australian sovereign defence industry. We have created the opportunities for Australian companies to contribute to a large global program for many decades to come. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how the Morriston government is strengthening Australia's air combat capabilities to build a stronger and safer Australia? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. The Morrison government is investing more than $270 billion to deliver a more potent, agile and capable Australian Defence Force. This includes $65 billion over the next decade to deliver next generation potent air capabilities. This includes improved weapons systems with longer range and also, importantly, greater survivability. Combining new and existing aircraft with remotely piloted and autonomous systems will also provide increased lethality and survivability. Our collaboration with Boeing on the Loyal Wingman is a prime example. This is the first military aircraft to be designed and built in Australia in more than 50 years. These investments are ensuring that Air Force will continue to have the technologically advanced strike and air combat capability it requires, which are increasingly being built and supported right here in Australia Order. by Australians. Senator Reynolds, Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the benefits to workers in the Hunter region of the Morrison government's investment in an advanced air combat capability as part of the economic comeback from COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And it's real, I'm really sorry that those opposite are not really paying attention because this is Australian jobs, Australian industry for the long term. This morning, Minister Price and I announced a wonderful example of how our Australian defence industry, supported by this government, is creating more jobs for Australian workers and supporting our comeback from COVID-19. BAE Systems recently hired 25 former Jetstar employees following the closure of Jetstar's aircraft maintenance facility near Newcastle. These highly skilled recruits have commenced training to help sustain Australia's growing fleet of joint strike fighters and Hawk lead-in fighter aircraft. And I was so happy to meet two of them this morning, Ben and Colin. These technical workers have been retained in the hunter aviation industry and with help, and they're now helping defence build its sovereign sustainment capability as our fleet continues to grow. Order. Senator Reynolds, time has expired. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Securities, uh, Senator Ruxton. Uh, yesterday on Sky News, Senator Canavan uh, said about the cashless debit card, and I quote, I think it's now time we take the evidence on board and roll it out across the country. Does this reflect the Morrison government's position? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. 
Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. President, and I, and I thank Senator Dodson for his question. Um, Senator Dodson, you would be aware, as we are all aware, we are currently in debate on a bill that is before uh, this parliament that seeks to um, deal with existing trial sites and also um, income management recipients in the Northern Territory and Cape York. Nowhere contained in that bill, nowhere contained in that bill, um, is there any intention for any new communities or any new participants to be added to the cashless debit card or income management across Australia. So, uh, so Minister, uh, Senator, I, I can uh, I can assure you that the bill that is before you uh, at the moment uh, in this place. Uh, is a, a absolute reflection of the existing policy of this government in relation to income management uh, and in relation to uh, the cashless debit card. Um, but it, uh, it does give me the opportunity, and I'm sure I'm going to have many more opportunities before this day is out, um, to put on the record that the cashless debit card um, has a, is, is a superior piece of technology um, that allows people who are um, on the card to be able to go about their, their daily lives, unlike those people on the basics card, uh, and use this piece of technology in the same way as anybody else um, sitting in this chamber would be using a credit card or a debit card that is currently in their wallets. And uh, Can I acknowledge the extraordinary work of um, Senator O'Sullivan and the team of people that he's been working with over recent months to make sure that that technology is developed in such a way as the user experience for people that are on the card is, uh, is absolutely seamless and appears no different and acts no differently than any other card that would be uh, that you or I would have in in our wallet. And I acknowledge that we uh, we will continue to work to make sure that we provide the very best technology to support Australians Order. who need Senator our Senator Rustin, Senator Dodson, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, in February this year, Minister, the, uh, you said that the cashless debit card. Uh, the reason we haven't done it in the major cities is because. Uh, we need a deal. We need to deal with the technological issues, and you've just said you've fixed all of that up, which we are now close to resolving. It does need to have a broader application. Is also what you said. Can the minister confirm that the government's policy of making cashless debit card permanent in the current trial sites and the Northern Territory is just the first stage Order. of Senator the national Dodson, round time for the question has expired. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dodson, for your question. And uh, no, I can't confirm that because that is not the case. Um, but Senator Dodson, one of the very important things about um, this, the, the changes that we're proposing at the moment, um, is to make sure that we do have use technology to provide assistance to Australians to make sure that they have the very best opportunity to be able to. Uh, to use this card in a way that you and I um, use uh, the cards that are in, in our wallet, including some of the technological advances that Senator O'Sullivan has been working with um, you know, by putting the card on your phone, as an example, so that you're able to swipe it. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned uh, in my uh, question that I was asked by Senator McCarthy, we're also working with the traditional credit union in the Northern Territory so that we can uh, get a very good understanding um, as part of them becoming, hopefully, the issuer of the card going forward um, for people in the Northern Territory who will be on the cashless debit card. So, um, Order, Senator, Senator Rustin. Senator Dodson, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Prime Minister said. The cashless debit card is, and I quote, commending itself for wider application. Can the minister give an ironclad guarantee that the cashless debit card will never ever be expanded? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, um, and thanks, Senator Dodson, for his question. Um, you know, clearly, Senator Dodson has not heard what I have said in the, my primary question. That is that the policy of this government is reflected in the bill that is before this chamber um, as, we, uh, as we stand here now. But you know, we need to be really careful that we actually tell the truth and put the facts on the record when we discuss this card. Uh, and there are many, many uh, misconceptions and mis uh, that, that are spread around about this card. And another one was actually was tried to be perpetrated in this place a few minutes ago uh, with a question from uh, Senator McCarthy. And I've now had the opportunity to read the ASIC letter that has been sent to Mr Stephen Jones, MP, the Shadow Assistant Treasurer, and I'll just read you a line out of that letter. However, Section 12DL does not prohibit the unsolicited issue of the debit card or a deposit account to which the debit card is linked. I think that categorically states the answer. Order. Senator Birmingham. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Order. 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 Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you. Um, Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Rustin uh, to questions asked uh, uh, by myself, Order. Senator. Um, Senator McCarthy, please resume your seat. Senators, order. Please, um, Senator McCarthy has got the right to be heard in silence. Th Senator thank McCarthy. you, Th thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And I, I pick up on the minister's response, and clearly, clearly, and this, is, this has been the problem uh, with the government. It's about pick and choosing, pick and choosing the things that work for you in the sloppiness of how this government has brought forward the CDC legislation. You've got a 2.5 million dollar evaluation report, which you have not have not provided to this Senate. Uh, you had said you would do it uh, before the legislation went through to uh, the House, and you did not. Now, let me go to the uh, ASIC letter, and we are going to dissect this, uh, uh, Minister. You said in your response to my question that you did not agree with my interpretation of this letter. And I think it's important to restate this. It is clear that directing someone's social security payments to the cashless debit card does not fall under the provisions which Senator McCarthy referred to, well, I would very much like to see the advice that you received from the department on that, because it certainly is not the advice from what ASIC says. The minister has not answered the questions of legality raised by this ASIC advice because you have not done your job properly, as well as the complete lack of independence evidence from 13 years of income management in the Northern Territory and years of trials in places like Sejuna and the Kimberley, we now know there are significant questions about the legal operations of this legislation, perhaps a robo-debt 2 issue right here for this government. Section 12DL of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission Act 2001 ASIC Act provides that a person must not send another person a credit card or a debit card, except in specified circumstances. These circumstances are, in summary, where the person who will be liable to the issuer of the card in respect of its use has requested the card or in renewal or replacement of or in substitution for a card that has been so requested or previously used for a purpose for which it has intended to be used. These circumstances do not apply to the cashless debit card, which of course is mandatory, not voluntary, and which the government wants to impose on more than 23,000 Territorians. So Labor wrote to ASIC last week asking for their advice on this legislation that will lead to thousands of cards being sent to recipients who have not asked for it. They have not asked for it. That is the key to this response from ASIC. The advice from the Australian Securities Investments Commission about the government's rollout of the cashless debit card shows there are unresolved legal issues with the legislation. In the letter they sent in response to our questions, the ASIC acting chair, Karen Chester, said, if the eligible recipient has not given a written request for the card to be sent to them, there may potentially be a contravention of section 12DL. The letter goes on to say, for the benefit of senators, in 2016 an application was made to ASIC for a no-action letter in relation to the initial trial of the CDC program. A no-action letter granted by ASIC is a statement by ASIC that it does not propose to take action in relation to the contravention or possible contravention identified in the letter in the circumstances set out in the letter. It does not affect the operation of the law itself and does not affect the rights of other persons to take legal action in relation to a contravention of the law. ASIC does not have the power to grant an ex exemption from Section 12DL of the ASIC Act. 
The 2016 No Action Letter granted by ASIC was specified to apply to the trial of the program, and accordingly, it does not cover the proposed ongoing and broader program to be enabled by the bill. So ASIC advises the issues mainly rest with the sending of the cards, senators. The sending of the cards, and this is a key issue for potential recipients of the card in the Northern Territory and other remote areas. In many cases, they would have to travel hundreds of kilometres to get to the nearest Centrelink office to stand in line and sometimes wait for days to be issued with the grey card. What does this minister and this government expect those people to do? Just have no card? But none of you have any idea of the realities of life for people on welfare. So to get around this issue with Section 12DL for the original trial, NGU, with the backing of the Department of Social Services, was granted a no-action letter by ASIC. But it is illegal to send these cards. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Uh, it gives me great pleasure, actually, to stand here uh, and uh, reply uh, or give, take note of the answers given by Senator Russell this morning, uh, this afternoon, on the cashless debit card. Uh, it's no secret uh, to those in this place that I've been involved uh, with the cashless debit card uh, since before it was even an idea that the government was considering, uh, because I was part of the Mindaroo Foundation. It was an idea that came out of the Forest Review, uh, based on consultation with uh, people in communities across Australia, uh, and in particular the trial communities that were first initiated through the cashless debit card. Uh, the communities of Sejuna in South Australia and uh, the, the uh, uh, East, uh, East Kimberley uh, in Kununurra and, and in Wyndham. And what we heard from people uh, up there was the need for a circuit breaker to help these communities deal with the, the very devastating effects of chronic alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, and people can come into this place, and I've been listening to the debate on this uh, topic today, and they speak of many different things about the card. Uh, and really, when they are here saying, well, the people in these communities actually don't really even know what it is that they're wanting, they, they, they wouldn't actually know what would be good for them. That's essentially what they're coming in here and saying. Well, frankly, that is probably the height of paternalism the height of paternalism, to say to people in the communities that have the cashless debit card, that actually want the cashless debit card, that called on it in the first place to help them deal with some of the issues. None of them ever thought that it would be the solution to all of their problems. None of them. But what they wanted was a circuit breaker to help them deal with the challenges that they were facing as a community. And this government has been supporting those communities in that endeavour and it is demonstrating success across the communities. I want to just deal with some facts, some facts because there hasn't been a lot of facts brought out. There's been a lot of feelings brought out, but not a lot of facts. The cashless debit card is a visa card. It works like any other visa card that any other uh, bank customer would have in Australia, with one exception. That card cannot be used at liquor stores, at pubs, and can't be taken to an ATM to withdraw cash. So it will work at the 900,000 merchants that are signed on as a, you know, that have an FPOS machine operating uh, in their retail outlet. It also works online. You can pay your bills online. You can actually buy secondhand furniture because you can use things like PayPal and you can link your card to these sort of services to be able to pay for things. Uh, through COVID, we have seen a dramatic, a dramatic acceleration of the use of uh, contactless payments. And so more and more, Australians are going about their days using contactless payments, using cashless payments all the time. In fact, many people will say that they have uh, cash in their wallet and it's something they don't even go to use anymore because everywhere you go, it used to be such a, a case that it, you know, if you buy a coffee, you almost felt guilty for you know, buying a, a $4, $5 coffee using your card because it was a, an inconvenience to the, to the retailer. But now it's commonly accepted. And so the cashless debit card is operating on the Visa platform, which 
works just like any other card. It just won't work at a liquor store. But if someone does want to buy alcohol to be able to uh, enjoy a drink uh, uh, for a celebration or with friends uh, over a meal or dinner, they can because there's 20 per cent that's available uh, through uh, uh, their standard bank account. Lots of feelings are given as evidence across from the other side of this chamber, but not a lot of facts actually are borne out here today. I speak about, often speak about the, the impacts that are happening on the ground, and we say, well, they're just anecdotes that are being used. They're just anecdotes that are being used. When you talk to the, 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 the food land in, in South Australia, in Adelaide, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Sojuna, uh, they're now selling more fresh fruit and vegetables, and they've actually got less theft happening, less uh, shoplifting happening in their store. Yet those opposites say we can't use that because it's just an anecdote. Well, the anecdotes of people feeling stigmatised, people feeling targeted, are somehow more acceptable than the senior sergeant of police in Kununurra who says that this card is actually having a very positive oh, effect. Sorry, Senator O'Sullivan, your time has expired. Um, Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'd just like to take note of Senator Birmingham's answers to my questions and that of Senator Stirl. We're all in this together. How many um, times? Senator Watt, we are taking note of um, questions by Senator McCarthy and Senator Dodson to Senator Rustin around the cashless debit card and comments that were made on Sky News. That we were also taking note of the questions Senator Stirl and I asked. No, I'm not aware that um, Senator McCarthy said that. There was a fair bit of noise. Um, there was a fair bit of noise in the Senate at the time that she stood up, but I'd like to take note of the answers uh, from uh, senators to Senator McCarthy and Senator Dodson's questions about the cashless debit card. Thank you, Senator Watt. The, I've listened very closely to the debate that we've had regarding the cashless debit card over the last couple of days, uh, and and more convinced than ever uh, that the government's moves in try trying to roll out uh, the cashless debit card uh, on a more permanent basis is the wrong move for the individuals concerned in those regions and for the regions in which the cashless debit card uh, will be entrenched if the government gets its way. What Senator McCarthy was highlighting today in her question uh, was that there is serious doubt over the government's capacity to even roll out the cashless debit card, even if it were to get its legislation through this chamber. What the uh, letter from, the, from ASIC shows very clearly uh, is that the government has previously been given dispensation by ASIC to roll out the cashless debit card and to send it to people in a way that would ordinarily breach legislation because, of course, quite rightly, banks and other credit providers are ordinarily prevented from rolling out credit cards willy-nilly to people. So the government has previously been given dispensation to, roll out, to, to dispatch the cashless debit card uh, in a way that would not normally be permitted, but that was done on a trial basis only. So we don't dispute that the fact that the government has previously had power to send cashless debit cards to individuals in those trial regions. What we dispute is that they continue to have the power to do so on a more permanent basis, because we've seen no evidence whatsoever that the government has received a similar dispensation from ASIC for what it seeks to do into the future. So if the government doesn't have the power to send the cashless debit cards to new participants in the scheme in the regions that are affected, then how does it, how does it actually expect that this is going to work? Because some of the areas in which the cashless debit card has been operating so far and that the government wants to have it uh, continue on a more permanent basis are some of the most remote places in this country. They don't, there, aren't, there aren't shops that people can walk into. There aren't courier services that drop things off in, in the way that 
in a big city, you get something dropped off if you order on eBay. Well, Senator O'Sullivan, I've actually spent a bit of time in Cape York. I know a little bit about Cape York, for instance. And this may be news to you. This may be news to you, but courier drivers are not in the habit of rolling up to the doors of people on Cape York to drop off a cashless debit card or something that's ordered on eBay or anything else. So there is a real doubt over the government's ability to roll out these debit cards, even if it actually manages to get this legislation through. So I'd ask some of the more sensible voices in this government to actually have a look at the legislation and quickly work out whether they can even do what they want to do. Now that, of course, leaves aside the issues of whether the cashless debit card is a good idea at all, and I'll have a bit more to say about that in the debate on these bills later today. But the fundamental point to be made, and a number of my colleagues have already done this in this debate, in the, is that there is no evidence whatsoever that backs up what the government is seeking to do. This is an ideologically driven exercise from the government who wants to take away from unemployed people, particularly First Nations people, the capacity to make their own decisions about how they spend their money and instead impose the heavy hand of government in what people can do, which is a very surprising thing for a, for a government that claims to be all about small government to actually want to do. But that is the practical effect of the cashless debit card. It is racially discriminatory because it overwhelmingly applies to First Nations people. Uh, and it is flawed and without any evidence. The, re the, the research, so-called research that the government has, been, has provided to back up its arguments doesn't stand up to any scrutiny whatsoever, and there is a plethora of research which has been published by academic and other experts to show that the cashless debit card does not work. It's not too late for the government to retreat. It should reconsider what it's doing, and it should drop this legislation and drop the cashless debit card altogether. Thank you, Senator. What? Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, and it is a pleasure to rise to take note of the responses given by uh, Minister Rustin in response to questions today. Um, although I regret I may not quite do the topic such justice as my good colleague, Senator O'Sullivan, who I know is incredibly passionate about the cashless debit card. Indeed, he just spoke very passionately. Um, about it. And, um, I know that Senator O'Sullivan has worked extensively in this space, um, both in his career prior to coming to this place and as a senator for Western Australia, um, to ensure that, that we get this policy right. And he and, and many other members of the Morrison Coalition government have been working very carefully and very closely over the last um, 18 or so months to ensure that we get this right. And, and one of the comments that Senator O'Sullivan made in his contribution earlier that I would um, like to, to um, dwell on is that it was these communities that we're talking about that were calling on the government to implement the cashless debit card in, in the first place. And I think that that is something that has perhaps been forgotten in the debate that we've heard uh, in this chamber around the legislation that we will be um, debating later on this afternoon, that it is these communities in these areas that have requested this policy, that have suggested that this policy is a way to solve some of the problems that, that we are seeing in these communities. Senator O'Sullivan used the expression that this cashless debit card could be a circuit breaker that it would be a circuit breaker to help people in these communities uh, deal with some of the social issues that are causing such great problems um, locally, reducing alcohol uh, and drug consumption, um, reducing gambling, um, th these sorts of things. So I think that this policy um, certainly will uh, go some way to dealing with these issues, and, and that can only ever be a good thing. Senator Watt said in his contribution just now, and again, this is something that we are hearing over and over again, that there is no evidence that backs up what the government is trying to do with this policy. And, and I absolutely refute that assertion, Madam Deputy President. Um, fortunately, in the Senate, we have these things called committees that conduct inquiries into legislation. And it is one of 
the, um, the great joys of my job as a senator that we can come to this place and that we can take legislation that has been passed in the other place, take it to its relevant committee, put that legislation out to the broader Australian community and have a conversation around whether or not what is in the legislation is going to um, to deal with the, the issues that we're trying to rectify here. And indeed, um, the cashless debit card legislation went to the Community Affairs uh, Legislation Committee, chaired by my good friend and fellow Tasmanian Senator Wendy Askew. And that committee uh, has conducted a number of hearings at which evidence has been presented um, that this policy is needed uh, and that this policy will work. And I would like to um, quote from uh, Robin Nolan, the president of the National Council of Women Australia, a great Western Australian like Senator O'Sullivan, who said at the Community Affairs Legislation Committee hearing earlier this month, on the fifth, oh, earlier last month, my apologies, on the fifth of November, um, and Ms. Nolan said, "I've spoken to women and family members in the Kimberley. They are pleased with the card." They can feed their families. Kids aren't going to go to school hungry. And according to those working in the refuge, serious assaults and domestic and family violence reports have declined. Kids who are caught trying to steal food have also declined. So if this is an evidence, Madam Deputy President, that this policy is a good idea and will work and will make lives better um, for, for the people in these communities where the cashless debit card is being rolled out, then I, I don't know what is. Um, and I, I do wonder, uh, Madam Deputy President, whether or not those on the opposition benches have read the report of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, which of course recommended that this legislation uh, should be passed by the Senate. Like I say, this is why we have Senate committees, so they can take legislation to the Australian public, ask them for ideas and feedback, and make a recommendation to this place. Thank you, Senator Chandy. So the opposition is splitting its time, so I'm going to put that question. So the question is that the um, motion to take note of answers, as put by Senator McCarthy, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Sheldon. I move to take note of the answer provided by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Stirl. Well, you know, it's quite clear. They said quite clearly they will not guarantee individuals won't be worse off. This is the whole strategy by this government: less pay, less job security. At the very same time, we need to build confidence of the Australian people to be able to spend, to be able to build the economy, to make sure the business is successful and are able to employ hard-working Australians. Now, don't, wor don't worry about believing it from me. In 2017, the Reserve Bank said the exact same thing. We have to, and made it very clear that we have to heed their warning about wages being too low. And of course, what we hear from the government, more of the same. More of the same to turn around and start slashing and burning individuals' rights, individuals' wages and incomes across this country. Now let's look at what they're oversighting right at this moment. Pre-COVID, wage stagnation. And now we see the national share of income for the first time in 50 years of wages dropping below 50 per cent. And of course, what's their answer to workers' rights? What's their answer? Because you've got to really look at their history. When it came to casuals being ripped off in the mines, of course, who do they back? The big miners. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Let's cut their rights. Let's the miners double dip against those hard workers, those casual workers who are getting paid up to 40 per cent less than the permanent workers working straight beside them. Of course they intervened. They intervened because they took the side they always did against the Australian public and the Australian working community and back the side of the ruthless companies that turn around and exploit these sorts of workers. Now let's look at another example, Qantas. So they intervene in cases of importance, but comes to Qantas. And I'll quote from Josh Bornstein, who took these people on before, 
during the Sequeb dispute, who took the legal action to hold them to account when they conspired using our own armed forces, ex-military personnel, to turn around and try to destroy wages in this country. And he said in the, prison, in the Qantas dispute, in a claim that's now been made on behalf of 2,000 hard-working Australians that worked at Qantas, many of whom worked and worked in the, in the electorate of the Prime Minister, no noise from him, not a word of support. And he said, Josh Bornstein, any employee in any sector could suffer the same fate. We need to have a conversation in this country about companies like Qantas profiteering by cannibalising workers' wages. So why doesn't the government intervene for those hard-working Australians? Why doesn't the Prime Minister intervene for his own community? Because they're not well-paid executives of highly paid companies. And of course, what the government set up is another scenario. Their suggestions on IR about what they should be doing about the boot test, agreements that won't last two years, they'll last way beyond two years. And individual agreements that means people can get paid less, less. And what choice do you have when the boss says to you, guess what, take less or I'll outsource you like Qantas. I'll outsource your jobs to somebody who will do it if you won't do it. What choice is that? That's choice at a gun. That's economic standover tactics that this government is empowering employers to do. Because when they won't intervene in the boot, and of course they won't intervene in matters that are of the interest of hardworking Australians. And I want to just recall a very important comment that was made by Sean, who's a baggage handler, who came to this parliament and sat down in the House of Reps and listened to the Prime Minister. But he had said this in his plea for justice and intervention. I know he's not a big miner. He doesn't get the call, doesn't get their ear. He said, I have a wife and three young girls. How can I tell my three girls that you can work hard but can be replaced by a company that will pay people less? Well, this government's actually enshrining it. This government is getting rid of the boot Order, test, which Senator says that people Sheldon, will be worse um, off. The question is the motion moved by Senator Sheldon be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. We know the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the answer of the Leader of the Government in the Senate regarding the Christchurch mosque murders. This was a terrorist attack committed by an Australian man who, the report says, was driven by an extreme right-wing Islamophobic ideology. Any denial or obfuscation of this simple fact is an insult to the targets. I cried as I read the report yesterday. I cried for the innocent Muslims who were brutally murdered by the terrorists. I cried for the survivors who lost their loved ones forever, overwhelmed by the courage of the community who had been through so much. And I cried as I read the greeting, Assalamu Alaikum, at the start of the report, and words like Masjideh and Shohada sprinkled through the report, words that resonate with the Muslim community words that show empathy and respect for them. The report's findings and recommendations should be taken with utmost seriousness in Australia, where the terrorist has lived for most of his life. There are lessons here for the way we approach the many intersecting issues. I urge the Prime Minister to engage with the Australian Muslim community and carefully interrogate what needs to change in Australia. The report confirms the terrorist engaged with known far-right and white supremacist groups in Australia, some of which remain active in various forms. Two of these groups forced me to cancel an anti-racism event in Newcastle last year due to their planned disruption. Far-right extremism is not only still present in this country, it is growing. Just in the last few minutes, we have found out that an 18-year-old man from New South Wales has been arrested today. He had been accessing extreme right-wing material online, including how to make bombs. He was supportive of the Christchurch mosque massacre and openly racist. If this isn't a wake-up call, I don't know what will be. 
This country is in complete denial of these problems that we face. Let's be clear that there is no way in hell that we are going to be able to properly combat the racism in our culture in our country without acknowledging there are clear and ongoing links between the toxic far right and elements of our mainstream media and parliamentary politics. To take one example, it was revealed in the report that the terrorists made donations to numerous media organizations affiliated with people who are in our media class and given platform by Australian media outlets. In 2017, the terrorists made donations to media organizations run by or linked to two individuals, Lauren Southern and Stephen Molyneux, who came to Australia in mid-2018 on a speaking tour and participated in many sympathetic interviews with the right-wing media, in particular Sky News. Later in 2018, Senator Hansen moved in this very chamber her infamous motion claiming that it's okay to be white. As was noted back then, the slogan has a history of use in far-right and white supremacist circles. But it shot to attention in Australia by being worn on a t-shirt by Lauren Southern as she touched down here in 2018. She is now a regular Sky News contributor and lives in Australia. We can grow used to it after years of frustration, but hearing some of the contributions in this place today and earlier, there is an absurd amount of racist drivel that is spouted without sanction or accountability. There are people in this chamber who are not called out for their racism and bigotry, but those of us who highlight it are quickly called to order. With this attitude prevailing in our national parliament, we have little hope of tackling racism. I've said this before, and I will say it again. Australia is yet to reckon with being the country that raised the Christchurch killer. The government must take responsibility for the rise in far-right extremism reported by ASIO. All of the report's recommendations should be taken seriously and considered in Australia. We should have strong hate speech laws and dedicate resources to tracking hate crimes properly. I also welcome the report's recommendation to dedicate more government resources to challenging racism and promoting equality. Australia needs a national anti-racism campaign to combat and eradicate prejudice and bias. There is much to consider over the coming months, days and weeks. My thoughts are with the survivors and the families of those targeted as they process the release of this disturbing report. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary no, the ayes have it. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to consideration of legislation. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I move the motion as circulated and move the motion be put. The question, question, be put. The question is the motion be put. Senator Waters, I don't have an opportunity to call, allow for any debate prior to that. Um, the question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Government be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The noes have division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. The question is that the motion be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, tell off the ayes. Senator Seawitt, tell off the nose. The result of the division is ayes 41, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question is now that the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith tell of the ayes and Senator Seawitt tell of the noes.
Senator, senators need to remain in their seats. The result of the division is ayes 41, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The change in business is adopted. Until 4.30, senators will proceed with the routine of business. Are uh, there any petitions? The clerk. A petition has been lodged as noted on the dynamic red. The terms of the petition will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fieravanti Wells. Mr. President, on behalf of the sta uh, Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next sitting day to withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of three legislative instruments as set out in the list circulated in the Chamber. Thank you. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? If no one else has any other matters, I'll call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Business of the Senate number one for today to the 4th of February. General business 909 for today to the 10th of December. General business 939 for today to the 10th of December. General business 943 to today to the 15th of February. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. I'll commence with business of the Senate matter number three. A motion from Senator Ayres. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general, uh, business of the Senate notice of motion number three be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Question is that bit motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can I move to government business motion number one, Senator Dunningham? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that Government of Business notice of motion number one relating to Senator Small's first speech be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunning. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. 931, the name of Senator McAllister. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business notice of motion number 931 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move that the following bill be introduced. <coughs> Excuse me, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to fair work entitlements for workers experiencing domestic and family violence and for related purposes. Is it, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to fair work entitlements for workers experiencing domestic and family violence and for related purposes. Senator Urquhart. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator I Urquhart. table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in the hands out and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. I'm going to jump to motion 935, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. I ask that general business of uh, notice of motion number 935 relating to the number of women that have been killed by violence be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, domestic and family violence is a scourge and its impact is horrific. This government swiftly committed $150 million for the domestic violence specific COVID 19 support package now fully distributed to states and territories. This funding is on top of the $340 million the Commonwealth had already invested in the fourth action plan initiatives and the new ongoing 1800 RESPECT funding in the 2020-21 budget. Uh, on the International Day for the Elimination of Violence, the government also announced the three new providers of specialised family violence services in the Northern Territory. Senator Hanson. 
I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation recognises the scourge of family domestic violence that does not discriminate against women or men. As identified in heterosexual same-sex relationships, physical altercations between couples is not a matter of power imbalance. At a time where society continuously seeks equality, whether that be in wages or employment, this motion fails to recognise the need for equal frontline funding for men and women's domestic violence programs. And until this chamber acknowledges the hurt of domestic violence experienced by both sexes, One Nation will not support this motion. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Four minutes. Ring the bells for four minutes. You do it for one minute. Right, ring the bells for one minute. Sorry, there was just. Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Hanson, teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 40, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Mackenzie, number 936. Looking for Senator Mackenzie, who's here? Up, oh, Senator Davey. Are you able to do that? I can come back to that. Um, number 941, in your name, Senator Davey. Yes, this one. I ask that general business notice of motion 941 relating to support for local businesses be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Davey. I'm sorry. And can I also uh, add the names of Senators Mackenzie Canavan, McDonald, McMahon, and Dean Smith, and also add Senators Brockman and Van as co-sponsors. 
Thank you. And you move the motion now, Senator Davies? Yes. I move the motion. Thank you. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McKenzie will jump back to 936 if you are able to. Senator McKenzie. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number 936 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKenzie. I move that the following bill be introduced. Keep going. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. It's called a bill yeah, for an act sorry. to amend. Um, go back, Senator McKenzie. I'm not sure if you have the yellow sheet there. Um, the first motion we need is the motion that a bill be introduced. Um, okay. The, I'll, I'll, oh, sorry. Sorry. The question, the question it's is. Advice. <laughs> Do we need the title? We don't need it yet. First mistake. No. Okay. The question is: the motion be agreed to that, that a bill be introduced? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now the motion for the first reading, Senator McKenzie. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for your guidance. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999 and for related purposes. Senator McKenzie. Sorry, what did you just say, Senator Rice? I'll take that interjection. Order. Um, Senator Rice. Yeah. Senator Rice. She said killing animals, Mr. President. Okay, Senator Rice, you're really not being helpful. Really. There was no there was no need for that in a, a an area of formal business that we don't normally do interjections in, where the courtesies of allowing senators to introduce bills, and I'm sure you would not like the favour returned. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator McKenzie. I table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Wish Wilson, number 942. Oh, Senator McKim, sorry. Uh, I have both of your names. I just read the first one. My apologies. Uh, uh, no problems, uh, President. I inform the Chamber that Senators Billick, Urquhart, Brown and Polly will also sponsor this motion, and I ask that general business notice of motion number 942 related to Tasmanian handfish be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now, Senators, if I could go back. Senator Rennick, you have matter number 933. I ask that general business notice the motion 933 relating to Queensland's go Queensland government's energy policy be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There I being move none, the Senator motion. Senator Mo you got anything to say there, mate? Senator. Senator Rennick. Oh, sorry, Senator Watt. Thanks. I think senators are supposed to address each other by their correct title, Mr. President. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I didn't hear. The, uh, I seek leave what? to uh, make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Labor rejects this motion. It not only verbals me, but it is full of the type of half-baked theories and accusations Senator Rennick is quickly becoming infamous for. This, after all, is the senator who's convinced the Bureau of Meteorology is part of a climate change conspiracy, and not a day goes not a day goes by where Senator Rennick doesn't sound more and more like Senator, senator Roberts. Senator Rennick. The people of Queensland should breathe a sigh of relief that it is the Labor government of Premier Palaszczuk that sets Queensland energy policy rather than Senator Rennick. I think we're all starting to learn exactly why so many of Senator, colleagues, Senator Rennick's colleagues roll their eyes every time he stands up to say something in the chamber. Order. <laughs> Senator, Senator Watt, you came perilously close to reflecting on a senator there. That's not helpful. Um, order. I'm going to. I'm going to start being very strict about personal reflections because it is not helpful. So, Senator Watt, I'm going to ask you to withdraw that reflection about other senators' behaviour in response to a senator. I do consider that to be a reflection. I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Watt. Very much appreciated. Senator Roberts. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. One Nation supports this motion. Cheap, reliable Order. hydrocarbon fuels have led to the greatest improvement in human progress in the last 150 years. One Nation supports Senator Rennick's proposal to extend the Cogan Creek coal power plant. Climate policies and renewable subsidies have led to Australia having one of the most expensive power prices in the world and becoming more unstable. Senator Rennick's proposal is good for Queensland and good for Australia. 
Who could possibly vote against it? Order. The question is the motion moved by Senator Rennick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Order, Senators Rennick and Green. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 933 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 28. The matter is therefore negatived. Could we come to matter number 934 in the name of Senator McGrath? I think Senator Rennick, you are going to, uh, yeah. so going to do uh, this. Order. Oh. Senator Rennick, on behalf of Senator McGrath. Uh, on behalf of Senator McGrath, I ask the General Business Notice of Motion 934 proposing an order for the production of documents relating to the ABC's election coverage be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Reddick. Oh, I move the motion. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Um, Labor won't be supporting this motion. We support transparency, but we won't be part of a coordinated attack on the ABC yeah. by this government. From anyone from Senator Bragg to Minister Fletcher, we do not support this motion from Senator McGrath, who regularly seeks to undermine the national broadcaster. The ABC has statutory independence, a term that you guys don't understand, and the government must respect that independence. This motion undermines continuous improvement in election coverage at the ABC when the ABC is the most trusted news source in Australia and a fundamental pillar of our democracy. Labor will not be part of any base, short-sighted or ideological attack that undermines our democracy. Yeah, yeah. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Greens will not be. You are seeking leave for a short I statement. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Th thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Greens will not be supporting this motion, and I am concerned that this is just one more step in the attack that this government uh, cannot help themselves. Uh, on the ABC, our public broadcaster. Australians love their ABC. They know that it is the most trusted news source, and boy, don't this lot hate it. They hate it. They are obsessed with attacking the public broadcaster, attacking the people who work there, and attacking the Australians who tune in every night, all through the day, and access their local news through them. It is fundamental in this country that we have a public broadcaster Order. that is independent Senator, Senator, of Senator the infiltration Hanson of this rubbish. Senator Hanson Young, if I call your name, please resume your seat when you see a colleague on their feet. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, it is a clear convention in this place in relation to where leave is granted uh, for contributions to be made in relation to motions, that that leave is granted such that a senator can explain simply their position, not debate the motion. If Order. senators are going to carry on in this manner, leave will not be granted. Order. So Senator Waters on yes, a point of order? On a point of order, President. Uh, carry on in such a manner. Senator Hanson Young was expressing a strongly held view which our party Order. shares. We're not going to get into a debate and over I don't this. think Senator, that sort of Senator language Waters. is appropriate for the leader Waters. of the government. Senator Waters. Order. Now, everyone knows my view of this particular session of uh, business and the farce that it has become and the limits placed on the other senators who aren't given the right to speak and explain their position. So I won't restate that. But I will say one thing. The ability to grant leave is in the, ha is in the hands of every single individual senator. I also note me included, but I figure it's inappropriate for me to deny it. Um, it's tempting sometimes. But anyone can be granted deny leave, and I don't have to say who it is. I just I, I seek the unanimous consent of the chamber. So any one senator decides to, that means this procedure will end. Secondly, um, once leave is granted, a point of order can't be raised. I'm afraid, unless there's something unparliamentary, um, Senator Birmingham, because leave has been granted to make a one-minute statement. There's no orders around that. I would encourage people, though, that the practice has been that senators do allow parties and crossbenchers to state a position again, in the hands of all 75 other senators, um, and that has been done in the terms that Senator Birmingham to explain rather than debate, conscious that if you do debate, you are disallowing other senators from debating what you have asserted, which I think is unfair. But this procedure works this way, and it is done by convention, not by standing order. So you've finished your contribution, I gather, and we've got 15 seconds remaining. Senator Hanson-Young? Uh, I think I've said everything I need to say. I just want to apologise, though. I didn't see Senator Birmingham on his feet. Otherwise, I would have. Uh, Thank you. Lose. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Um, I apologise. I, I had to apologise for people too. So that's fair enough. Um, I will now put the motion moved by Senator Rennick on behalf of Senator McGrath, number 934. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Noes have it. 
I'm, I'm stuck in the position. We have regular. I've called it for the eyes. I'm going to ring the division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. If we have regular ties, I sort of alternate. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 934 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Farrell, number 937. Senator Urquhart. General business notice of motion number 937 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The government opposes the motion moved by Senator Farrell. There has not been an occasion where the Senate has ordered a senator who wasn't a minister, including opposition or crossbench senators, to appear before a committee. This motion would be an unprecedented deviation from, uh, from the practice in this area. On this matter, Senator Mackenzie has cooperated with the Senate Select Committee and followed the practice by voluntarily providing the committee with a comprehensive submission. Senator Hanson. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation has always ordered accountability, not witch hunts, within this parliament, and we have demonstrated Order. our support of a national ICAC. Order, Can Senator Wish Wilson. I recognise this notice of motion risks setting a precedent, but let it be understood that One Nation's support is not pre predicated on attacking backbenchers. This is not about holding a minister at the time accountable for their actions while in high office. The private sector cannot ab abdicate their responsibility as a director by stepping down, and nor should a minister. Should motion 937 succeed today, it might encourage the Senate to look at debating this matter further to amend standing orders. Senator Rice. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The Greens are supporting this motion as an incredibly important motion so that we can hear from former Minister now Senator Mackenzie to learn some more information about just what went on with these sports frauds. It was a complete corrupt use of government funds to be supporting their election in the 2019 election. It is very clear from the evidence that has been presented to the Sports Frauds Committee that there was collusion between Senator Senator Mackenzie in her office. Order, Senator Davey, on a point of order. Uh, point of order. Can we talk about it? Uh, can we use the correct terminology? This was not sports warts. It was a sports grant program. Senator Davey, that's not a point of order. Um, that's a, that, 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 I don't think senators would like me to get into restricting terminology of debate if it wasn't strictly unparliamentary. Senator Rice. It was clear from the evidence that was presented to our committee, the hundreds of emails, the colour-coded spreadsheets that's passed between Second. former Mackenzie's office and the Prime Minister's office, that there was involvement right across the Liberal Party, right up to the level of the Prime Minister, and including the Liberal Party campaign officers as well. It is critical that the Senate, through this committee, is able to hear from former Minister Mackenzie to find out what Mr. President, point of order, and I am mindful of your ruling before, uh, but I do again point out uh, the conventions of the Senate that are again are being abused by the Greens. Um, there's no point of order, Senator Birmingham. Um, I think the point's been made, and either Crosswhips can discuss it or one of the lucky 75 can actually start denying leave. Senator Rice, have you concluded? I have can concluded. Thank, thank you. you. The question is that motion number 937 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
stop the bells. The question is, stop the bells and close the doors. Um, the question is that motion number 937 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell if the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 28. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, we have two more matters left. If we get through them quickly, we'll meet the deadline. Can I deal with matter number 938, Senator Seward? Yes, Senator Abetz. On a point of order, Senator Abetz? Yes, sir. on a point of order, given the contribution made by Senator Rice, who is a member of the committee investigating the matters that she traversed, she has clearly now already determined the matter, and I'm wondering as to the appropriateness of that and whether she should now be disqualified from the committee, having predetermined the matter uh, and having made the pronouncement that certain actions were corrupt. Order. One would assume, one would assume, therefore, that no more hearings are required and the committee can be wrapped up. On, on the point of order. The matter for the termination of membership of committees is a matter for the Senate. I am not aware of any uh, issue of the standing orders with respect to that, Senator Abetz. I will check. Um, it's not one I'm familiar with that's been raised before, and I'll come back to the chamber if appropriate. Senator Seward, number 938. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number three, sorry, 938 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government is extending uh, payment of the coronavirus supplement for a further three months from the 1st of January 2021 at a cost of $3.2 billion to provide additional temporary support to Australians impacted by the pandemic. The extension of the coronavirus supplement and a range of enhanced eligibility criteria within the social services system complements the $507 billion worth of direct economic and uh, balance sheet support already committed by the government. Uh, the government's priority is to get Australians back to work, including through the JobKeeper program and the JobMaker program set out in the budget. Senator Roberts. You to make a one-minute statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Our policy in One Nation is to support an increase for pensions and an increase for JobSeeker as of pre-February. Yet we will not support this motion. JobSeeker is a difficult situation because there are all kinds of allowances, family tax benefit A and B, rent assistance, energy allowance. This motion from the Greens puts, an undefined, puts no figure, it's undefined. We need to reform welfare and make it simple. But I also point out I also point out that the Greens' policies are rapidly increasing cost of living in this country, and that is highly regressive on the poor. So we, we will not be supporting this policy. The question is that motion number 938 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Stop the bells. Question is the motion number 938 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell off the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell off the nose. The result of the division is eyes 29, nose 29. The matter is negated. Can we move to matter number 940? Senator McAllister is the final matter. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I inform the chamber that Senator Waters will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 940 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to, Senator Dunningham? Agreed to make a very short so, Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Australia has always been happy to participate in the summit and indicated our willingness to do so. So, in response to the invitation from the Prime Minister Johnston and the other hosts, uh, we welcome any opportunity to highlight Australia's outstanding record of exceeding our commitment to reduce emissions from 2005 to 2018. We reduced emissions faster than comparable countries like Canada and New Zealand, and the latest data has us at 16.6 per cent lower than 2005 levels. The only endorsement the government seeks for its policies is that of the Australian people. At the last election, Australia voted for our practical, technology-focused policies that reduce emissions while keeping the economy strong. Senator Roberts. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation opposes this motion. I, for one, would be happy for our Prime Minister not to speak at the Climate Ambition Summit. Our Prime Minister has demonstrated that he will not put the interests of Australia first. On the international stage under pressure, the Prime Minister turns to jelly and adopts the agenda of the United Nations without regard for the damage it does to our Australian economy or the lives of Australians. If Australians want someone to represent and fight for Australia, may I suggest Senator Order. Hanson or I would be happy to take the Prime Minister's place. The Greens won't debate me, so maybe some of their globalist masters will. Order. The question is that motion number 940 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Four minutes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that matter number 940 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point to Senator Urquhart, tell of the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell of the nose. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. Pursuant to order, we will now move on to um, another matter. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Fair Work Registered Organisations Amendment withdrawal from Amalgamations Bill 2020 for concurrence. Senator Birmingham. President, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to registered organisations and for related purposes. Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Now we will now. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr. President. The bill before us represents a common sense, reasonable and technical amendment to the Registered Organisations Act, specifically the provisions in the Act that deal with withdrawal from amalgamation. Currently, the Act allows a constituent part of an amalgamated union to withdraw from the remainder of the union. It is a democratic process involving a secret ballot of the members of that part of the union seeking to withdraw from the amalgamation. The problem is that these provisions only apply between two and five years after an amalgamation. And that's a narrow window, and it doesn't contemplate the possibility that a demerger could happen after that time. The drafters of the original legislation most probably did not foresee circumstances in which an amalgamated union might wish to withdraw from the merger after five years. But like any partnership, there are often very good reasons why it might be better for the partners to go their separate ways and operate independently. So this bill corrects that by creating an exception to this time limitation via a new appropriateness test in section 94A of the bill. This provision allows the Fair Work Commission to grant an application for a withdrawal ballot if certain conditions are met. These conditions guide the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. A new section, 94A2, sets out these conditions, which include whether the amalgamated organisation has a record of not complying with workplace or safety laws and any contribution of the constituent part to that record, and the likely capacity of the constituent part after it withdraws from the merger to be able to promote and protect the economic and social interests of its members. If a secret ballot of members of the constituent part seeking to withdraw from the amalgamation is successful, the legislation then sets out some clear rules for how the separation takes place. 
It will require the applicant to file its plans for withdrawal, which include the rules of the amalgamated union and the proposed new union, the names of the respective organisations post-withdrawal and the allocation of assets and liabilities between the amalgamated organisation and the newly registered organisation. The rules set out must avoid any overlap in coverage between the demerged entities. The bill also makes provisions for ballots other than postal ballots conducted by the AEC. This is to recognise that some unions are currently exempted from the requirement to use the AEC for union elections. It also recognises that a number of unions have an existing custom and practice of having attendance ballots as their preferred means of collective decision making. I note the bill provides for a review of its operation within two years of its enactment. This is a safeguard to ensure that the bill is operating in the manner intended. I said at the outset that this is a sensible amendment that reflects the fact that some mergers have gone beyond the three-year limitation that currently exists in the Registered Organisation Act. Like the nature of work itself, trade unions change to reflect the workforce they represent. As industries grow, shrink or simply change, so does the representation of the workers in those industries. <coughs> work and workplaces are ever-evolving and we should recognise that. A union must be relevant and able to represent its workers. We also need to recognise the principle of freedom of association, which includes a right to join or leave a group, and that right doesn't only operate within a three-year time period. As such, Labor supports the bill. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Registered Organisation Amendment Withdrawal from Amalgamations Bill 2020. This bill facilitates the expedited splitting up of amalgamated unions. Not only is the government expediting the splitting up of amalgamating unions, but they are also expediting this bill through parliament. I guess it's not new. This government rushes through legislation that they don't want any scrutiny on or any light shown on, and they're doing it again. But shame on the Labour Party for being on a unity ticket with the government, for rushing through legislation which has really not been looked at, um, really not been interrogated, and that will have a massive impact on the union movement and on workers. Here they are sitting here voting with the government saying, yeah, let's push that through within the hour. No one will see what's, what's happened. Absolute shame. The government has sprung this bill on the parliament with little warning in a complete act of contempt for this place, the union, the union movement and workers. This bill has implications for all workers and for all unions and should not be rushed through parliament without proper scrutiny and without proper inquiry. As with all legislation with broad implications, we need a consultation process so we are all clear on what exactly we are being asked to vote on. But we won't get that opportunity to do that today, will we? All of us in this place know that the Liberal and National Parties are no friends of unions and no friends of workers. That's, that much is pretty clear. You couldn't trust this government on industrial relations as far as you could throw them. How many attempts at union busting have we seen from that lot over there? over the last few years? What evidence has the government ever provided that they want to see unions succeed in protecting workers and advocating for workers' rights? If the government was actually concerned about workers, unions, and their ability to organize effectively, they wouldn't be trying to push through legislation in the space of a day, not even a day actually, it's half a day, on the second last day of the sitting for the year taking the trash out. This is a government that cut some of the most vulnerable workers out of JobKeeper, putting not just workers and their livelihoods at risk, but also public health at risk itself. This is a government who just last year tried to force through union busting legislation that sought to make union amalgamations even harder than massive corporate mergers. They tried to put the right to strike even further out of workers' reach. They allowed and celebrated cuts to workers' penalty rates. They weakened workers' rights 
to good conditions and pay protection under cover of the pandemic response legislation. And they are further entrenching insecure work. These people are the ideological children of John Howard. This government has given no indication that the Liberal and National parties have evolved since they tried to smash the union movement and people's rights at work with their terrible work choices legislation. The coalition's dearest wish is for the state to be able to interfere in the functioning and establishment of unions whenever they can. To benefit businesses and further their neoliberal politics, the government wants unions to be as hobbled and powerless as possible. We want to be sure that this bill is not just designed to fragment the union movement and dilute the power of workers to organize and stand up for themselves against bosses. We want to ensure that any bill affecting the union movement strengthens the power of workers and results in the improvement of worker pay and conditions. Unions are a vital part of our civil society. They fight for fair and safe conditions for workers and make important contributions to our democracy. And as a longtime union member, I am committed to fighting for the rights of workers to organize and to protect our unions. And I will be moving a Greens second reading amendment to refer this bill to inquiry for report so we can hear from the people who will be affected by this legislation and make an informed decision. There is absolutely no rush to push this bill through today or even tomorrow. We can have an inquiry, we can come back early in the next year, and then we can decide based on the information that we have whether we should support this or whether others should support this bill or not. Senator Under Fulton. these conditions, we will not be voting for this bill. And um, we are not here to simply tick and flick whatever bills the government puts in front of us. We are here to make sure that the bills are properly looked at. That's our job in this chamber. This is not the way laws should be made. This bill must be referred to inquiry so the Senate can do its job and ensure that legislation that affects workers' lives is properly looked at. I move the Greens' second reading amendment and commend it to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Waters. Yes, thanks, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this bill, a bill that was just introduced into the House shortly after 9.30 this morning, today. And now this government is ramming it through the Senate less than nine hours later. And on what is International Anti-Corruption Day, I wanted to point out that we have waited two years for a federal anti-corruption watchdog bill. And this government claims they've been too busy to get onto it, and yet in less than one day it's magicked up a bill that affects unions and potentially dilutes their power. And it can ram that through, but it can't ram through an accountability measure that would apply to its own mob to clean up their appalling behaviour. The Senate is not a rubber stamp. This government is treating it like a rubber stamp. The Greens have moved for this bill to go to a Senate inquiry. Now, industrial relations laws are complex in all times, but particularly when they pertain to union operations and the rights of workers to organise themselves. You don't want to get this wrong. And yet this morning, the House passed this bill within 41 minutes. And many of the speakers, although there weren't that many because there was only 41 minutes to debate it, pointed out that they hadn't had time to read the bill. What absolute disgusting process to force parliament to pass legislation that they haven't even read. Now, if there's a genuine sense of urgency, there can be some flexibility shown. The minister in the House was invited to speak to urgency and could give no such explanation. There is no reason why this bill is urgent. There is no reason why the Labor Party should be supporting this bill, but perhaps one wonders if they want this dirty deal done and over so that by the time Christmas is, is uh, all gone and by the time we come back in the new year, people will have forgotten about it. Perhaps that's their motivation behind siding with the government to ram this legislation through without even subjecting it to a Senate inquiry. That's why the Greens are moving for this bill to go to an inquiry. Perhaps this bill is innocuous. 
but we haven't had the chance to hear from those who've scrutinised it, to hear from those unions who will be potentially affected by it, to know what impacts it might actually have. And it is reprehensible that a parliament can pass a law, uh, introduce it, debate it in one house, pass it, introduce it in another chamber, pass it in one day without an inquiry, when it has potentially such far-reaching impacts on workers' rights and on workers' ability to organise to protect what little rights they have left after seven years of this awful government attacking them and their rights at work. So we will not be supporting this bill, and we will be urging the chamber to support our amendment to send this bill to inquiry, which is the normal process in the Senate. That is what we are here for. That is our job. I'll finish off by repeating. We've waited two years for an anti-corruption watchdog bill. Within less than one day, we get a union-busting bill from this awful government. Their priorities are perfectly clear. Senator Roberts. I seek the call to speak on this I, bill. Senator Roberts, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. While One Nation supports the general thrust of this bill because it upholds the principle of freedom of association by enabling constituent parts of registered organisations that have amalgamated with other organisations to apply to the Fair Work Commission to hold a ballot of its members on whether to withdraw from the amalgamated organisation outside the current time-limited period of five years post-amalgamation in specified circumstances. So we agree with the principle of freedom of association and the right of people to withdraw from an, ent from an entity. However, we, we want to make a note that while the Labor Party and Liberal Party have joined to push this through, we are not, we are not, uh, we are not supportive of the, of the abuse of parliamentary process because we haven't had time to even look at this bill properly. We don't know if there are any hairs hidden in it or, or, or any, any hidden traps in it. So we would request that we be given more time to assess important bills like this. We know that this is directed in response to the CFMEU's mess, the dysfunctional mess that its own leaders have, have called the CFMEU at the moment, with, in, with accusations of bullying in the press from senior members of the CFMEU. We understand this is done to enable those people to de-amalgamate, but we need more time to assess these bills. Why was it held up until today? This does not augur well for the major bill that we hope to see pretty soon and that we need to give proper consideration. Bill that would talk about Order. casuals, bill that would talk about um, compliance issues, bill that will talk about enterprise agreements and awards and greenfields agreements. This is not the way this parliament should be addressing serious matters. This is just rushing through, bulldozing through. So we want to make a, we want to noted that we do not like this process. So while I've seen a summary of the bill, we haven't seen the details. We understand there are some safeguards, but we can't understand why the government will dump something like this on us and give us just five minutes to go through the whole bill. We understand. The other bill now is up with 221 pages of an explanatory memorandum, 111 pages of legislation. And I'm very concerned that the Industrial Relations Club, which runs this country's industrial relations situation and creates problems for them to solve and perpetuate their own work, is going to further complicate the current complex, fractured, broken industrial relations regime in this country. The government has consulted on this further bill behind closed doors, a process that has not been public, and we are, we are afraid, with, with good reason, that the people of Australia will be let down. Honest workers, honest employees, or honest employers will be let down. Small business is currently being smashed by the Industrial Relations Club. And all this shows, by pushing this bill through so quickly, is it shows that the Labor Party and the Liberal Party and the National Party are together again as the Liberal Labor duopoly. And this is not good enough for the workers of this country, honest workers who are getting screwed, honest small businesses who can't compete because they're lumbered. They don't have the hundreds of lawyers at their disposal. They can't afford that. Small business is being cruel in this country. 
by an industrial relations club, the lawyers, the courts, the Fair Work Commission, the union bosses of some of the large companies, the employer associations. They make it so complex, they then create problems that they rush in as white knights and solve. This has got to stop. We have got to simplify industrial relations. The government is telling us we need to pass the next bill through quickly as well. Now, we understand they want to send it to committee, which is good. But the bill has not had due process in its construction, in its drafting. And this current bill, getting back to this bill before us now, shows that the government and the Labor Party do not respect the parliamentary process. We should be scrutinising this bill and seeing its effect on everyday Australians and especially on small business. We need to simplify industrial relations, get it back to the basics between it's essentially industrial relations, a relationship between employees and employers. That's what it is. It's about relations at work, relations in industry. And what the IR Club has done in this country is fracture that relationship. So employees go to union bosses or, law or lawyers. Employers are forced to go to courts and lawyers. That doesn't make a relationship. It separates and destroys a relationship. That's the fundamental thing that's wrong with industrial relations in this country. Managers can't manage. Employees can't work. Restrictions galore. And we're coming out of a COVID crisis, supposedly, the government's own restrictions. With this around our necks, when are people going to wake up in this country? Fundamentally, industrial relations is about a relationship between an employer and their employee. That's it. So if this is the process on this bill, we will be abstaining. We know that Labor and Liberal and the Nationals are going to get together again. We do make, make note that we support the deamalgamation provisions, but we want to see the details. And we give warning that we will be scrutinising the larger bill that is coming. Because if this is the way the government does its industrial relations, without adequate consultation, then all we can see is we're terrified of increased complexity, which will destroy small business, destroy employees, destroy employment. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Me firstly, can I thank those who have contributed to the debate. The government is pleased to be making these changes to ensure that registered organisations can choose the governance structure that best represents the people they are designed to serve, their own members. We are committed to ensuring that the industrial relations framework continues to adapt and change to meet the needs of business and workers alike and upholds the fundamental principle of freedom of association. The bill will give greater flexibility to constituent parts such as branches and divisions of amalgamated registered organisations by providing them with an opportunity to withdraw from an amalgamation if that will better serve them and their members. It addresses the current restriction in the Fair Work Registered Organisations Act 2009, the Act, that constitutes part of an amalgamation, amalgamated organisation that only have a three-year window to withdraw from the amalgamated organisation, more than two years but no later than five years after the amalgamation. That outer limit of five years restricts the ability of registered organisations to adapt to and align their governance structure with the changing needs of members. There are numerous valid reasons why a constituent part may want to withdraw from, amal from an amalgamation beyond the five-year window. The bill remedies shortcomings in the existing framework by allowing constituent parts of an amalgamated organisation to apply to withdraw from that amalgamation beyond the five-year time limit. These are sensible changes that will be reviewed in two years of commencement to ensure that they are working effectively and meeting their objective. I commend the bill to the Senate. 
Thank you, Minister. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. Uh, the noes have it. Yes. Division required. Ring the bells. Stay here for the division. Stop the bells. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt, teller for the ayes, and Senator Ciccone, teller for the noes.
The result of the division is eyes 10, noes 39. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question is now that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point to Senator McGrath, tell of the ayes, and Senator Seawitt, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 40, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, there are no amendments. Oh, the second, the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to registered organisations and for related purposes. And no amendments have been circulated, so I intend to call the minister to move the third reading unless there's an objection. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Stop the bells. The question is the bill be read a third time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath, tell off the ayes. Senator C, what tell off the noes? The result of the division is ayes 39, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to registered organisations and for related purposes. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, pursuant to contingent notice of standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to the consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question be now put. The question is that we start the series of Divisions required, but the question is the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. I'll just give the whips a moment. Um, all right, I advise, I advise senators that because normally they would be allowed to abstain by staying behind the rail, which is now being used for seating, if they do need to abstain from a vote, if there's no one in one of the rear advisers' boxes, I will allow them to move to that as if they were moving to the rail so their vote isn't counted, something we haven't had to encounter just yet. Um, so the question is the motion be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. That wasn't necessary, Senator Hanson Young. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath, tell of the ayes. Senator Ciccone, tell of the nose. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that so much of standing orders be suspended as moved by Senator Birmingham. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Stop the bells. Question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath tell off the ayes. Senator Ciccone tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. I move that a motion relating to the consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question be now put. The question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. I've been asked because of the time with the pairing to ring the bell for four minutes. So I ring the bells for four minutes. After this, we'll be going back to one minute bills.
Stop the bells. The question is, the question be now put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath, tell off the ayes. Senator Ciccone, tell off the nose. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham to allow him to bring on another motion. Ayes will pass. Uh, the, those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells and I'll give the whips a moment. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Birmingham regarding the introduction of another motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath, tell off the ayes. Senator Ciccone, tell off the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I move the motion as circulated. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. I will give the whip some argument. Question is the motion as circulated by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath tell of the ayes, Senator Ciccone tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I thank senators. That's the final division. We return to the order of business and the consideration of government documents and other business until 7.20 p.m. or no later than 7.20 p.m. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents and uh, Senator Patrick, are you seeking leave? Think I seek leave to make a uh, statement. Is to leave the granted? Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I just wanted to bring the attention to the chamber 
of a uh, rather serious issue that uh, all senators ought to be aware of. Most will not un know the history of this, but uh, back in 2017, the Auditor General commenced an audit into the, uh, an army project called Hawkeye. Uh, as he completed that audit, which uh, was completed in and around uh, the, uh, the 6th of September 2018, um, the Attorney General intervened and uh, Sorry, Senator Patrick, we should have clarified the amount of time that you're seeking. I'm sorry, have I've been granted leave and I'll just continue if that's okay. How, how much time are you oh, seeking when to I've, speak? When I've finished, I'll, I'll resume my seat. Is that Thank acceptable? You. Well, leave has been granted, Chair. Less than ten. Patrick. Senator Thank Patrick. You. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll continue. So um, the situation uh, is that uh, the Auditor General uh, tabled a uh, sorry the Auditor General tabled a report in the Parliament, but that report was censored. It was censored by way of a very rarely used power by the Attorney General of Australia uh, on the uh, under Section 37 of the Auditor General's Act. Now, uh, the only time, that's the first time that section had been used uh, in respect uh, of uh, censoring the Senate uh, since, uh, since the Auditor General's Act came into, uh, in, in, into effect. And indeed, the previous Auditor General Act, I, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in the 90s, was the previous time in which the power was exercised. The power was exercised on the basis that the, the, the Senate, uh, the, the uh, Parliament, should not see um, information in the Auditor General's report be on the basis that it was national security sensitive and commercially sensitive. I just wish to inform the Chamber that I challenged that decision, and that decision has uh, now been handed down today, and. The Administrative Appeals Tribunal has found that the Attorney General uh, basically committed an error, both a political error and a legal error, in uh, in his decision. And it's another example of uh, the government being uh, secretive, stopping this Parliament from having access to information for which it rightly should. We are talking about an Auditor General's report. The Auditor General is an officer of the Parliament by, by way of statute, and uh, without the Auditor General, we, uh, this Parliament would uh, be denied the ability to properly examine the actions of government. The Auditor General um, is, a, is a really important player. He has the discretion to be able to remove information from his reports and uh, generally uh, has not had any issues in uh, the period in which uh, the current Auditor General has been in his, in his office, which has been which is five years. Um, and of course he appeared before the JCPAA and he made it very clear that he was of the view that what was in the report, what, would what had been redacted by the Attorney General, was in fact uh, not sensitive. The AAT has backed that up. So I just wanted to point this out. This is an error of uh, judgment, legal judgment by the Attorney General, uh, in much the same manner as he's made uh, legal errors in respect of uh, the prosecution of Witness K, the prosecution of Bernard Kaleri, the prosecution of Richard Boyle, the prosecution of David McBride. It demonstrates that. The, this decision from the IAT demonstrates today that the Attorney General does not have the capacity to actually make a correct decision uh, around matters of national security and around matters of commercial interest. And uh, that's important because uh, in, in some of the uh, trials that are currently being played out before the courts, 
the NSI has been enacted on the basis of the Attorney General intervening and requesting that information be not uh, uh, produced in open court because of national security sensitivities. This decision of the AAT shows that the Attorney General is not capable of making such decisions, and uh, he should be uh, now reconsidering what he's done in respect of the. Um, uh, in respect yes. of the. Uh, Senator Henderson. On a point of order. I uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting President. Look, I would. Uh, my point of order is on the basis that. The senator is reflecting on the attorney general in a way that is in breach of the standing orders, and I would ask him to, to not do so, and for you to bring him into order. Thank you. Senator. Okay, thanks, Senator Henderson. So, Senator Patrick, could you just continue your remarks uh, with uh, Senator Henderson's uh, comments in mind? Uh, Senator Patrick, you have the call. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, just to make it very clear, um, the, this is the finding of the of the AAT. Uh, the decision under, under review is set aside and is substituted with a decision that the disputed material is not exempt from disclosure under the FOI Act, and that Senator Patrick is given the material is, is given access to the disputed material. Now, I am quite within my rights to come in here and challenge the uh, efficacy and the ability of the Attorney General to make proper decisions. That's actually one of the roles of the Senate: is to uh, hold the executive to account. In this instance, the Attorney General sought to censor the Parliament and did so improperly. Did so without regard to the law. Did so without regard to uh, the, 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 um, the re without regard to respect of the Parliament. Now, along the way, the Attorney General has thrown everything at this tried to raise a constitutional matter, which uh, of course required careful consideration, required public money uh, being spent on the AGS because the AGS were representing the Prime Minister in this particular case, spending taxpayers' money and then at the very last minute withdrawing uh, uh, the, uh, the case on the constitutional matter, just a waste of taxpayers' money. And if I uh, want to stand in this chamber and say that the Attorney General did not exercise good judgment, that's, I'm quite entitled to do so. Don't you dare, don't Senator Patrick, could you please direct your uh, remarks through the chair? So, I'm Thank sorry, you. Chair. Um, Senator, Senator Henderson, on the point of order. Uh, the point of order is that I raised my earlier point of order in relation to other ways in which Senator Patrick was reflecting on the Attorney General being his capacity more broadly to make proper decisions. I understand the point that he's raising in relation to the AAT decision. That was not my point of order. It was on the broader point that he is making. He's improperly reflecting on the Attorney General more generally, and I would ask him not to do so. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. I've already ruled on that point of order and Senator Patrick I'd just remind you to make your comments through the chair again and I apologize for that uh, chair but again uh, no senator should be pre pre prevented from coming in into this chamber and challenging the judgment of any member of the executive that is entirely appropriate that is quite parliamentary in fact it is the role of the Senate to do so uh, I um, Section 49 of the Constitution makes it very clear that we have an oversight responsibility, that we hold the executive to account. And if that means I stand and make an allegation uh, grounded by the facts that I've, uh, I've now read into the Hansard, that the Attorney General is incapable of making proper decisions, then I will do so. That is my role. 
It is quite parliamentary. It is not in breach of the standing orders. And I know that uh, perhaps some senators uh, may uh, feel they wish to, uh, to defend the Attorney General, but actually, a a again, a series of decisions made in respect of uh, prosecutions, uh, decisions to prosecute Witness K, Bernard Caleri, uh, Richard Boyle, uh, uh, David McBride, whistleblowers because the government wants to, to, to keep everything in, in, uh, uh, in, inside the closet. And again, information that this parliament was entitled to have was withheld on the basis of a flawed decision by the Attorney General. Uh, the, the, the Senate, in my view, ought to reflect on what, uh, what's happened here. Ought to reflect on what has happened here, and that is uh, very, very simply, um, uh, it's another instance of where the executive is trying to prevent us from doing our work. I've talked on many occasions about times in which the, uh, you know, the executive have advanced public interest immunities, and time and time again we find that uh, citizens, regular citizens, can get access to documents that senators can't because, because the um, uh, the executive simply doesn't respond, and in many respects because the Senate doesn't exercise its powers properly over the executive. It's a serious issue, and I ask senators uh, to reflect on it, and I'm happy to, to provide any of them uh, the decision that was made by the AAT today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents, and a list of the documents has been circulated in the chamber. Does anyone wish to take note of documents? S Senator. No. Senator. All oh, right. Yep. So I move to tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, at the request of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, Senator Polly, I present Scrutiny Digest No. 18 of 2020 of the Committee. Yeah, yeah sorry. Senator Davey, I think Senate, I think Senator Davey jumped first. I'll come back to you. Um, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia, I present the interim report of the committee on the Duke and Gorge Caves, and I move that the Senate take note of the report, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator. Uh, So just, just bear just bear with me, Senator Seward. Okay. Senator Seward. Thank you. As a member of this committee, I would most certainly uh, like to talk to this report. This is a very important report. Um, I, it's, it's never again on the inquiry into the destruction of forty of forty six. Thousand-year-old caves at the Duke and Gorge in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. This is an interim report. It contains seven extensive uh, recommendations around what happened when Rio Tinto blew up, blew up 46, 000, the 46,000-year-old rock shelters at Duke and Gorge in the Pilbara devastating the traditional owners, the PKKP, who had, sig had indicated that these were extremely important caves. The process failed so badly that every single way along the process they were failed, absolutely failed. And I say this is a, a multi-party uh, partisan uh, report, multi-partisan a report, interim report. Um, this is 
the, these recommendations are powerfully supported by the members of this committee. We, rec we made recommendations around uh, Rio Tinto, uh, whose processes internal processes completely failed. Rio Tinto, whose, whose name around the world for a long time was pretty poor in the way it, it dealt with Indigenous peoples improved in Western Australia in terms of their commitment to First Nations cultural heritage, had their internal processes, and then they went downhill, downhill to such, the, to such an extent they thought it was okay to blow up these rock shelters, 40,000-year-old rock shelters, when in their administration block at the mine there is a soil profile that demonstrates that 46,000-year-old history, and it has little stickers on it that mark the Ice Age, that mark where the pyramids were, and other memorable points. So this was there, and the people, Rio, knowing this was in the admin centre, some people walking past it every day. And visit, their executives have visited some of them, not all of them, have visited it and seen it. They still blew it up. So there's recommendations around Rio Tinto. The first recommendation, a dot point in there, is negotiate restitu a restitution package for the destruction of the Duke and Gorge shelters with the PKKP. It then talks about full reconstruction to try and recover those rock shelters. It then makes recommendations to the West Australian government who oversaw this destruction, who oversaw and knew very well that their processes were flawed and that they needed to have an act in play, a need to improve the act. Anyway, there's a series of recommendations there. There's a series of recommendations to all mining companies, because all mining companies' reputation is on the line here. There's still a hundred sites, important cultural heritage sites, that have sec current Section 18 approvals over them—100 sacred sites. There's many other sites, there's many other Section 18s, but 100 sites that still have them over them. And do you know what happened at Rio Tinto? When they got approval to destroy Duke and Gorge, the two rock shelters, that indicators come off the maps. So that doesn't just because you get approval to destroy them, actually the indication of them being in certain sites comes off their maps. So there's recommendations to all mining companies to undertake independent review of their agreements with traditional owners and to commit to ongoing regular review to ensure consistency with the best practice standards. In particular, companies should review full compensation, final compensation clauses and recognition that free, prior and informed consent requires continuous review and engagement with traditional owners. Um, it, all, it goes on to make a number of other recommendations. It makes recommendations to the Australian government to seek to legislate a prohibition on agreements that restrict traditional owners from publicly raising concerns about heritage protection or exercising their rights under heritage legislation. Because mining companies, and Rio Tinto is not the only one in Western Australia, has participation agreements and other agreements that have gag clauses in them that stop people exercising their rights under, for example, the, the, our Racial Discrimination Act, our environmental protection laws, our human rights laws. That is appalling, absolutely appalling. So even though the PKKP was raising objections and raising their concerns about this, they had no legal mechanism to, in fact, act, because our ACTSIP Act the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act 1984 is barely worth the paper it is written on. And Recommendation 7 says the committee recommends that the Australian government urgently, urgently review the adequacy of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act of 1984. Uh, we have recommendations also. Um, recommendation 5 is that the, the Australian government recommends the Australian government that ministerial responsibility for the administration of that act, the ATSIC Act, revert to the Minister for Indigenous, for Indigenous Australians and the National Indigenous Australian Agency before, um, 
become the administrating authority. Uh, the committee recommendation six is the committee recommends to the Australian government that the relevant minister direct their offices and department to more rigorously prosecu prosecute use of the APSIP Act in Western Australia until such time as new legislation is enacted in Western Australia replacing the current, current Aboriginal Heritage Act of 1972. I urge all senators to read this report. It has many in very important points that people need to read to see what's going on in this country. I agree with the title of this report. Never again. Never again. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Smith, this thank is you. on the same matter? Uh, yes. It is. Excellent. Yes, okay. thank Senator Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I also rise to make a brief contribution to the tabling of the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia's interim report, Never Again. I begin by acknowledging the PKKP people and the loss of such a foundational feature of their heritage due to Rio Tinto's destruction of Dugan Gorge. Their anger and grief is shared by every Australian, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. In my additional comments to this report, I've consciously focused on two critical areas. The first is the importance of continuing to hold Rio Tinto accountable for its deliberate and destructive actions. And I'm sure I speak for many, many people who believe Rio Tinto's remorse has been shallow and still shows an, an outrageously poor understanding of the consequences of their actions. And second is ensuring that, Rio, that the actions of Rio Tinto and Rio alone do not result in a significant loss of confidence in the goodwill and progress that has been made on resource development and Indigenous issues over many, many decades in my home state of Western Australia. It is necessary to remind people that WA's resource and mining industry does not just power the West Australian and national economies. It is a critical element in enabling the empowerment of Indigenous people across my home state. Rio Tinto still needs to be held accountable. The committee intends to comment further on Rio Tinto's timeline prior to the destruction of the Dugan Gorge in its final report but it's important to canvass Rio Tinto's con conduct now to hold those responsible accountable, to end the uncertainty for those involved and to enable the deep wounds this incident has caused, caused to begin healing. As far as I'm concerned, Rio Tinto, including its chairman and its board, are still on notice. They should not allow themselves to believe the investigation into their culpability has concluded. In brief, it took nearly 20 days for Rio Chief Executive Mr Jarks to make a public apology following the event. Even then, he apologised only for the distress caused, and it was not until Rio Tinto made a submission to the inquiry that acknowledged the destruction of Jigan Gorge should not have occurred. In my additional comments, I've called for Rio Tinto to review why this took so long and for those within the organisation who argued for only apologising for the distress caused to reconsider their positions within the industry. My additional comments also highlight that the actions of Rio Tinto in the days prior to the event. In their submission, the PKKP asserts PKKP do not accept Rio Tinto's position that before May 2020 it was unaware of the eth ethnographic and archaeological significance of the Jugan Gorge. Neither does PKKP accept that if Rio Tinto had known the new information contained in the further report dated the 18th of May 2020, it would not have proceeded with the blast. I agree with PKKP. The fact that they have removed seven explosives to prevent committing an offence under Section 17 of the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972, but none of the explosives that destroyed Dugan Gorge, amplifies this view, I believe. The board review was insufficient. Rio Tinto must more genuinely and independently review its actions and be honest with the PKKP and the Australian community. This is a board that employed and oversaw the contract of Mr Jacques, who created a, and I'm quoting now, a fit-in or F-off culture at Rio Tinto. 
those who supported him through this period should resign and exit the WA mining industry. The actions of Rio Tinto have tarnished the whole resource and mining industry in Western Australia and beyond. And this is the most disappointing element of the inquiry. Rio Tinto has positioned itself as a moral leader of the, issue, of the industry, including funding political campaigns to influence others. Yet when a practical test of respecting Aboriginal culture arose, it failed. Capital F failed. We can continue to hold Rio Tinto accountable and deliver regulatory certainty for WA's resource and mining industry. No one will be surprised by the combined emphasis of my additional comments in the report. Evidence to the committee indicates there is room for improvement across the industry in relation to agreement making with traditional owners. But I disagree that part of the solution is a moratorium on Section 18C approvals, which are, vital, which are a vital process to enable development in WA. In these economic times, it is wrong to create uncertainty for the resource and mining industry, the pastoral and other industries and government agencies that use the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972 to facilitate development. A full moratorium would put at risk or halt Metronet, the Perth Airport runway and countless resource and other job creating projects across the state. It is a step too far and its inclusion represents a sovereign risk, I believe. And it's important to highlight the final decision maker on Section 18 approvals is the WA Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, the Honourable Ben Wyatt MLA. I have confidence in his ability to ensure adequate consideration is given to the views of traditional owners. The WA government is already progressing key reforms to address the issues identified in the report with the replacement of the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972. It has released a draft bill that has been subject to exhaustive consultation with industry and traditional owners. I have confidence in the process to date and what this bill will achieve. Rio Tinto's conduct does not rep represent that of the entire industry. Rather than a regulatory overreach and punishing the entire industry and Indigenous peoples for Rio Tinto's failures, we should instead use this terrible event as a catalyst to improve agreement making with traditional owners. At all times, the guiding principle must be the empowerment of local communities to make their local decisions. The work of this inquiry has been important and its future contribution will be critical in restoring the trust that Rio Tinto has so willingly and knowingly destroyed. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, there's no other speakers on this issue. Um, Senator Smith, would you like to be, do you seek leave to be in continuation? I do. I would uh, seek leave to continue my remarks. Excellent. Oh, oh sorry, Senator Chisholm. Oh, so, sorry. Senator Chisholm, uh, just, just so, um, Senators are aware it is then my intention to return to the order of the reports as they are in, in the order paper. So the next report will be from Senator Veravanti Wells. Senator Chisholm, thank you. Thanks, Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, as part of this inquiry, the committee heard from the PKK people, uh, including Mr Birchall Hayes, a descendant of Jukun, who described the gorge as an anchor of culture and said, the loss of Jukun Gorge rock shelters is a loss to all First Nations people and the community within Australia and internationally. He talked about how neighbouring Indigenous groups have a direct connection with Jukun and also feel powerless and angry at this happening. The traditional owners said the incident had caused immeasurable cultural and spiritual loss and profound grief. And it was fantastic that uh, those committee members were able to go and visit the PKK people on their lands. Uh, and talk to them, uh, visit the site. And unfortunately, due to the restrictions of COVID uh, and quarantining, I wasn't able to do that myself. But I think the importance of this inquiry and the nature that it be concluded or the interim report be delivered this year, given how significant this issue was, uh, it was worth that sacrifice for people to be able to go and be uh, on location and view what had gone on. Since the inquiry began, it has received over 142 submissions and held 11 public hearings. The committee held a yarn session with the PKK people and some members were able to visit the site itself. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee for their support this, uh, on this work because it was a difficult year, particularly with the ge geography and locations that we were dealing with. Uh, it was 
such a significant issue with national interests, but also international interests, um, given the nature of the company that we, were talking, uh, we are talking about. I think the role that Rio Tinto had in the destruction uh, is obviously crucial. And the committee heard from the now former CEO, uh, Mr Jarks, and his leadership team. I think one of the more consequential evidence that we heard from Rio was that they actually had four proposals that they were looking at in regards to expansion. But they only presented one of those options to the PKK people, and that involved the destruction of the gorge. Um, what we also found out through the evidence was that that was worth $134 million extra to Rio because of the high grade of ore that would be gained from destruction of Jukun. So it was obvious from the evidence that we teased out of Rio that they were going to make more money by the destruction of the gorge and mining that area uh, than they would have if they had considered some of those other three areas that they had looked at for expansion. So there's no doubt that the decision was a financial one that would have resulted in more returns to Rio uh, and their shareholders. In the days leading up to the blast, there were clear examples of how they failed to consult with the PKK people. When Rio Tinto Heritage Team was meeting with the PKK people on the 14th of May, the Heritage Team were unaware of the plan to blast the site. On the 18th of May, the Heritage Team requested to temporarily suspend blast plans to allow further consultation with the PKKP. Yet even after this suspension at the request of the PKKP, Rio Tinto continued to load explosives into the site. On the 20th of May, when Richard Bradshaw, the lawyer for PKK people, who had planned on lodging an injunction to prevent the explosions and protect the rock shelters, contacted Cam Wyatt's office regarding the destruction, he was told to contact Minister Lay. Despite calling Minister Lay's office twice and being promised a call back, he never heard back from the minister's office. The next day, Mr Bradshaw was sent an email from a law firm representing Rio Tinto, reminding him that under the agreement, between the PKK people and Rio Tinto that there was a gag clause and that they could not speak publicly. If they did, there was a risk that they could lose payments. The failure in communication is a broader symptom of the corporate culture at Rio Tinto, and this is also shown through the delay in Rio Tinto apologising to the PKKP people. On 31 May 2020, Chris Salisbury, the Rio Tinto boss, iron ore boss in WA, apologised for the distress caused, but not for the destruction of the gorge. Similarly, Mr Jarks apologised for the distress caused, not the destruction. They have subsequently apologised and acknowledged that it shouldn't have occurred, but it speaks to the broader cultural issues that the committee recognised was more than just some unfortunate mistakes or ineptitude that Rio Tinto prioritised commercial gain over meaningful engagement with traditional owners. Uh, Rio Tinto had a number of reports and major excavation of rock shelters in 2014, both highlighting the significance of the, of the site. Uh, it was actually the fact that Ms Nevin, who was in charge of uh, relationships with traditional owners, uh, Rio's most senior executive for Indigenous relations, never visited the Jukun Gorge site and in her role only offered to meet with the PKK people after they had made a submission to the inquiry, despite being in her role for a number of years. It is worth noting that the three senior Rio executives that have lost their jobs in Mr Jarks, Mr Salisbury and Mr Nevin walk away with a payout of tens of millions of dollars, uh, whilst the PKK people are left with the destruction of the site. Over recent years, there's no doubt been a degrading of culture within Rio Tinto, especially in relation to Indigenous relations. Actions like moving Indigenous relations into the public relations team uh, and then having that based overseas rather than on the ground in Australia uh, to actually deal and build a relationship with these people. Uh, we heard evidence from Mr Cochrane, a former executive at Rio Tinto, that the Indigenous relations function used to be an integral part of Rio Tinto's operations but is now lumped in with public relations and based in Washington, D.C. It's been a source of some puzzlement to me and I still don't understand it. He went on to suggest that in the early 2000s, there was a shift that mining companies like Rio could cut costs and earn high marks for corporate social performance in questionnaires from international organisations. He said if these forms could be filled out in central office by people with little field knowledge, 
Why maintain social science specialists in the communities? And that is unfortunately what they said. Uh, we know that there was plenty of evidence that was provided by experts, by former Rio executives, to understand that they had put, degraded their relationship with Indigenous Australians. Uh, they had moved it into a function so that it was dealt with as part of the government relations, rather than actually administering and working with Indigenous Australians. Uh, the culture that Mr Jarks had put on that Senator Smith raised as well in regards to fit in or F off, there's no doubt that that played a role in executives and management uh, not being as truthful and honest uh, and dealing with these issues as good as they could have. The results from this are devastating. Uh, the report is very honest, uh, it's very confronting, uh, and it deals with substantial challenges for the mining community in WA but also for the governments of WA and the Commonwealth Government as well. Uh, it's why we've delivered an interim report to deal with the substance of WA and what went on with Rio, and that was important that that was done in a timely fashion. But I look forward to continuing the work of the committee into next year as we look at the nationwide implications, but also uh, how we can work uh, with this parliament to ensure that there's a spotlight on these issues so that the juke and gorge destruction can never happen again. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Dodson on, on the same, on same, same report. Uh, report uh, Senator Dodson, thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mr Acting President. Uh, look, as a member of the Joint uh, Standing Committee on Northern Australia, I wish to make some comments about the committee's interim report on its inquiry into the destruction of 46,000-year-old caves of human occupation. Human occupation. Uh, the Jugan Gorge in the Pilbara region of Western Australia by the Rio Tinto Mining Company. The committee was due to report on the 30th of September 2020, but COVID uh, restricted our travel into Western Australia, and the Senate on the 31st agreed to an extension to today. I want to firstly thank the committee chairman, Mr Warren Ench, for his leadership and commitment uh, to this inquiry. And it's most heartening to me that the interim report is a unanimous one. The report expresses a common concern that was held by all about the destruction of the caves at Jugan Gorge, news of which reverberated around the world. And we should take note of the fact that shareholders took a very keen interest in what had happened in this particular situation. By our concern, uh, but our concern extended beyond the Jugan Gorge, the priceless First Nation heritage is under threat right across the land, and protection they are wanting. The Joint Committee inquiry attracted more than 140 submissions, which demonstrated a widespread of community concerns at the wanton destruction of the caves of Jugan Gorge on the 21st of May this year. The most poignant testimony came from the Punta Kunti Kurama Pinakara people themselves, in both written and verbal evidence. It will suffice to quote one of those witnesses, Birchill Hayes, whose grandfather was also known as Jukun. And he said, we have an obligation to look after country in accordance with traditional law and custom. It is our duty to the old people to also look after it. It was on loan to us to pass on to future generations, our Punta Kunti Kurama Pinakara people and future generations yet to come. The disaster has now left a gaping hole in our ability to pass on our heritage to our children and grandchildren. As the committee, we were able to hear evidence like that directly, thanks to the good offices of the Premier of Western Australia, uh, Mr McGowan, and the Commonwealth, which laid on an aircraft, an Air Force aircraft, to transport us into state, and particularly into state members, given all the difficulties with COVID to go to Caratha and for us to get out to the Brockman mine site at uh, Newman. It was an invaluable opportunity because we not only were able to hear from and talk to the people so tragically affected, but also to see their country for ourselves and to witness the area of destruction. This committee had had a meeting with over a hundred of the traditional owners, a very rare kind of way in which committees work. But, and we heard from various people the hurt, the frustration and the anger 
uh, that uh, they carried as a consequence of this. This interim report identifies a catalogue of failures of the process of Rio Tinto. It much saddens me that a company which uh, not that long ago was in the industry leaders, or one of the industry leaders, in the way it dealt with First Nations peoples, became so cavalier in its pursuit of profits. And I caught the tail end of my colleague, Senator uh, um, um, on, on this point about how the company had lost this in integration of its management and its governance. But failures such as these that lead to the, the Jugan Gorge disaster do not happen out of the blue. These failures were symptomatic of the don't care culture that infected Rio Tinto from the top down. It had gone through a a, a rapid decline in the way it did business. And while we're dealing with the top, let me say it was a mistake for a board member, Mr Michael Lestrange, to do the company's review of the cultural heritage management. He was the wrong man for the job. His report is full of mayor coopers and corporate lingo, but it was an unsatisfactory piece of work. It didn't get to the heart of the, of the drift and rot that was allowed to uh, corrupt Rio Tinto's formerly good practice. It simply didn't nail the fundamental cultural shift over recent years at Rio Tinto that devalued the importance and the input of top-shelf anthropologists and physical heritage advice, as witnessed by Professor uh, Cochran and Mr Bruce Harvey, uh, who informed the inquiry. What became plain during the course of the inquiry is that the First Nations peoples are seriously disadvantaged when it comes to dealing with mining companies and government agencies. The scant resources that the First Nations can muster are far, far outweighed by those the mining company and bureaucracies bring to bear. The legislation, state and federal, has failed to protect First Nations and their heritage. The ineffectual Native Title Act has delivered nothing of substance to protect the interests of First Nations. We heard of gag clauses in contracts. We heard of peoples assigning their civil rights uh, to um, not protest about the destruction or the potential destruction of a company uh, in the uh, exercise of its rights under Section 18 of the Western Australian Act. If, many, if Eddie Marbo were with us, he would be delivered deeply distressed to realise that, they, that what he had fought for so vigorously has delivered so little. And I'm talking about the, the Future Act regime of the Native Title Act. The Environment and Heritage Protocols uh, laws around the country needs serious overhaul, and this committee will be looking at those going forward. As we stand now, even in the Northern Territory, where sacred sites legislation leads the nation, important sites at the belighted MacArthur River mine in the Gulf Country are under threat right now because the government has approved a new mine management plan without the necessary sacred sites clearance certificates having been approved. Australia's reputation and standing in the world under, is under threat because of deficient legislation and casual disregard for First Nations heritage that flow from that. We have international obligations here to take the United Nations declarations on the rights of Indigenous people seriously. And that article, Article 11 of that, says that, that speaks about the rights of Indigenous people to maintain and protect manifestations of their cultures such as archaeological and historical sites. It goes on to say, states shall provide redress which may institute restitution in conjunction with in, in Indigenous peoples if their cultural property is taken without free prior informed consent or in violation of their laws, traditions and customs. And that's a matter this report dealt with in a, in a tangential way, but the importance of free prior informed consent cannot be underestimated, particularly in the, re the review we're encouraging companies uh, to look at in the uh, existing Section 18s that they've got. Australia signed up to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but what does it really mean in practice? It just gets disregarded. So how many more Jugan Gorge catastrophes are lurking on working schedules around the country? We don't know, because there are still existing legal regimes that permit and legally uh, permit uh, various companies to destroy them. So whilst our report is called Never Again, 
It's in a, in a legislative range, uh, environment where there's still capacity for an organisation or a company uh, to destroy such sites. So we have a serious problem, and this committee's got some serious work to do going forward into the new year on the relative uh, comparative basis of the legal framework. Um, it's so sad that uh, things went wrong, badly wrong for Rio uh, at Brockman 4. Uh, but it's also sad that this is not an isolated incident. And uh, it's not just confined to this company's operations. So, uh, Madam Acting President, there is a lot for us to consume and there is hard work ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dodson. Um, Senator, Dons, uh, Senator Dodson, um, did you want to be in continuation? Yes, thank you. You seek leave to continue your remarks. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Madam Acting Thank you very much. Senator Fairavanti Wells. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present Delegated Legislation Monitor 14 of 2020 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. I rise to speak to the tabling of the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee's Delegated Legislation Monitor 14 of 2020. I would like to take this opportunity to highlight some of the key issues arising in the monitor. In particular, I draw the Chamber's attention to the Committee's concluding comments regarding two legislative instruments which raise significant technical scrutiny issues. The first instrument is the Australian Postal Corporation Performance Standards Amendment 2020 Measures No. 1 Regulations 2020. This instrument implements several temporary changes to performance standards for the delivery of letters and temporarily exempts Australia Post from its retail outlet obligations. The changes aim to respond to the challenges faced by Australia Post during the COVID-19 pandemic. The changes made by the instrument appear to have the potential to affect a broad range of people and entities. These include users of Australia Post services and Australia Post employees. Despite, the, despite this, the explanatory statement to the instrument states that only Australia Post itself was consulted in the development of the instrument. Given the significance of the measures and the broad scope of people and entities likely to be affected by them, the committee asked the minister to provide it with updates on the progress of future consultation. The committee also gave a notice of motion to disallow the instrument on 6 October 2020 with a view to reconsidering the notice once the committee was satisfied that appropriate consultation had been undertaken. I'm pleased to inform the chamber that the minister has since advised the committee Considering all the correspondence that we had to uh, that we exchanged in, that finally public consultation has commenced with a wide, ra wide range of stakeholders and consumers. The minister has also undertaken to advise the committee of the outcomes of the ongoing review of the temporary arrangements. Now, on the basis of the minister's advice and undertaking, we ha the committee has resolved to conclude its examination of the instrument and withdraw the notice of motion to disallow the instrument. Now, the second instrument I would like to highlight is the Fair Work Amendment Variation of Enterprise Agreements No. 2 Regulations 2020. This instrument repeals changes that were made to reduce the access period for a proposed variation of an enterprise agreement from seven days to one day. The committee has been corresponding with the Attorney General since August this year to resolve its technical scrutiny concerns. In summary, the committee was concerned that the explanatory statement to the instrument breached section 15 of the Legislation Act 2003. That section requires the explanatory statement to a legislative instrument to describe the consultation undertaken in relation to the instrument or explain why no consultation was undertaken. The committee placed a notice of motion to disallow the instrument on 10 November 2020 to provide it with sufficient time to consider the Attorney General's advice before the disallowance period expired. The committee subsequently determined that the Attorney General's advice did not resolve its technical scrutiny concerns. Consequently, uh, we drew the instrument to the attention of the Senate in our Monitor 12 of 2020 and resolved to keep the notice of motion to disallow in place to provide the Senate with further time to consider the matter. Since that time, I am pleased to inform the Senate that the Attorney-General has amended um, uh, the uh, explanatory statement to the instrument to ensure its compliance. 
In light of the attorney's implemented undertaking, the committee has resolved to withdraw the notice of motion to disallow the instrument and conclude our examination. Can I thank um, both ministers for their constructive engagement with the committee to resolve these issues? Now, more generally, I take this opportunity to encourage agencies and ministers to make every effort to resolve the committee's scrutiny concerns as quickly as possible. The committee is increasingly having to engage in protect protracted correspondence with department and ministers to identify and resolve technical scrutiny issues. Now, I want to bring one to the notice of the Senate. For example, 11 pieces of correspondence were recently exchanged between the committee, department and minister in the committee's efforts to resolve its scrutiny concerns relating to the availability of independent merits review under the Continents AIDS Payment Scheme 2020. In some inst instances, including this one, the committee has had to lodge protective notices of motion to disallow instruments to give it sufficient time to resolve uh, our concerns. Now, we are very concerned about the number and age of outstanding undertakings that have been given by agencies and ministers to address security con scrutiny concerns. Our Monitor 14 of 2020 lists 20 undertakings which have yet to be implemented. Six of these are more than six months uh, old. Where the committee concludes its examination of an instrument on the basis of an undertaking given by an agency or a minister, we expect and the Senate expects that those undertakings will be implemented without delay. Now, we look forward to continuing to work constructively with agencies and ministers in 2021 to ensure that the lawmaking powers delegated to the executive are exercised appropriately in accordance with the principles prescribed by the parliament. Immediate um, finally, and can I say, we amended the orders of this Senate to ensure appropriate scrutiny. And I would remind the Senate that um, approximately half of Commonwealth legislation is by way of delegated legislation. And regrettably, the trend seems to be that about 20 per cent or so of that delegated legislation is not subject to scrutiny by the parliament. Finally, I wish to draw the Senate's attention to the relevance of the committee's recent interim report on parliamentary oversight of delegated legislation made in times of emergency to the National Emergency Declaration Bill 2020, which was introduced in the other place last week. Many of the features of the National De Emergency Declaration Bill are similar to the delegated legislation making powers in the Biosecurity Act 2015. In its report, the committee details its serious concerns about the lack of parliamentary oversight of the delegated legislation making powers in the Biosecurity Act and makes a number of recommendations to address these concerns. I would urge senators to heed the recommendations of the committee's report and the comments of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee about the bill in its forthcoming Scrutiny Digest as they consider the terms of the National Emergency Declaration Bill 2020. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation monitor 14 of 2020 to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Fioravanti Wells. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the Human Rights Scrutiny Report Order, number 15 of 2020. Senator Henderson, apologies, I should have put the question on. Um, Senator Fairavanti Wells's report. The question is that the Senate take note. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the Human Rights Scrutiny Report No. 15 of 2020 of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. I move that the Senate take note of the report. I am pleased to table the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights' 15th Scrutiny Report of 2020. This report contains a technical examination of legislation with Australia's obligations under international human rights law. I also wish to speak to the Committee's 13th and 14th Scrutiny Reports of 2020, which were presented out of session on the 13th and 26th of November. 
Together, these three reports set out the committee's consideration of 48 new bills introduced into the parliament between October and 3 December 2020 and 324 legislative instruments registered on the Federal Register of Legislation between 21 September and 1 December 2020. In these reports, the committee has made substantive comments with respect to 24 bills and legislative instruments, including legislation previously commented on. For example, in this 15th report, the committee is seeking further information in relation to the Federal Court and Federal Circuit Court Amendment Fees Regulations 2020. This legislative instrument increases the application fee for migration litigants in the Federal Circuit Court from $690 to $3,300. While significantly the instrument also provides for the ability to seek full or partial waiver of this fee in cases of financial hardship, in order to form a concluded view on this matter, the committee seeks further information to assess what implications this may have in relation to the, rights, to the right to access to justice. In these reports, the committee has also considered the Native Title Amendment Infrastructure and Public Facilities Bill 2020, which has now passed. This bill amends the Native Title Act 1993 to extend the operation of the future acts regime for another 10 years. This regime permits the construction of public housing and other infrastructure on Indigenous held land. The future acts regime is an important measure which facilitates the timely provision of critical public housing and other public infrastructure for Indigenous communities when agreement cannot be reached with native title holders. As such, the committee considers this bill promotes the rights to an adequate standard of living, education and health. In addition, the committee considers that the amendments may also limit a number of other human rights, including the rights to self-determination, culture and equality and non-discrimination. The committee notes that these rights may be subject to permissible limitations if they are shown to be reasonable, necessary and proportionate. In this regard, the committee notes in particular that the consultation process provided for in the future acts regime appears to lack several constituent elements of free, prior and informed consent for the purposes of international human rights law. As such, the committee makes several recommendations to assist with the proportionality of the measure including requiring a consultation process which is guided by the principles contained in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the development of guidelines to inform decision makers working in this area. Lastly, I note that in Report 13 of 2020, the committee concluded its consideration of the Counter-Terrorism Legislation Amendment High Risk Terrorist Offenders Bill 2020. This bill seeks to establish an extended supervision order scheme for high-risk terrorist offenders who have completed their custodial sentence. It would enable a court to impose any conditions on a person which it was satisfied on the balance of probabilities were reasonably necessary, appropriate and adapted for the purposes of protecting the community from the unacceptable risk of a person committing a terrorism offence. The committee considers that such a scheme may protect the public from harmful acts and so promote the life, the right to life and security of the person. In the context of high-risk terrorist offenders, the committee recognises that the government has a critically important role to play in protecting the community from the catastrophic harm which could be caused by a large-scale terrorist attack in Australia. The committee also notes that given the breadth of potential conditions which could be imposed under extended supervision, supervision order, it also engages a number of other human rights. The committee notes that most human rights may be permissibly limited. The committee's report sets out a detailed analysis of the international human rights law implications of this bill and while acknowledging the need to, to adequately protect the community, draws these concerns to the attention of the parliament. In closing, I note that the report I table today is the 15th and final scrutiny report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights for 2020. I'm very proud of the way in which this committee has continued its scrutiny work throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, 
including by regularly meeting remotely via teleconference and continuing to scrutinise the many legislative measures which have been introduced to address this unprecedented health crisis. I wish to thank my fellow committee members for their hard work over this period, particularly my deputy chair, Mr Perrett, together with Senators Dodson, Green, McLaughlin and Thorpe, and House members Mr Georgianis, Mr Goodenough, Ms Hammond and Dr Webster, as well as our former members, Senators Chandler and McKim. I also wish to thank our external legal adviser, Associate Professor Jackie Mowbray, and our committee secretary, Anita Coles, and all of the Secretariat for their hard work during this very difficult year. As always, I encourage all parliamentarians to carefully consider the committee's analysis and with these comments, I commend these reports to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Thorpe, do you wish to speak on this report? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to speak on the tabling of the Human Rights Scrutiny Report number 15 of the Parliamentary Joint Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. I have some short remarks on the report, particularly the committee's decision to provide no comment on the human rights compatibility of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation Amendment Bill 2020. I understand very well that the committee does not consider issues of public policy only on the black letter law. As a human rights campaigner my whole life, I am very proud to sit on this committee. It's time that this parliament has an honest conversation about centering human rights in everything we do. Personally, I believe that climate change is a human rights issue. I want to repeat that. I understand that the committee considers only the black letter human rights law and not social policy, but it's time that changed. Climate change is a human rights issue, and I thank the Environmental Defenders Office for their staunch defence on human rights in the courts, in the community and to this committee. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights has said, and I quote, climate change is a reality that now affects every region of the world. Storms are rising and tides could submerge entire island nations and coastal cities. Fires rage through our forests and the ice is melting. We are burning up our future, literally." End quote. Torres Strait Islander mob are some of the first in the world being impacted by climate change. Their rights to health, culture and life itself is being damaged by climate change. Proud Torres Strait Islander man Yessi Mosby has told the ABC that he scours the beach for the remains of his great-grandmother after huge tides flooded graves on Massig Island. He said, and I quote, "'My fear is that her skull has been squashed, smashed by the driftwood. Our way of living our culture, our tradition has been violated." End quote. How is this not a critical human rights issue? How does climate change and this government's inaction not contravene the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the UNDRIP? This committee needs to be able to consider issues, issues this to hear the voices of grassroots mob as well as advocacy organisations like the Environment Def Defender's Office. The Human Rights Committee is too important for the work of this parliament to become a rubber stamp machine. The committee should be able to consider matters of public policy and it must be able to consider the UNDRIP, not as a footnote but as a central part of its work. The UNDRIP is the most comprehensive international instrument on the rights of Indigenous peoples. It establishes a un universal framework of minimum standards for the survival, dignity and well-being of the Indigenous peoples of the world. I call on the government to do the right thing and modify the Human Rights Parliamentary Scrutiny Act 2011. 
so that the committee can properly consider UNDRIP and also properly consider urgent matters of public policies like climate change. We need to give the committee the powers it needs to properly do its work. I once again want to re reiterate my thanks to the committee secretariat for their fantastic work and also the chairperson. I also thank my colleagues Senator Dodson and Mr Perrett, the member of Morton, for their work on the committee, for their work. Let's do the right thing. Let's centre human rights into everything we do, particularly in the middle of a climate emergency. Our survival depends on it. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Oh, apologies, oh. Senator Gallagher. Um, uh, the question is that the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the first interim report of the Select Co Committee on COVID-19, together with the Hansard record of proceedings, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Um, in just the few minutes that are available uh, to me this evening, um, I'm pleased to be able to. I'd seek leave to. What do I need to seek leave for? Nothing. Oh, okay. Sorry. I am. Um, the Senate established this committee on the 8th of April to examine the government's health and economic response to the pandemic. With limited parliamentary sittings during the early stages of the crisis, the committee has been central to the democratic oversight of decisions with a profound impact on people's safety, welfare and economic survival. We have had 37 public hearings, accepted 463 written submissions and gathered hundreds of hours of evidence. Firstly, can I thank uh, everyone who's made sacrifices to help their fellow Australians in a time of need, especially our health workforce, public servants and others who've worked together to keep us safe and keep services running. Thank you to the many organisations, private individuals and public servants who appeared before the committee and made submissions. Thank you also to my fellow committee members and the committee secretariat for their efforts to date. In 2020, Australians came together and showed remarkable courage, patience and collective spirit. The fact that we avoided the terrible scenarios now playing out in some other countries is the result of this hard work. But we can't afford to be complacent. Despite faring better than many countries, we should remember that almost 28,000 Australians have contracted COVID-19 and 908 Australians have died. Three quarters of all of these deaths have been in aged care facilities. Around, around 39,000 Australians remain stranded overseas and 8,000 of them are classified as vulnerable people. And the economic impact of the pandemic has been severe, with 2.4 million people out of work or working less hours than they need, with unemployment forecasts to remain above pre-pandemic levels for the next three years. For millions of Australians, 2020 has been the most difficult of years, and we should not underestimate the ongoing challenges that many of these Australians face and will continue to face as we recover from the pandemic. This is the interim, an interim report of the committee. As chair, I felt it was important that we report to the Senate at the end of this year. The report makes six recommendations and 24 interim findings. This report does find deficiencies in the government's preparation and early response to the pandemic. On the health response, the short summary is thank goodness for the states. It was the states who took the big, brave decisions at the right time and forced the hand of a federal government who was resisting pressure to take stronger action. Five areas stand out as the most significant shortcomings in the government's health response to date. The first and most serious of these is the aged care crisis. Um, 685 residents in aged care facilities funded and regulated by the Morrison government died from COVID-19, accounting for 75.4 per cent of all COVID-19 deaths in Australia. The federal government didn't have a plan to protect aged care residents. They ignored the Royal Commission's warnings in, 20, in October 2019 in its report titled Neglect. They were too slow to act and then, when disaster struck, tried to avoid accepting responsibility for keeping people safe. Their big announcement, the Victorian Aged Care, Christ, uh, Aged care Response Centre, didn't open until 25 July, after 294 cases of COVID-19 and 26 deaths in the Victorian residential aged care facilities. 
Secondly, the Ruby Princess, a mismanaged disembarkment of a ship which caused the biggest outbreak in Australia back in March. 663 passengers on the Ruby Princess ended up with COVID-19. The government's failure to observe its human quarantine responsibilities despite public commitments that it was in charge allowed these passengers to disembark, spreading the virus right across the country. The third is the Prime Minister's failure to provide national leadership when, it needed it, when we needed it the most. In March, as COVID-19 case numbers continued to grow, the Prime Minister downplayed the need for stricter social distancing restrictions, undermined decisions by the states and territories to close schools and made political attacks on Labor premiers over state borders. Without the strong adv advocacy displayed by state premiers for bolder measures, particularly by New South Wales and Victoria, Australians' experience with the pandemic could have been very different. Fourth, the government's expensive and ineffective COVID Safe app. In April, the Prime Minister said it would be like sunscreen and help us reopen. Yet he failed to deliver on this announcement, with the app suffering performance issues and identifying just 17 unique contacts. And now it's headed for a revamp. I wonder how much that will cost. Fifth, the failure to put in a paid pandemic leave scheme in place when it was needed the most. With millions of Australians not having access to paid sick leave, there was always a big risk that people would go to work sick in order to pay the bills. Low-paid, casualised essential workers were identified as, as being high risk of spreading the virus due to the lack of paid sick leave very early in the pandemic. The ACTU raised this on the 11th of March, but this government didn't act for five months and not before the Victorian aged care outbreak was well established. It remains unclear as to why the government did nothing to address this huge transmission risk until 3 August, by which point we had already recorded over 18,000 cases, other than it didn't want to act and protect these workers. On the government's economic response, the short summary is that they left too many people behind. They argued against a wage subsidy scheme, when, and when they did agree with one, they excluded over a million casuals from JobKeeper. They plundered the retirement savings of people hardest hit by the pandemic through the poorly designed early access super scheme, which for months into this pandemic was the largest source of stimulus across the economy. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Senator Gallagher. It is 6.55, but just on indulgence of the Senate, I do have one more committee report on my list under the opposition whip's name. Do you you wish to move it now and continue remarks, or if it's the NDIS one, that is indeed what it I is. I don't have a copy of the report, but I am prepared to move that the report be tabled. Thank you. The question is that the report be tabled. All those against say aye. Uh, in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Colbeck. I table documents responding to two orders for the production of documents concerning the PFAS task force and foreign shipping. Uh, Senator Roberts. I, I uh, move that the Senate take note of the documents and I thank the minister for the documents and seek leave to make a short statement. Is you, Senator Roberts, you don't need leave okay. to make Thank a short you. statement. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I was told in meetings with Defence last year that the PFAS task force was working on the problem of PFAS contamination by applying a whole-of-government response. So I asked for the minutes of their meetings to see what a whole-of-government response looked like. I was refused. I did a document discovery. Still no minutes arrived. This third attempt has succeeded. It should not have been this hard to get hold of a simple set of minutes. Having read them, I do understand why they had to be prized away from the task force. The Morrison government's PFAS response is all talk. It is a process that has no destination and, as a result, is achieving nothing. It seems to be aiming to stall and to avert. The last concrete action by this government was in 2018 to award $55 million for a drinking water program for affected areas and $73 million for research into PFAS. There are now over 900 PFAS sites around Australia. 
The government is remediating four defence sites, bases at Williamtown, Oakey, Edinburgh and Catherine. Four down, 896 to go. While the PFAS task force is sitting around holding meetings and reissuing old guidances, the residents of the red zones continue to live with the nightmare every day. Residents are trapped in homes that are unsaleable. One resident that I've spoken with many times and visited his house on a number of occasions, David Jeffress and his wife Diane Priddle from Oakey in Queensland, purchased their property in 20, 20, 2004 for a combined $2.4 million investment. At that time, the Defence Department knew his land was affected by PFAS, and yet they kept quiet. Once the contamination was made public, the property became unsaleable. Dave and Diane's successful cattle breeding and grazing business had to close because nobody wants to buy contaminated cattle or genetics. They have a stud property, a very clean, tidy operation. Dave and Diane's property and business was recently valued by a register, registered valuer at just $400,000, a $2 million loss through no fault of their own. It's an outrage that the Morrison government is allowing these residents to remain trapped in red zones while the PFAS task force drifts around from meeting room to meeting room in search of direction. While a recent class action lawsuit was settled, Dave and Diane received just $120,000 compensation, and he hasn't got the money yet. The government's own PFAS subcommittee has made the same recommendation in the last two update reports which called for remediation, compensation and like-for-like -like relocation. That's fair. I hope the third head of that subcommittee in just two years, Senator McCarthy, has more success in getting their recommendations implemented. The way forward now must be to remove residents out of the contaminated red zones, install remediation units and treat the groundwater before these toxic plumes spread further and ruin yet more lives. Now, last year, I asked the then Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie, if it was safe for producers like David and Diane to send their cattle to auction. And Senator Mackenzie replied, quote, there is no reason why farmers cannot send their produce to market. End of quote. Well, let's, let's examine that statement. Food Standards Australia specify a safe level for PFAS exposure of 20 nanograms of PFAS for PFAS and 160 nanograms for PFA, PFOA, PFOA. These can be present together for a total PFAS level of 180 nanograms per kilo of body weight. On the 19th of September 2020, the European Food Safety Authority set a new safety threshold for PFAS contamination. The limit, which now applies across the EU, is just 4.5. 4 nanograms per kilogram of body weight per week, a fraction of what Australia allows. The European body considered the decreased response of the immune system to vaccination to be the most critical human health effect of PFAS exposure. So I ask, has the PFAS task force, task force considered that the Morrison government is about to introduce a vaccine for COVID? that might be put at risk through our tolerating PFAS levels that are 40 times higher than the new European safety standard. Cattle in the red zone from RAAF Base Richmond have been tested at over 1,000 nanograms per kilo. Newborn calves, newborn calves are testing at over 300 nanograms. This is the product that former Minister Mackenzie says is safe to sell and consume. It is not safe to sell. By sending contaminated products to the EU, we're risking food and livestock exports of $2 billion a year. This is not just affecting Oki. This is affecting the whole beef industry. The Morrison government can find billions to give to its big business mates for corporate welfare in the name of COVID, but it can't find a lesser amount, a much, much lesser amount, to fund a like-for-like -like relocation and compensation scheme for everyday Australians caught up in the nightmare of the government's making, despite the committee recommending it do so. It's time for the, President, for the Prime Minister sorry, to fix this problem, and I seek leave to continue my remarks.
Thank you, Senator Roberts. The question is. Um, Is leave granted to continue his remarks? Yes, leave is granted. Thank you. Um, the question, Minister, do you want to respond? Or the question is that the Senate take note of the ministerial statement. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, uh, Deputy, Acting Deputy President. I present the government's response to the report of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee on its inquiry into the provisions of the primary industry's custom, customs charges amendment dairy cattle export charge bill 2020 and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansa. Uh, Senator Brockman. Oh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Brockman. So do I need to seek leave to speak at this point? Uh, I don't believe you. Oh. Thank you, Senator Brockman. We will then move to committee memberships. Thank you, Clark. The President has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of committees. I call the Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> leave is granted. I move that members that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out on, in the document available in the chamber and listed in the dynamic red. The, I put the question. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. The Aged Care Amendment, Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020, the Corporations Amendment, Corporate Insolvency Reforms Bill 2020, the Export Market Development Grants Legislation Amendment Bill 2020, the Health Insurance Amendment, Compliance Administration Bill 2020, Immigration Education Amendment, Expanding Access to English Tuition Bill 2020, Treasury Laws Amendment 2020, Measures No. 5, Bill 2020, and Treasury Laws Amendment 2020, Measures No. 6, Bill 2020. I call the Minister. I move that these bills uh, may now may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. I put the question as moved by the minister. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Aged Care Amendment, Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020, Corporations Amendment, Corporate Insolvency Reforms Bill 2020, Export Mark Development Grants Legislation Amendment Bill 2020, Health Insurance Amendment, Compliance Administration Bill 2020, Immigration Education Amendment, Expanding Access to English Tuition Bill 2020, Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 5 Bill 2020, Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 6 Bill 2020. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Aged Care Amendment, Aged Care Recipient Classification Bill 2020, and move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. I will put the motion as moved by, by the minister. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you, Clark. Uh, the President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence, Territories Legislation Amendment Bill 2020 and Bankruptcy Estate, Ch Estate Charges Amendment, Norfolk Island Bill 2020. I call the Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. I put the question as moved by the Minister. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to territories and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Bankruptcy Estate Charges Act 1997 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. 
Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move for that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the, I, um, the question, as moved by the minister, all the, the question is that the motion moved by the minister. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence Financial Sector Reform, Hain Royal Commission Response Bill 2020, and Corporations Fees Amendment, Hain Royal Commission Response Bill 2020. I call the Minister. I move that these bills be may, may proceed with that formalities, may be taken together, and be now read a first time. The question is in agreement to the motion moved by the Minister. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the law in relation to the financial sector and for related purposes, and a bill for an act to amend the Corporation Fees Act 2001 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the question is that debate be adjourned. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you, Clark. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020. Thank you. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Foreign Investment Reform Protecting Australia's National Security Bill 2020. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Mr Conaghan in, in place of Mrs Wicks to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. The President has received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to three laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. I will call the clerk to call on business. Business of the Senate notice of motion number two in the name of Senator Rice, a disallowance of an instrument. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, I move the motion. Um, this motion is to disallow a $40 million fund, the Forestry Recovery Development Fund program, that would continue to prop up damaging and devastating native forest logging. So let's be clear why I am moving today to disallow this fund. It is about protecting our native forests after they have suffered a devastating bushfire season. The Greens, of course, want to see funding for bushfire recovery, both for our communities and for our forests that were devastated by last summer's fires, and these fires which were turbocharged by our climate crisis. These fires devastated 20 per cent of our mainland forests, the greatest proportion of forests of any continent killed by fire that has been known worldwide. But we should not be funding so-called bushfire recovery that in involves clear felling our precious forests and continuing to kill our precious wildlife, destroying their habitat, habitat just at the time when they need to be nurtured, carefully managed back to health as they recover from these massive, intense fires. And I also want to be clear that our reason for disallowing, moving to disallow this fund tonight is that it doesn't differentiate between native forest logging and plantation forestry. I mean, if only the government and the Labor Party would see that there's a difference between native forest logging and plantation forestry, then we would be well on the way to the forest wars that have been raging for decades as being over. We wouldn't be having debates like this today. I mean, if the government and the Labor Party came to terms with the reality that we're now in a situation where almost 90 per cent of the wood products that are being produced in Australia come from plantations, the vast majority of the jobs in the timber industry rely on timber from plantations, and that plantations that are established appropriately and sustainably on already cleared land are supported across 
this parliament. In contrast, what is also known, what is so clear in the science and now in legal decisions, is that native forest logging devastates our precious forests. It kills animals. It destroys carbon stores. It smashes up soils. It has massive impacts on water quality and quantity. And it loses money. It needs government subsidies to continue. Like whaling, native forest logging has had its day, and we need to stop logging our native forests as soon as possible and support the relatively few workers that are still employed in native forest logging to shift to other work, particularly the prospects of plantation forestry. Yet this Forestry Recovery Development Fund would provide $40 million for forestry operations without differentiating between devastating native forest logging and the plantation industry. And this is on top of a $15 million fund that would subsidise the transport of logs that have been logged after fire has raged through. So-called salvage logging, or actually looting logging, is a much better term for this. And then there's an extra $10 million for a salvage log storage fund, again subsidising the looting Order. of logging after fire. And I repeat, we don't know how much of this $65 million will be spent subsidising destructive native forest logging compared with a contribution to plantations. The guidelines for this fund do not differentiate between the two. What we do know is that there is $40 million that the guideline says will assist privately owned wood processing facilities to recover and rebuild using innovation and product diversification. However, that includes to develop new wood products or secure capacity to deliver existing products secure capacity to, de to deliver existing products that are intended to be sold mainly or solely into interstate or international markets. In other words, $40 million, which can be used to help the wood products industries to keep on doing what they are currently doing, Order. continuing to log and wood chip our precious native forests and send off those wood chips to China and Japan. This is securing capacity to deliver existing products into in market. I mean, I would like to believe, and Senator Dunningham, I hear your interjections, and I'd like to believe that it won't be that, that if we are investing taxpayers' money after the fires, that it would be spent on developments that meet the triple bottom line of being good socially, good for jobs in the community, good economically in supporting regional economic development, and good environmentally, i.e. in the wood product sector, supporting the development of new and innovative plantation-based products that would be helping the transition out of native forests and into plantations and help end the forestry wars so we don't have to have yelling across this chamber. But I say again, this fund does not differentiate between native forest logging and plantation forestry. This fund will be subsidising the clear fell logging of our precious forests in Gippsland and in southeast New South Wales, logging that is already being subsidised to the hilt by state and federal governments, logging that is destroying the wildlife habitat of koalas and of critically endangered species like swift parrots, leadbeater's possums and, um, and, and, and other endangered animals and birds. And it will be subsidising this logging at a time when our forests and our wildlife have suffered so much in last summer's fires, when we had three billion animals killed across the country. I mean, I do want to emphasise what type of logging this $40 million will be facilitating. I mean, just yesterday we saw reporting about concerns raised by the environment regulator in Victoria about logging after last summer's fires. And I'd like to read key sections of that reporting, where we had an initial letter from the conservation regulator in January suggesting logging should be modified in response to the changed conditions for vulnerable and threatened species across the state. And then a follow-up in February said the scale of the damage meant it was justified to stop 
commercial logging until there was more information that reduced scientific uncertainty about the risk of permanent damage. And the conservation regulator, the State Government Conservation Regulator report released under FOI laws said the fires had created uncertainty over whether the existing code requirements and management were enough to maintain biological diversity within the state's forests. And that's on top of what we know about the damage caused by logging forests that have been burnt by fires. I mean, a series of studies has examined the ecological impacts of post-fire salvage logging in wet forests. The Australian Academy of Science summarises the impacts of logging of, uh, of burnt forests, saying that it has long-term impacts on key soil nutrients and soil structure. It significantly reduces the abundance of large old trees, which are key attributes of forests critical to the, the survival of numerous species. It impairs forest recovery following bushfires. It alters plant communities, including through a significant reduction in populations of important re-sprouting taxa, such as tree ferns. It significantly reduces bird species riches. It can have pronounced richness. It can have pronounced effects on the condition of aquatic ecosystems, and it promotes short-term fire risks. This is the Australian Academy of Science saying this is what so-called salvage, i.e., looting logging, does. And of course, all of this comes on top of the momentous court decision in Victoria last, the, earlier this year, where the federal court found that logging damages or destroys habitat critical to the, to the survival of the critically endangered leadbeater's possum and the threatened greater gliders, and they awarded costs against thick forests, i.e. that logging is illegal. And these findings go to the heart of the issue here, because this funding will be subsidising ongoing devastating logging that is recognised as being destructive and that has been found to be illegal by the federal court, by the government conservation regulator. Destructive logging has been found to be so by scientists who have put decades of research into these forests. It is considered to be destructive by First Nations peoples, considered to be destructive by communities who are living, seeing their precious forests being de devastated and putting their bodies on the line to protection. Brave individual community groups like Order, Environment East Senator Gippsland. Rice, the time for this debate has expired. Okay. Uh, Senator Brockman. On behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Legislation uh, Senator Brockman, are you seeking leave? I'm seeking leave. leave to table a report. Is leave granted? On behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee, I present the report of the Committee on the Intelligence and Security Legislation Amendment Implementing Independent Intelligence Review Bill 2020, together with the Hansard Record of Proceedings and Documents presented to the Committee. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Um, I'll put the question, all those in there was no question, actually, so I won't put the question. I will instead call the clerk and we'll move to government business. Government business, order of the day number one, Social Security Administration Amendment, continuation of cashless welfare bill 2020. Debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator Dodson. Thank you, Clark. Uh, Senator Billick, you are in continuation. Thank you very much. And before I was uh, interrupted, I was discussing how many uh, uh, some of the examples of how there's a complete lack of evidence that this card creates positive change for the people who will be subjected to it. So in their submission to the Senate inquiry on another government bill related to the cashless debit card, the Arnhem Land Progress Aboriginal Corporation wrote, and I quote, the ALPA Board of Directors are disappointed that the government is moving forward and expanding this oppressive policy when there is no evidence demonstrating that it creates positive change for the people who will be subjected to it. This erosion of people's choice and control over their own lives destroys any sense of self-agency. It is an attack on their basic rights. These are people who have no history. Oh, sorry, there are people who have no history of addiction who get no benefit from the card, and yet they end up losing their financial autonomy or suffering the stigma of having to take the card out to pay for things. Jocelyn, a disability pension recipient in Sejuna, wrote in an online article about this stigma and lack of autonomy, and I quote: "Imagine going out for a coffee with friends and having to use the card. Imagine buying the local paper." and having to use the card. Imagine not having cash for something you really love on the local buy-sell exchange. 
Imagine trying to sell some items to get cash to survive. Imagine every time you pull the card out that you are labelled as a loser. Imagine pulling out the card that doesn't always work. Even if you have a dollar balance on the card, it refuses you at the checkout with people waiting behind you in the queue at the local supermarket. Imagine going to the chemist and the card will not work for your prescriptions. All of this happened to me and others many times. So I ask those on the other side, how would you like to live like that? How would you like to live like that? I actually challenge any of you to live like that for a month and then come in and say you think that it's all right to do so. Just because some people in your community have addictions to drugs and alcohol, then if somebody in your suburb has an addiction to drug and alcohol, maybe you should have to be on the card. I don't think you'd like it. Another story reported in an article in September last year in the Sydney Morning Herald involved a single mother of four who wasn't able to send one of her children on a school camp because she had restricted access to cash. The same mother couldn't buy second-hand textbooks for university and had to abandon her nursing placement because she was unable to buy a stethoscope online with her card. Now, let me be clear. Labor is not opposed entirely to income management, but we know that the approach works best when it's targeted and when it's voluntary. An evaluation of income management in the Northern Territory found that compulsory income management does not work, but the voluntary income management might. For example, in Cape York, the local community is applying income management based on individual circumstances. In contrast to the approach in this bill, the government themselves wrote in favour of voluntary income management in a document presented to the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And the document said, there are more positive results associated with people who volunteer as they have made a choice to change their behaviour and receive assistance. Positive findings have been found for people who have been referred for income management by a social worker or a child protection officer. Two thirds of the people who will be forced onto the cashless debit card, that is 23,000 out of 34,000, are First Nations people. As the Aboriginal Peak Organisation of the Northern Territory pointed out in their submission to the inquiry, income management cannot provide a transition to employment in locations where few employment opportunities exist and those that exist are largely done by outsiders. Instead, for many Aboriginal residents of the NT, particularly those living remotely, compulsory income management is long-term and regardless of a person's lifestyle and financial management capacity, almost impossible to get off. An evaluation conducted by the Social Policy Research Centre found that, and I quote, 90.2 per cent of those on income management in the Northern Territory were Indigenous, and 76.8 per cent of those were on compulsory income management. More than 60 per cent of this group were on income management for more than six years. Of those Indigenous people on compulsory income management, a mere 4.9 per cent gained an exemption, compared to 36.3 per cent of non-Indigenous people. Madam Acting Deputy President, this bill is an absolute insult to First Nations Australians. It's discriminatory and it's judgmental. And yesterday I heard in the chamber from Senator Hanson, and I quote, we talk in this chamber about the sexual abuse of children. That comes from people who are inebriated. It may be alcohol, it may be drugs. Well, I really want to point out to Senator Hanson that the sexual abuse of children is perpetrated by people from all walks of life, and they certainly don't have to be inebriated or on drugs. And I feel that this comment was gratuitous and plainly wrong. Sadly, child sexual abuse is conducted by people from all walks of life judges, doctors, school teachers and even politicians. So don't try and paint one group of people as responsible. The view that many people on a welfare payment are on drugs and alcohol or have a gambling addiction is also highly ignorant. I will leave the final word on the problems with the cashless debit card to a member in the other place who, in her second reading speech on this bill, outlined many of the same concerns as I have. The member said, and I quote, 
The cashless debit card program is a punitive measure enacted on the presumption all welfare recipients within the trial areas are incapable of managing their finances and require the government's assistance. She went on to say, it's somewhat ironic to me that you can essentially have an income management assessment trial for half a decade that can't show conclusive results, and yet there are a number of evidence-based programs that cost far less and that have demonstra demonstrably worked. Now, this contribution was for the Liberal member for Bass, Mrs Archer. Could there be any greater indication that this is a bad bill than it being opposed by one of the government's own members? Unfortunately, Mrs Archer didn't have the courage of her convictions and she failed to vote against the bill, a vote which would have seen it defeated. Shame on her. Despite the overwhelming evidence against compulsory income management, there are government members and senators who have publicly advocated for a national rollout. We know that this is the government's ultimate plan and this bill is just the beginning. This has caused a number of welfare recipients to worry about whether they will be placed on compulsory income management. People who have no history of drugs, alcohol or gambling addiction and no need for any intervention in how they spend their money. In her second reading contribution, Ms Archer spoke about the anxiety that pensioners in northern Tasmania express about having their income managed. This bill is a prime example of this government rejecting evidence-based policy in favour of an ideological bent. It will not address Indigenous disadvantage and it will not help close the gap. Instead of empowering communities, it rejects the government's stated partnership approach in favour of punitive and counterproductive measures. All it will do is perpetuate distress, anxiety and stigma for those subject to compulsory income management. I urge the crossbench in particular to reject this bill and I urge the Senate to reject Your time this bill. Senator, Billick, Senator Polly. Thank you. I rise to speak on Social Security Administration Amendment Continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020. The primary purpose of this bill is to transition income management and participants in the Northern Territory and Cape York region onto the cashless debit card, the CDC, and to allow the CDC to continue as a permanent measure in existing trial sites of Sojourna, East Kimberley, the Goldfields, Bundaberg and Harvey Bay. Labor will not be supporting this bill, and it is incredibly disappointing that the government is ignoring evidence to pursue this discriminatory policy. I want to associate myself with the contributions in this debate from Senators Dotson and McCarthy. This is a racist bill. 68 per cent of those who are impacted by it are First Nation people, and it is a prime example of policy being done to First Nations people and not with them. They are disproportionately affected, and now the government is pushing through the legislation. The evidence presented to the inquiry into this bill is largely unsubstantiated and antidotal. But those sitting opposite are happy to ignore the facts and expand the CDC program based on their distorted political ideology. There has been minimal engagement with the communities being impacted, and now they plan to roll out this scheme permanently. The dichotomy between the CDC program and the National Agreement on Closing the Gap, which claims to emphasise genuine partnerships and shared decision-making between governments and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, is stark. This card is not the answer to overcoming systemic social issues. There needs to be greater emphasis on employment, training pathways, transitional housing, financial counselling and addiction support. Labor supports voluntary participation in this scheme, and the government themselves have conceded that there are positive results associated with people who volunteer for this program. But forcing people to use cashless debit cards is demeaning and removes their personal liberties. I myself have been a recipient of government assistance and have experienced the stigma associated with being on social services support. 
This system of income management takes away independence and a, and a sense of pride. Now, if you haven't had this lived experience, I understand why so many on the other side have no understanding or concept of what this forced adoption of this program is like on individuals. To have your individual right taken away from you, to be stigmatised so when you're going to purchase something, not being able to have cash to buy second-hand furniture, not being able to give the care and support to those people um, who have been neglected by governments of all persuasions over a long period of time, to now try and enforce uh, such action is unforgivable. As uncovered at the Senate estimates, the Minister, Senator Rushton, commissioned a review undertaken at the cost of $2.5 million, $2.5 million, and admitted that prior to the introduction of this bill, she hadn't even read the report. This really goes to show the attitude and, quite frankly, the arrogance of this government that they are not serious about evidence-based policy making. It needs to be noted that the government did not make the Adelaide University evaluation public in time for it to be considered by the inquiry into this bill. Why not? The failure to permit the inquiry to examine this evidence is very clear indication the government's pursuit of this bill is ideologically driven. The evidence presented in the report has not been substantiated. It is flimsy and mostly antidotal. It is not rigorous or reliable, and there have been nothing to produce which can show the accuracy of the claims made by the government about the way in which this card has had a positive effect on any community across Australia. In fact, significant harm has been associated with compulsory broad-based income management. Most recently, an independent analysis of the CDC in Sojourner conducted by the University of South Australia, concluded that it had no substantive effect on the targeted behaviours of gambling or intoxication abuse. There was also evidence for an increase in total store spending. Here the data showed an increase in spending on healthy foods, as well as overall shift towards a high proportion of spending on less healthy foods. It is Clear, crystal clear that those sitting opposite have cherry-picked the submissions and accounts, and what has resulted is a flawed assessment of the measurements of the effectiveness of the cashless debit card. This government is not interested in evidence. There is no evidence that this scheme is working to its desired effect. There has been intervention in the Northern Territory for 13 years, and there is nothing to suggest that the income management has had any positive effect. We cannot determine whether positive gains are attributed to the CDC as opposed to other interventions such as alcohol restrictions or increase in social security payments during COVID. Yet the government still wants to progress this bill. There have been several inquiries into the efficiency and the effectiveness of the CDC, and none—I repeat, none of them—have found any clear evidence of the effectiveness of this policy. None. Zero. Why is the government rushing to legislate this? We want to know what the evidence is. It's not unreasonable to expect that evidence to be presented. It concerns me that the current government is looking to continue the intervention in the Northern Territory on a permanent basis by stealth, by continuing to expand the reach of the cashless debit card into the Northern Territory. Thirteen years after the intervention, it is clear that such an approach to deliver service is a failure and has left people worse off. This government also has plans to roll this scheme out nationally. No matter what they come into this chamber and say, 
They established a CDC technology working group. This group consists of representatives from the four big banks, Supermarket C, FPOS and Australia Post. This is a precursor for a national rollout, which Senator Canavan has openly endorsed. I know that the people in my home state of Tasmania will not welcome this news. Bridget Archer, the Liberal member for Bass, has spoken out against her own government, condemning the program. But the reality is she cannot have her cake and eat it too. You can't say one thing in the chamber in the other place and then go back to your community and say something else. We get paid to make decisions. That's what politicians are paid for, to come and to vote on legislation and to put forward good policy. The member for Bass has failed her community because she doesn't have the courage of her convictions. She wimped out. If she had not abstained from voting, if she had a backbone and voted against her government, the, we would not be here tonight debating this flawed legislation. It is not good enough to pretend you care, to give an impassioned speech if you aren't prepared to stand up and to vote bad legislation down. That's the reality of the life of a politician. Sometimes you've got to make tough decisions. Parliamentarians go to parliament to vote and to make policy. It is unforgivable that somebody who has made an impassioned plea in her speech in the House of Representatives about what it's like to live on welfare, which we all commend her for being honest and frank about her experience, and we admire her for being elected to the House of Representatives. But you have to be able to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. In keeping with that logic, what is the point of Mrs Archer being the member for Bass if she doesn't have the backbone to stand up and to vote on behalf of the people who elected her? I'm sure that the community will not forget this, particularly when we see this rolled out nationally and when Tasmanian welfare recipients are forced onto a CDC. Labor is calling on the government to listen and engage with communities, including First Nation communities, invest in job creations, pursue evidence-based services and partnerships rather than base your policy on distorted ideology. By continuing to pursue the CDC and broad-based compulsory income management, it would not likely have any positive impact, but rather remove individuals' liberties and take away human rights. The government needs to stop in their pursuit of action without cause and abandon its technology working group and preparations for a national rollout of the CDC. The Labor Party is incredibly disappointed by the government's insistence on this bill. Not only is it counter to the Prime Minister's commitment to a new partnership approach to closing the gap, it has no foundation to argue that this program will deliver better social outcomes for those communities. It's not consistent with genuine partnerships. This program limits freedoms of choice, discriminates against First Nations people and has no sound evidence to prove its effectiveness. The scheme limits the human rights of a right to social security, to a private life and the right to equality. This inquiry did not engage in meaningful two-way discussion and the government will now attempt to roll out this program with little information or guidance offered in order to overcome social issues and welfare dependency in these communities a bottom-up approach which emphasises genuine engagement and inclusive structures of collaboration are required. It is about time that this government stops spinning their way out of accountability and engage in evidence-based policy so that we can have a better outcome, a better outcome for all Australians. I want to finish and 
bring to the attention of this chamber, and particularly the government, that the contributions in this debate, which they have brought this legislation before us, has brought to the chamber comments and contributions to this debate that I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed as an Australian senator to have the comments of Senator Hanson and her racist, vilifying comments that she has made in this debate. And all legislation like this does is bring out racism in this country. It shines a light on the worst aspects of some of our community members. And when you're an elected member of parliament, whether it's in the state parliament, whether it's in the House of Representatives or whether it's in the Senate, you have responsibilities to show leadership. And leadership means that you have to be tolerant. You have to be inclusive. You have to lead from the front. You have to show leadership. I was ashamed to sit in the chamber and to sit in my office and to hear some of the contributions to this debate. I was ashamed of those contributions. I'm all for a debate about the merits of whether or not this legislation should be supported, but I hate to see Australians against Australians in such a racist tone as Senator Hanson's contribution. I implore the crossbench to consider all the facts before them and to vote this legislation down. We can do better for our First Nations people. We can do better for our people that need a hand up on welfare. No one ever knows the circumstances for which they may end up needing welfare or one of their family members, one of their kids, one of their grandchildren. That's what welfare is there for, to give you a hand up. We're a rich country. We can do so much more. We have to ensure this legislation is de defeated as it should Senator have been Polly, in the House of Representatives. But Senator Still. Deputy President, thank you very much. And I wish to make my contribution to the Social Security Administration Amendment continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020. And I endorse the comments of the majority of my colleagues, uh, well, the majority, all my colleagues on this side. But I've also acknowledged Senator O'Sullivan, who has lived and breathed this stuff and has done a lot of work in this uh, area. And Senator O'Sullivan, you know that uh, you and I, there's not been a lot of difference between us. We'll probably be on opposite sides of the chamber when the vote is taken. Well, not probably, we definitely will be. But anyway, I wanted to put that on the record. Um, it's a well-known fact this is not the first time that I've made a contribution on the cashless uh, uh, debit card. I've, I've made extensive contributions about this. And uh, for those who have been on a, another planet from WA who don't know, but I work very closely in the East Kimberley. I, I do work closely in the East Kimberley. I've got some very good friends in the East Kimberley. And I want to say this very, very clearly. There is no way known that I support mandatory rollout of the cashless debit card, but I do support the voluntary uh, um, participation. And there's uh, a couple of things I do want to say tonight. One is I want to talk about the Wounded Foundation, and, um, and I also want to talk about who heads up the Wounded Foundation, a very dear friend of mine, Ian Trust. So let me just share this with, uh, with, with Senators. Wounded Foundation, and Wounded is an Aboriginal development organisation in the East Kimberley region of Western Australia. Wounded operates with a clear purpose and a strategy to drive long-term socio-economic change for Aboriginal people by providing real opportunities, investing in people's abilities and by encouraging and rewarding aspiration and self-responsibility. Wounden's efforts are guided by the philosophy that Aboriginal success grows from investing in people's ability, real opportunity and reward for effort. Wounden is committed to serving the East Kimberley region via funded programs and innovative business solutions. Their programs span across their strategic priorities to improve the lives of Aboriginal people while its social enterprises, enterprises sorry, are spread across the hospitality, health business accounting, research and evaluation and maintenance industries. Wunan has created long-lasting partnerships with the community, business sector and government to make the East Kimberley a place where Aboriginal people can look forward to building a stronger and more independent future for themselves. Wunan's vision is to shift the current dependence on welfare among Aboriginal people in the East Kimberley from 80 per cent to 20 per cent. Wunan's purpose is to ensure that Aboriginal people in the East Kimberley enjoy 
the capabilities and opportunities they need to make positive choices that lead to independent and fulfilling lives, essentially to have dreams and a real chance of achieving them. Now to my second favourite topic that I want to talk about tonight, my very, very dear friend, Mr Ian Trust. And just so senators know where Ian is coming from, and I'm very happy to um, I will be um, uh, using Ian's words in the chamber later today because the least I can do is, is give Ian the opportunity to have his say in this chamber and the people that he represents. Ian has been involved with Wunan since its inception in 1997. He's been the executive director since 2004 and has served as chairman of the organisation since 2008. A local Gidget man from Wagaban community, Ian speaks English and Creole of the English Creole language family. Ian has a strong and coherent vision of a better future for Aboriginal people in the East Kimberley, a future beyond welfare and government dependency. Ian is one of the driving forces behind Wunan's key strategy to establish a strong economic base, which allows it to deliver sustainable programs to assist Aboriginal people of the East Kimberley to create better lives and a positive future for themselves. Ian has worked tirelessly to progress this vision through such initiatives as the ATSIC Regional Council's Future Building Strategy of 1996, the East Kimberley Aboriginal Achievement Awards, reforms in the Aboriginal housing and infrastructure sector and as Executive Director of Woonan Foundation. In addition to Woonan, Ian has engaged with a number of national and regional organisations that contribute to the broader objective of creating Aboriginal independence. These include the Indigenous Land Corporation, the Kimberley Development Commission and Kimberley Land Council uh, driving Kimberley Futures. Ian is also involved in the support and development of emerging Aboriginal leaders in the East Kimberley because he believes developing strong leaders from within the within the Aboriginal community is crucial to drive and maintain development strategies and ensure Aboriginal people achieve their full potential. Now, um, Ian is also one of the leaders of the East Kimberley Empowered Communities Group, but for the Senate, <coughs> excuse me, it's also important, I believe, that the senators should also know what other positions Ian has held. Ian has been a director of Indigenous Business Australia, the IBA, a director of the Indigenous Land Corporation, the ILC, a director of Anja Board in the West Kimberley, a board member of the North Regional TAFE, formerly founding chairman of Wounded Foundation from 1997 uh, to 2003. Formerly, Ian was an ATSIC commissioner for the Kimberley, and he was, Ian was also formerly chair of Wounded and ATSIC Regional Council. Now, colleagues, as I have said, these are Ian's words, and I will start with quote, and I will end with uh, end quote. So Ian has said the essential quality of leadership is about faith and belief and a vision of something better. This is the glue which holds all great nations, communities and families together. We believe our people have the potential to achieve a better quality of life than they currently have, but someone needs to believe in them. This is something university studies do not or cannot measure but without it, nothing can be achieved. This is what drives the Aboriginal people of Kununurra and Wyndham who support the CDC. We have never said the CDC is a silver bullet and that it will solve all our problems. No single strategy can do that, but it is the start we need for our people to create a better life. Our critics keep saying that the cashless debit card is a failure and we should go back to a system which has been an absolute failure for our people for over 50 years. The payment of cash welfare benefits has not produced any tangible benefits for our people, and the closing the gap statistics produced each year by government proves this. The success of the cashless debit card has varied between locations. Towns such as Wyndham and Sojourner have achieved better results than towns which are more of a community hub such as Kadanara. The influx, the influx of people from outlying communities around Kadanara and over the border who are not on the CDC distorts the outcomes in Kadanara. The problem is also compounded by the fact 
that each cashless debit card region has a limit on the number of participants, and this is by legislation, who can be put on the cashless debit card. And once this number has been reached, new participants receiving benefits in the region are not put on the CDC but receive their benefits in cash. The major positive results from the CDC in places like Kununurra is the reduction of gambling and the harassment of the elderly and vulnerable people for their money on payday. If you are a vulnerable person, this outcome alone is huge. It has also helped people budget their money for the whole fortnight rather than running short of funds towards the end of the pay period to purchase food. Another advantage of the CDC is that a record of expenditure is maintained of the expenses incurred on the card. This is particularly important to monitor the spending patterns of the elderly and vulnerable people using services such as taxis. Not all taxis and other services are exploiting vulnerable people, but in the cash payment environment it is impossible to monitor if such people are being exploited, which we believe they were. Although the achievements are modest, they are better than what we have experienced from cash welfare benefits and we believe it is easier to build a strategy for change using the cashless debit card as a base than cash, uh, cash welfare. We do not believe the cashless debit card does any harm as participants receive the same amount of money as those on cash welfare benefits, but it has the potential to be improved over time. And that is what we need to do to build a better future for our people. The vote for the cashless debit card is a simple choice between trying something different, which we believe can over time achieve change, or stay with a system which has created dependency for many Aboriginal families over generations." Unquote. Ian, you know that I will stand with you. My party has made the decision, and I back my party's decision, that I will not support the mandatory rollout. I want to continue to see how many people that can actually volunteer to come into it. And we must always remember that those who want to do it, we cannot vilify them. Who are we to think that we can make these comments, and how dare we know better than they do? So, on that, Madam, oh, I'm sorry, on that, Mr. De Acting Deputy President, um, those were Ian's words. I've concluded with mine. I won't be supporting the bill, but I will be doing everything I can to work with Ian and all those in the East Kimberley who voluntarily are on the card and want to make a better part for their life, and more importantly, as they say, look after the old people, but their children come first. Thank you. Senator Watt. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, well, this week we are really starting to see this government's true colours come out. For months we have been hearing from the Prime Minister and many other members of his government that through this pandemic we are all in this together. And for many of the last few months Australians have been in this together regardless of their political persuasions, regardless of where they live, regardless of their racial background, we have all had common cause fighting the pandemic and making sure that all of us get through it okay and all of us come out the other side in a recovery that is shared equally among all of us. But that approach that has been put forward over and over again by the Prime Minister has this week come to a screaming halt. This week, despite the fact that we are in the middle of the deepest recession this country has seen since the Great Depression, despite the fact that we still have well over a million Australians unemployed and more still who are underemployed and not able to get the amount of work that they need to get by, despite all of those things, this week, as we approach Christmas, the government has refused to permanently increase JobSeeker for those poorest members of our community who can't find work. This week, the government has maintained its position that superannuation should be cut. This week, the government has introduced new laws which would actually cut workers' pay in the middle of a recession. And this week, the government seeks to push through this legislation to enshrine a cashless debit card which is racially discriminatory, 
doesn't work and has no evidence to back it up. Putting all these things together, you can see very clearly that the government no longer thinks that we are all in this, in this together. What you can see is that the government is rapidly choosing to leave behind vast segments of the Australian community. It's leaving behind the unemployed by refusing to grant a permanent increase to job seeker. It's leaving behind the very essential workers that we have all relied on to keep us safe, to keep us fed, to keep us healthy throughout the pandemic by cutting their pay. And it's also leaving behind some of the poorest and most remote communities in our country by forcing them through this legislation to remain on the cashless debit card, which so many of those communities rightly reject. It is profoundly disappointing that in the middle of a recession that the government is so determined uh, to leave so many people in our community behind, including through this legislation. It is a very sour way for this year to end after all the Australian community has been through. Now, this bill, as other speakers have said, will make the cashless debit card permanent in the existing trial sites of Sejuna, the East Kimberley, the Goldfields and Bundaberg and Harvey Bay in my home state of Queensland. It will also permanently replace the basics card with the cashless debit card in the Northern Territory. It will replace the basics card with the cashless debit card in Cape York and extend income management in Cape York until 31 December 2021, and it will make another, a number of other changes as well. Now, as I and other Labor speakers have said, we will be opposing this bill because it is another example of the Morrison government leaving people behind. In the middle of a recession, in the run-up to Christmas, when people are feeling more insecure about their welfare than ever before. And as I say, the cashless debit card has been shown over and over again through independent research, through Senate inquiries and through other means uh, to be expensive, to be cumbersome, to be racially discriminatory and, arguably worst of all, to have no evidence whatsoever to back it up. It really is hard to escape the conclusion that, in the absence of evidence that this actually works, that the government's determination to push on with the cashless debit card, to extend it and to make it permanent, is ideologically driven. There is no evidence to support what the government is doing. They are doing this out of their ideology, which, despite being theoretically a small government party, sees government in there dictating to people how they will live their lives, uh, imposing a scheme that applies vastly disproportionately to Aboriginal communities uh, and makes it harder for some of the poorest people of in, our, in our community to take control of their own lives and to actually get ahead. Now, the government, when it's asked to come up with evidence that it works, the government points to an evaluation of the scheme which was performed by researchers at the University of Adelaide. It cost $2.5 million to commission this research. So the cost of rolling out this scheme is not just the scheme itself. The government has spent more money commissioning research which it says backs up what it's trying to do. Now I'll admit I haven't looked at this report. I haven't seen this research, but you know what? Not one of us has, because the government won't release it. The so-called evidence base that the government has spent $2.5 million commissioning is so good and so conclusive that the government won't release it. Does that not tell you something about how weak the evidence is for this government in pushing on with this scheme? If it actually had evidence that demonstrated that it worked, put it forward. You've spent money on it. You've got the report. Why continue to hide it? The only conclusion that anyone can draw is that the research does not back up what the government is doing. 
It would help the government's position if it could actually point to this research and take us through it, show us the pages, show us the evidence. Some of us might even change our mind if we saw this evidence. But the government won't do that because it knows that the research that it's relying on doesn't back it up. Card users say they can no longer buy second-hand goods online. They can't buy school uniforms at op shops. Budgeting is hard because they can't put money aside in a separate account for bigger expenses. It has practical problems, such as when an FPOS machine is out at the pharmacy or the post office or the supermarket, people on their cashless debit card won't be able to get their medications or pay their bills or get food for their kids' lunches because they don't have access to their own money, because the government, through this mechanism, is controlling how they can spend their money and what they can spend it on. Now, one of the, other, one of the areas, as I say, where this cashless debit card has been rolled out uh, is the Bundaberg-Harvey Bay region in my state of Queensland. Now, there is no doubting that that region suffers very high levels of poverty, principally because it has suffered from very high levels of unemployment for a long time. Certainly under this government and, to be fair, under previous governments as well. So wouldn't you think that the best solution to that would actually be to see the government get in there and do something about creating jobs, about investing in some of the local industries that have potential to grow, to employ people? But this government is so lacking in imagination that rather than actually doing the hard work of investing in the region and creating jobs, like I might say the state government is doing, the state Labor government is doing, instead of that they just choose this punitive measure of restricting people's ability to control their own lives and to control what they spend their income on and when they spend it. It's no wonder that, as one example, uh, Bundaberg Harvey Bay mother of three, Karen Griffiths, told ABC's 7.30 program, I feel like in the government's eyes I'm a lesser person. If my partner was to quarantine some of my money and tell me where and when I can't spend it, tell me it's for my own good, people would be screaming financial abuse. Why is it okay for the government to do it? That is a very good question. Why is it okay for the government to do something that, if it were being done by someone's partner, we would rightly say amounts to financial abuse. Childers' single mum, Hannah Lisi, said she experiences problems with the cards monthly, and an extension just makes it harder to become independent again and support ourselves and budget our own money. If you actually speak to people who are on the cashless debit card, as I have done in Bundaberg, through meetings with the very active campaigning group against this, who have done a fantastic job raising community awareness about the problems of this proposal, if you actually speak to people, the thing that they find most hurtful is it removes their independence. Now, day after day, we hear members of the government and their supporters in the media and the business community say unemployed people should just go and get a job, they should get off their bums, they should go and take some self-responsibility and get ahead in life. But that's exactly what this government is stopping people from doing by controlling how, where and on what they can spend their income. How can you demand, on the one hand, that people show a bit more personal responsibility and get their own house in order, and then on the other hand say, but we're not going to let you choose how you spend your money because we know what's best for you? Now, I heard Senator O'Sullivan earlier today, and I, I do get along with Senator, Senator O'Sullivan on many things, but I heard him saying that those who deny uh, that the cashless debit card should stay in, in place are being paternalistic. I would argue that it's actually the other way around. For a government to say how people should be spending their income, that is the act of paternalism. And it's unbelievable to me that in 2020 it continues to go on particularly in First Nations communities, because we know, when you look at the figures, we know uh, that the vast majority of people who are on the cashless debit card are from First Nations communities. 
over 68 per cent around the country of people who are on the cashless debit card are Aboriginal Australians. And it's obviously even higher in the Northern Territory, where it's 83 per cent, and East Kimberley, where it's 82 per cent. If this isn't paternalism, I don't know what is. Now, obviously, Labor has been very strong in our opposition to this proposal, but we're not alone. The organisations that don't support the cashless debit card include St Vincent de Paul, the Law Council of Australia, the Queensland Council of Social Service, Australian Council of Social Services, Aboriginal Peak Organisations NT, who said in their submission to the Community Affairs Senate inquiry on this issue that imposing the cashless debit card on approximately 25,000 Aboriginal Territorians will fundamentally impinge on the equal enjoyment of human rights and freedoms and that rather than building capacity and independence, the program has had the opposite effect by further entrenching an individual's dependence on welfare. There are many, many, many other organisations which, like Labor, oppose this cashless debit card. The, as I've already said, the research that the government points to in support of its proposal doesn't stand up to scrutiny because it's not allowed to have any scrutiny. The government won't release the very piece of research that it spent $2.5 million worth of taxpayers' money on which it says supports what it's doing. But the research we do know about that has been made public includes research from the University of South Australia, which released a statement on 16 November this year in which they stated, we found no substantive impact on measures of gambling, drug and alcohol abuse, crime or emergency department presentations. These are the things that the government says are being reduced as a result of the cashless debit card. They can't produce any evidence that backs them up. But here we have evidence from people who have actually had a look at it and are prepared to make their research public, saying that it hasn't made a difference. They, they go on to say, if there are plans to expand this scheme, we should be sure, it, sure it's meeting its objectives, and the data indicates it just isn't doing that. If that isn't clear, that the evidence isn't there to back up what the government is doing here, I don't know what is. So in conclusion, uh, I'm very pleased, along with my Labor colleagues, to be opposing this bill. And what is worrying is not only what this bill proposes uh, for some of the poorest members of our community, particularly in First Nations communities, but it is another example of what we're seeing over and over again from this government, which is, that is now that we are hopefully through the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic, they are leaving so many people behind. Indigenous Australians, workers, the unemployed, that's not who this Thank government's you, Senator for. White. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to, uh, to uh, speak on uh, this rather contentious and emotive uh, bill, uh, also uh, with a bit of politics involved, I think. I have an engineering background, and that's the way in, in which I like to look at things. I like to uh, find workable and practical solutions. And so the fundamental question for me in whether or not to support this legislation is does the card work? That's the fundamental uh, question. This card has uh, an objective of reducing uh, alcoholism, gambling and uh, drug abuse amongst welfare card recipients. And I think everyone would say that's an admirable aim. But does it do that? One of the problems we've got here, and actually I think most people uh, recognise this, is that we do not have any empirical data, any definitive data set that uh, would uh, guide us as to whether or not it does actually achieve those particular objectives. Uh, as uh, Senator Watt indicated there is a report that is available uh, at least to the minister that hasn't been ma made available uh, to other senators and uh, we don't know what that uh, report says although there has there have been some uh, leaks that suggest that it also doesn't contain uh, the the, uh, the de definitive data the objective data that is required uh, for the government to put their case or to prove their case so what that does is leaves 
every senator in this chamber working on anecdote. And uh, again, as an engineer, in the absence of data, I thought, how am I going to research this? I got myself a CDC card. Senators are allowed to have a CDC card, even though they may not be a, uh, or they're not welfare recipients. I think there's only one other senator that has a uh, CDC card. I think that might be Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, that's been out there and tried it and tapped and go. It's actually quite uh, an impressive uh, bit of technology. It replicates pretty much a, uh, a, a credit card. Uh, and uh, a number have, of changes have been made to the card that, that get rid of some of the stigma. Uh, not all, I, I will tell you. Uh, whilst I was using the card uh, as I travelled about, it was very easy to use, but I, I, I did go into some alcohol uh, shops, some bottlers. I uh, tried to use the card and got rejected. And I found myself looking for some sort of excuse as to why uh, my card had been declined. Of course, then I was able to rip out another card and, uh, and pay for um, a bottle of wine or something, something like that. So uh, I then uh, went out uh, and about to the coalface, because if you're relying on anecdote, the last thing you want to have happen is that anecdote to be infected by Chinese whispers, which is what happens with distance and as message passes, messages pass from person to person. So I went to the coalface, and I've got to thank, um, in the first instance when I went to Northern Territory, I've got to thank Senator McCarthy for inviting me up to Darwin to talk to, to uh, Aboriginal corporations, Aboriginal elders, and then taking me uh, to Nullumboy in Arnhem Land to uh, meet with Indigenous people uh, in, in that community. And uh, I really am grateful for, uh, for uh, Senator McCarthy's assistance in that regard. I'm also grateful to Senator Rustin, Minister Rustin, who uh, uh, came to Sejuna with me and also uh, 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 facilitated me meeting a whole range of different people. Um, some of those people were uh, from Indigenous communities, uh, others from business. But I actually stayed there a couple of days one with Senator Rustin, one without. And in the day that I was without, I went and talked to health, of health officials. I went and talked to uh, the Aboriginal Health Service there. I also uh, talked to people in the street. I talked to uh, my neighbour on, uh, in, in, in the balcony next to me in the hotel that I was staying at, just raising a, co a conversation. I must apologise to her now. Uh, I was being a little bit sneaky, had a conversation, started talking about the CDC card. And all of that uh, was, was useful in informing me. And indeed, um, po probably the most important people I spoke to were those that were required to use the card. And uh, Senator Seawood put me in contact with people, uh, so too did uh, uh, Senator McCarthy. So I did talk to people who were on the card, I, and of course through emails uh, and uh, people calling into my office. I uh, actually called a number of people. I spoke to uh, a gentleman named Frank in Mount Barker who told me his story. Uh, he wasn't on the card, a uh, very troubled um, person. Uh, sounded like he had his life in order, but was just fearful that he would end up with the card being opposed upon him and that that would just simply add to the, to, to the burden uh, that he already uh, suffered through a disability and uh, uh, you know, difficult interactions with, with Centrelink in the past. So uh, I did uh, talk to people. I also had a look at some of the wraparound services that go with the card. And one of the really difficult things here is it's you can't put your finger on whether the card is actually uh, the, uh, a major contributor uh, or, a, or a minor contributor to something that may or may not be working. So, for example, in Sejuna, when you go to the bottler, you also have to show your licence. And if you come from one of the communities, one of the indigenous communities, uh, uh, you can't purchase alcohol if your address is from, uh, say, uh, 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 
uh, Oak Valley, for example, or Yalata. That's a measure that the Indigenous community has imposed upon themselves. Um, there are also other services, re, you know, sort of rehab in, in some cases, uh, sobering up uh, uh, centres, uh, health centres, the community help centres and so forth. And so in, in trying to look at all of this, again, hard to work out what the card contributes to the purported benefit from the government uh, and indeed how that it might affect uh, what is being said uh, in the anecdotal information being transmitted to me. I will say, uh, sadly in this debate, uh, sadly in, this, uh, in consideration of this bill, uh, my office was swamped with people who were quite rude about the card, quite rude about the fact that I hadn't made up my mind and that uh, there's a possibility that I might vote against it and they were aggressive to my staff, they were threatening to my staff, to the point where the Special Minister of State has now had to implement measures, including the AFP being involved, to make sure my staff are safe, um, uh, yielding threats against me as well. Uh, I engage some of these people, even trying to just uh, have a discussion with them, to have them shouting down the phone at me. Uh, some people chose to name my staff on uh, Facebook and other social media platforms. Staff that took their call, listened to what they had to say to pass on to me. And I just want to say this, and I think every senator will agree with me when I do say this, is that we have people in our offices who work for us and they may actually have the same uh, 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 f uh, feelings or the same attitudes towards the person calling, but they very professionally represent me. They very professionally answer calls from people who may be sharing the same thoughts and opinions that they are, and they are getting abused. So to all those who have campaigned and campaigned in a rude way, Understand you have not affected my decision and indeed uh, uh, you have prevented other people who wanted to have their say in talking to my staff and having uh, their concerns voiced to me. So please, those uh, that, that did uh, that, please think about that in the future. In the end, weighing up all the evidence, the difficulty for me is that the government has not made out its case. When I try and balance up everything that I've seen, unfortunately the data is not there that supports the concept that the card achieves what it is intended to achieve. And it is on that basis that I will not be supporting this legislation. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on the Social Security Administration Amendment continuation of the Cashless Welfare Bill 2020. Uh, look, it is no secret to anyone in this place that I've long been involved with the evolution of the cashless debit card. Uh, prior to my life uh, in politics, elected 12, 18 months ago, uh, I spent my life working at the Mindaroo Foundation and I actually led the project uh, and the significant community consultation which underpinned its development, the development of the cashless debit card, speaking to people around uh, Australia and hearing from them about their wishes and their desires for their community. And the ideas sprung up out of the community and it was an idea that was from the community before it was even thought about by the government because we took it to the government at the time and worked with the government to establish the trials. Uh, and I've taken that same approach since being elected here as a senator. So, so far I've been to uh, all the trial sites apart from, sadly, the Harvey Bay region in Queensland. I had planned to get there, but given COVID and the restrictions, uh, I was unable to travel there. But I have uh, met with people 
uh, because there was a, a, a meeting in Perth uh, just a week ago and uh, there were folks from uh, that region that came over. So I got to meet people on the ground and I've met and spoken with many uh, over the telephone and Zoom and those sort of uh, formats. Now these experiences of people on the ground is, is absolutely critical. Uh, people that are dealing with the impacts and the implementation of this card day in, day out are critical. It's a view that you really only get by being on the ground, listening to people and hearing their views. It's not a view that you can get by sitting behind a desk at a university on the east coast or from the comfort of an armchair. To really understand the challenges, you have to get out on the ground and spend time in these communities. Not just fly in and fly out, but spend time. As I know Senator Still has done over his career as a senator. When I'm in the Kimberley, people speak incredibly highly of you, Senator Still, because you are someone that understands, because you've spent the time and you've got the relationship. And that's the approach that I've taken across these sites. As a senator for Western Australia, I've been working with the minister and the department to make sure we continue to improve the platform and to work with communities on the ground to bring their experiences here into this place. And I'm proud to be part of the government which continues to support this program and which is working hard to make sure that it's better. This bill will extend the cashless debit card program in each of the trial sites and establish the Northern Territory and Cape York areas as CDC program areas and transition income management participants in these areas to the CD program, CDC program next year. Madam Acting Deputy President, supporting this bill is the right thing to do. But let me just deal with a few facts. Let me deal with a few facts. What actually is the cashless debit card, firstly? The CDC is a Visa debit card. A Visa debit card where 80 per cent of the cardholders' working age social security payments are paid into the CDC account. The remaining 20 per cent is just paid into any other standard bank account. The CDC Visa card can be used at over 900,000 merchants, nearly a million merchants across Australia, which is basically wherever there is an FPOS terminal. In practical terms, it works wherever Visa is accepted. The only limitation is that it won't work at a liquor store or a pub, and it can't be used to withdraw cash at an ATM. Now, when I've heard the contributions from those opposite saying that it's actually controlling what, how people can spend their money, well, it's just simply not true, because you can use this card absolutely everywhere except for a liquor store. It's the only place, and a pub and a pub. You can purchase online. You can pay for your bills. You can, you can engage in, in, in commerce online. You can, uh, people have said, well, you can't buy second-hand furniture using Gumtree. Well, you can use PayPal. Like, there's, there's many ways. Or you can even go to Centrelink and get uh, an additional $200 a month to enable transactions that can't be covered by the cashless debit card. <coughs> this means that the CDC can be used to purchase everyday items that individuals need to be able to provide for themselves and for their families. As I said, they can pay their bills, they can buy things online, they can use the card at bricks and mortar merchants as well. There really is actually very little impost, very little impost on a card holder, particularly when you consider that cashless and contactless payments have become the predominant way that people transact with merchants now. And we've seen that accelerate significantly during this COVID pandemic. In fact, there are many cafes that won't take a cash payment. You have to use a card. Well, guess what? The CDC will work at those merchants as well. To date, the CDC has successfully blocked access to approximately 40,000 transactions. And Senator Patrick said that uh, when he was using uh, his card, he tried to use it at a, uh, at a liquor store to buy a bottle of wine, so he's possibly one of those odd 40,000 transactions that were, that were counted, because the participant was attempting to uh, use the card at a, uh, 
place that was restricted. So this bill will allow the 25,000 people on the Basics card in the Northern Territory and the Cape York to transition off this old and clunky technology, which is the Basics card, and move to a better and more ubiquitously accepted cashless debit card, which, as I stated, operates on the common visa scheme. The Basics card can be very limiting for cardholders. And a lot of the feeling that you get, a lot of the feedback that you get from people about the negativity of the card is actually conflated with the basics card, because the basics card is a very old and clunky system. And the main reason for that is that for a merchant to be able to accept the basics card, they have to opt in and sign up with a card uh, with an agreement with the basics card provider. So this results in there only being 16,000 merchants across Australia that will accept the basics card, whereas, what I, as I said before, nearly a million, a nearly a million merchants are able to accept the cashless debit card. So it's a much, much better system. And if this bill passes, I look forward to seeing the people in the uh, in the Northern Territory, in the Cape York get access to a much better system, because the government has heard of instances where people have had to travel across town to be able to make purchases because their local retailer doesn't accept the basics card. But if they're a retailer in business these days, where most people are actually opting and preferring to use uh, contactless and cashless payments, then of course they've got an FPOS machine. And so pretty much every merchant now has that facility. Even farmers' markets. You go there and they've got little squares, little PayPal machines. They're everywhere. The other fact that seems to be overlooked in this debate is that the CDC came about because the, that you often over, that it is overlooked in this debate is that the CDC came about because the communities called for it and they designed it. How do I know this? Because I was there. I actually did it. I was part of the consultation team that saw this card initiated. I sat with the very brave members of those communities that called on the government to give this system a go. Senator Stirl spoke of one of those brave members of the community in the East Kimberley, Ian Trust. Uh, Ian is an absolute uh, champion in that community. Very uh, proud. We're all very proud of him, and uh, he's a great Western Australian, great Australian. See, these communities they wanted their community to have a circuit breaker to help them deal with the devastating impacts of the harms caused by chronic alcohol and drug use. Since being elected into this place, I've been speaking to community leaders, meeting with organisations directly involved in the delivery of this scheme and the wraparound services which support it. Their feedback has been clear, as have the results in each of the current trial sites and their respective communities. Firstly, participants in the program have reported drinking less frequently, using drugs less frequently and gambling less often. Has it removed these problems in the communities? Of course it hasn't. Of course it hasn't. No one was expecting, it, expecting that it would. Kids are now going to school with a belly full of food, which is helping them to get the most out of their education. Slowly, these communities are starting to become stronger, more cohesive, and they're seeing less violence as a result of drugs and alcohol. I visited a school in WA's northwest, which not that long ago, before the cashless debit card was implemented, they were providing large quantities of food at the breakfast club on a Monday morning because these kids had not eaten all weekend. Now, in that community, the food that they have to serve has decreased significantly on a Monday morning because these kids are not coming to school as hungry. In Sojuna, the Foodland reported to us that theft was down, petty theft was down, and that the purchase of fruit and vegetables had increased noticeably. They said that people were buying groceries that they had not seen before. Their employment services provider, which is part owned by the local Indigenous Corporation reported that more people are getting into work and are looking for work. They're seeing that there's something better. Now, these are stories of locals on the ground. 
and the commentators and those that are opposed to the card think that we shouldn't use them because they're anecdotes. They believe they aren't a valid representation of the impact of what's actually happening on the ground. But they are important. Because if we aren't listening to these people, if we aren't looking at the evidence that they're putting forward to us as decision makers, if we aren't taking their advice, then who should we be listening to? We've seen the opposing position put forward on glossy reports which only use cherry-picked data. Evidence which supports the program is slammed as an anecdote, whilst anecdotes which oppose the card are somehow supported as evidence. Now, all the views of people on the ground should be heard. Every experience is important, whether that's a good experience, a bad experience or otherwise. And we've heard senators opposite say that people on this card feel demonised, targeted, disenfranchised, and there's a whole list of adjectives that are used. Yet the primary places that I've heard these views from are actually from people outside of the trial areas. In fact, I've heard Senator Walsh come in here earlier today and speak of Helen, who opposes the card, saying that it's going to significantly impact her. And then she went on to say she's from Victoria. Now, the CDC is not going into Victoria. And if it was, it would require further legislation, because this legislation actually specifically lists the locations where it's going to be operating. The chain and the campaign emails that I've received, and I know that many of you have received, uh, almost always come from everywhere except these communities participating in the trial. They believe that they know what is best for everyone. Now, this is the height of paternalism, in my mind. To say to those people in these communities that want to see the continuation of the card, that that they don't actually know what is good for their own community, well, that is just so patronising. In contrast, this government has been listening to those on the ground. We have received positive feedback, and we have also received feedback of where it needs to be improved. And that's why I've been working with the minister and with the banks and with the retailers, major retailers, to improve the technology so that we can reduce some of the stigma that Senator Patrick was talking about, reduce some of the, the friction points that other senators have mentioned here today. Is the CDC a silver bullet? Of course it's not. Of course it's not. But we will continue to support the card and the work with the communities to ensure that its evolution reflects what they need and what they want to see. And we're continuing to do the same with the wraparound services making sure that people can deal with addictions, that they can get the support that they need and, importantly, that they can get into a job pipeline so that we can connect them with jobs that actually exist. And it's one of the next focuses that I'm going to have across the CDC trial sites, is to make sure that we're actually seeing jobs as the destination and not welfare. So I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I've always seen a lot of good in the cashless debit card. I've been out there for years, talking to people about what it could do and the difference it could make. I've been in the newspapers, and I've been on the radio, and I've been here on the floor talking about how it could work. I've stood beside four government ministers who have tried to get this thing off the ground. I've worded them up on where the person before them got to, and I've told them what the next step should be. I've supported them to get legislation passed when they needed it. Over the, those years, I've been running around the country meeting people who are on the cart and talking to people who could, could be about it, to go on it and encouraging them to do that. Me and my staff have visited Sojourner and Harvey Bay in the goldfields and Kimberleys multiple times just to check in to see how things are going and to follow up on whether the promises are being delivered. We've been all the way to Millingimby, an island in Arman Land, and all the way down to Papunya, a few hours' drive from Alice. I've listened to the tough guys who say they hate the card, and I've heard the little old ladies whisper in my ear that it's actually putting food on the table. I've talked to mayors who say their neighbourhood has been safer and more calm and listened to the Indigenous leaders beg me not to keep the card around. 
I've gotten to know the people in those communities, and I've met the kids, the mums, the dads, the aunties, the uncles, the elders, and even the dogs. I've heard them out. We've had some tough conversations. I've gone down and I've sat with them on mats under those gum trees in the sweltering heat, and I've asked them, should I vote to make this thing permanent? Should I send it up to the Northern Territory? I learned a lot from the answers I got from those questions. The things I heard have changed my thinking about the card and how it works. And I have to be brutally honest. When I first came out swinging for the cashless debit card, I was thinking about what life was like for me when I was on Centrelink. I was living on that little bit of money that, gave, that, that they gave me for eight years. And I know how hard it is. Every single dollar matters. You have to scrimp and you have to save and you have to do everything you possibly can to make it stretch. You have to put off paying electricity bills one week so that you can get your edge before it expires. And you live off wheat bits for days on end so that you can pull together enough money to pay for your kids to get some sand shoes or footy boots just so they can get on the sporting field. You shop at Vinnie's for the kids' clothes and you have a lovely day if you can pick up a new pair of surf jeans with the original price tag still on them <laughs> and they're brand new. <laughs> I can tell you, you don't have a lot to spend on anything that isn't rent, bills and food. That's why I've always thought the card wouldn't make a big. Um, that's why I've always thought the card wouldn't make a big difference for people who have found a way to budget their money in a way that's good for them and their family. From their perspective, they'll keep doing what they're doing, and not much is likely to change. But if someone who's living on a tiny amount, on that little bit of money that we do get when we're on welfare, is managing to spend more than 100 bucks a fortnight on booze or pokies or drugs, there's a fair chance there'll be others around them that will go without. There's also a fair chance they're probably not doing too well. More than likely, they could probably use a bit of help. More than likely, they're in some serious trouble. And sometimes they're making a bit of trouble for the people around them as well. The thing is, I know what it looks like. I recognise ad addiction. I've watched people I love, but it turned them into shelves of themselves. I know how to spot when someone's been using again. Even if it's been a while since their last hit, I see it in their eyes by the way they, they put their sentences together and the tone in their voice. And when someone that you love gets like that, they do not make good decisions. And they start doing things they would never have done if their addiction hadn't taken the wheel. They lose sight of who they are and they lose sight of what they care about and each day blows into the next. And someone like that, they'll easily blow every dollar they have to feed their cravings. They have no boundaries and they are beyond thinking about the consequences. And every bit of money they get hold of will find its way to the dealer, to the bottle shop or the poker machine. I know all of this and I will do anything, absolutely anything, to make it stop for every single Australian family that's been through this or going through this across the country. I'd do anything to stop the absolute tragedy and heartbreak that comes from losing someone you love to an addiction. That's where I come from on this thing. That's why when I heard about this card, I was so hopeful that it could help. That's why I wanted to give this card a shot. It gave me hope that things could change. And that's the reason I've been the face of these things for years. I've spoken out so loudly about the good I've seen on the card. To do that, sometimes it feels like people out there forget that it's actually coalition policy and not mine. Somewhere along the way, it became the Jackie Lambie cashless debit card. And I didn't mind that for a while. I was prepared to take that. And I still don't, I suppose. I know the card could do a lot of good. And I've seen kids going back to school in some of these places. And I've seen what Sandra Sullivan said. I've seen food on the table. I've watched those elders, those women stop being abused. But I've always said to the government, if you want to make this thing happen, you can't let the card be the only thing you do. It's not a magic wand. You can't wave it at people and expect things to somehow get better. 
because the problems that you see in the trial sites need a lot more than a cashless debit card to fix. And that's what I heard every time I went to the trial sites. I heard in the Northern Territory too. Those people up there can't live better lives with just the cashless debit card. They need jobs. And they need medical facilities, and they need counsellors, and they need skills training. They need the government to quit pulling the, rug, pulling the rug from under them, under them by constantly funding short-term projects that never have enough time to get up and running and actually make any difference. And the cashless debit card was never going to solve those problems, but it could have been a way to start making change. If it had come with the right funding so people could get trained up, it could have made a real difference. If it had come with a jobs package to help people get off welfare, we could have made a fresh start for those people in those trial sites. But I've come to realise that the commitment from the government to make that happen has actually really never really been there. It takes a junior. Now, to be fair, they've actually been given a lot of money since they have opted in the trial, first in, first served, and good on them for having the courage to do that. I can tell you that's probably where you'll see the biggest change because that's where we, where we invested to start with and we really put in. But every trial site after that, it got less and less and, and, and people got less and less interested. But all that money went into funding and sojourner to 40-something charities around the town and even though the people who set them up are doing their best to make a difference, they're all pulling in different directions. They can't scratch the surface of the problems that sojourner faces. Meanwhile, the TAFE hardly runs any courses. What about some trade training and some apprenticeships? All this was supposed to come along with the card. That was part of the package. The CDP program isn't helping people either. Should have just stuck with the CDP program. We already knew that was working. Once again, you put a card out there, you shortchange them and you back it off in the jobs area. And you get them trained up and ready to enter the workforce instead of people being forced to show up to twiddle their thumbs. Alcohol and drugs are still a problem in Sojourner too. Five years later, it's still an issue. The sobering up unit can take people in and look after them for a night if they've had too much to drink. But then they have to send them back on the street when the morning arrives. Anyone who actually wants to do something about a drinking and drug problem has to leave their loved ones behind for weeks on end and travel for five hours to a rehab centre in Port Augusta. It just doesn't work for them and most people just won't go because it, they just... A lot of them are Indigenous. They don't have the cars to get up there. They don't have five hours to get up there, and it makes no common sense. Part of your recovery must be involve family and friends. That gives you a better chance of recovery. But to just shove you somewhere and hope you recover without that support as well, it's just never going to be enough. In the end, nothing changes, and they're back to square one. No one goes anywhere. It's just one big vicious circle. I can't tell you how many times I've raised these problems with the government and they know about what's going on. This is a sad fact of the matter. They've been kicking this can down the road now for years, and it's becoming more and more obvious that they haven't had the will to make these things happen. They just haven't put in. They haven't put in. They haven't put in enough. And that's been the really sad fact. What, what could have been something great for the country. It's taken us nearly five years to get the damn card right, and we haven't even started on the rest. And the rest is the hardest bit. The rest is the jobs. It's the training. It's the rehabs. If it's taken us five years to work on a card, on something plastic, what's, how long is it going to take to get this right with the real life stuff? You know, I had to take 20 months out of this place and I sat on the sidelines. And for 20 months I had to sit back and just let it go. And all that time I wondered, how was the card going? Fortunately, I, I, I couldn't get out there and get over and, and check on it like I used to. You know what the government did in that time I was gone? It did pretty much nothing. Nothing happened the whole time. There was very little progress. And here's the truth. When I came back, the carp was pretty much comatosed. It was dead in the water. And that's when I first started to wonder if the people in this government actually want this thing to work. And now I've finally decided that I don't think they really do at all. And what could have been so great, so great for this country is now becoming heartbreaking. Because if this was really a trial, they would have done a proper study 
and they would have got the job done. And you would look, you would release that Adelaide, Adelaide University report because you know what I do. It's going to have filings in it everywhere because you you haven't done the job. I know it. And through the chair, I'm sure Senator Sullivan knows it. And that's really sad. And not because we want that report to look like that. It's just that somehow you guys just stop putting effort into it. It's like Sir June was the best thing. It was great. And then after that, it just started to water down. It fell apart. It's fallen apart. They tell us why they think it makes sense to have this card in a few regional areas in the Northern Territory, but no one, nowhere else. They'd have a reason for quarantine. They'd have, they should have a reason for quarantine, quarantining 80 per cent of people's money in Sejuna, Harvey Bay and the Goldfields and the Kimberleys, but yet it's just 50-50, the money in the Northern Territory. They'd come out and they'd show us that they actually want to invest in making regional areas with the card prosper. And they'd put money into the jobs that people need in those areas. And they'd find a way to get people off welfare and into work. None of that's happening. And none of that, I mean, we're five, five years, we're coming in six years next year since we started. And this is the thing, no matter how, how, how much promise this card has, it won't work without a government prepared to make it work. You can't go at 50 per cent, you can't do half pregnant with this, it's 110 per cent, it's nothing at all. And unfortunately, you just don't have that in you. You've lacked to show me that action. And for months, they've been trying to make it look like the card is paying out everything they promised. But in the truth, the card, they have set the card up, for, up to fail. I just don't think if their hearts were in it in the first place, that's great, but they're certainly not there anymore. And if they really cared about making the CDC work, they would have done more to help people get off welfare and into a good job and a good life. Because that was the promise of the card. That was the hope. The card was to give people hope to be able to change their lives around, to get out of the conditions they've been living in for years, to get them off welfare. They would have given them something to strive for and they would have given them that carrot, that carrot. That's, that's the answer. You've had the stick out for so long now. It's like you forgot to pull the carrot out of the ground. It's still sitting there. And that, in itself, and that in itself has become really, really sad. And as hard as this is for me, because like I said, I have seen some difference. But because you just didn't put the effort in over there and that effort dwindled as each year went past, this car's just not worth it anymore because every time you promise me you're going to do this and you're going to do that over the five years, you didn't deliver. And that's why this card has failed. It's failed because you would not deliver. You have this man over here, Sendo Sullivan, I told you, 18 months, this is the man that built the jobs. He worked on it for 10 years and you sat him on the sidelines. There was your first hope. You have people that know this card that could have made a difference really quickly and for 18 months you've still sat him on that sideline. So for me to think that you're actually going to make any difference after five years of asking for things to make the difference, I just don't believe you anymore. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Chisholm. Senator Wong. Uh, just by leave, um, uh, Acting Chair, I think I'm not sure if um, Senator Lambie is finished. I'm just wondering if she wants us to seek leave for a couple more minutes, if she wishes to finish up, or is she right? No worries. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. And Senator Lambie is often a hard act to follow, and I think particularly when she finds that way to combine some of her own personal experiences with some of the current day challenges we're facing in the chamber. And I think tonight we've seen another example of that. But what it does do, and what Senator Lambie's speech has done, it actually has mirrored some of the experiences that I've found when I've been out in the electorate of Hinkler, which is those Bundaberg Harvey Bay communities that have been part of a trial site that I, as a Labor senator, happen to be the duty senator for that area. Uh, and I've spent plenty of time there since they have been a trial site. I've held community forums in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay where anyone is allowed to come along. And I've also had Linda Burney, the Labor Shadow Minister, with me as well, where we've gone up there and heard from those people. 
Uh, and I can't help but come back, and I'll make some broad statements before I talk about some of the local examples that I've seen and the people I've met and the stories that they have told, is that at the end of the day, when you look at the application of this legislation, is that it is racist, it's discriminatory, it stigmatises those impacted, and it divides communities like those of, Har of Harvey Bay and Bundaberg. And what is shameful is that not one national has come into this chamber and defended it. Not one national has spoke in this chamber and defended this legislation. The seat of Hinkler has been held continuously by the National Party for 27 years. They've been the member for Hinkler as being a national party. Yet not one of them has come in and defended this. And just as shameful, we've only had one Liberal who's been prepared to come in and defend this. Uh, and it, I don't know Senator O'Sullivan well, um, but I believe his sincerity when he talks about what he has done in this. But this is the party of freedom, uh, the party of choice, individual choice. They say that when they've allowed young people early access to the superannuation, that it's their money. But not with this. Not with this and the way they treat those people uh, in Hinkler, those people of Harvey Bay and Bundaberg. The way they treat those people in remote Cape York, the way they want to treat those people in remote Northern Territory and some of those other communities. Um, it's not freedom of choice for them. It's not their money when it comes to this. They're going to be treated differently and restricted, and it has a massive impact. The member for Hinkler, his own electorate is the most impacted, uh, so it is the biggest trial site, did not even speak on this legislation. Uh, that will become permanent if it passes. He did not even speak on this legislation. So I'm going to focus the substance of my speech on Queensland and the impact of the card on Bundaberg and Harvey Bay. But I have also in recent times visited those communities that will be impacted in the Cape. So some of those communities that are currently on the basics card at the moment. As I said, I've held community meetings in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay, along with Shadow Minister Burney, and we met with anyone who wanted to come along and tell us their story. And some of the service providers who've been dealing with the fallout in those communities, we've held roundtables for them as well. And I want to tell some of their stories tonight. But let's bust some myths. Communities, one of the myths is that communities were consulted. The communities of Harvey Bay and Bundaberg were not consulted. The member for Hinkler still won't meet with those that have been impacted by this decision. He refuses to meet constituents. I've had them talk to me. They cannot get a meeting with their local member. But the fact is, is that none of these communities of Bundaberg and Harvey Bay were consulted. This was imposed on them from up high. There was no consultation on the ground. The government have not even tried to evaluate, evaluate this card before pressing ahead to make it permanent. It has led to a thriving black market, particularly in those Indigenous communities, and many of those have been impacted as a result. And the government promised more support for social services. I know in Hinkler it took more than two years for the government to actually deliver on that. So they imposed the card, but they didn't actually give the wraparound services, and this is what some, of, some of what Senator Lambie went to, to actually provide those support for people who did need help, who did have addictions or did have uh, substance abuse issues that they wanted to get off. Uh, they provided none of those extra wraparound services to those people. So the truth behind the government's plan is laid bare. It's actually a big rollout of the cashless debit card, and it is coming permanently. How can they say they're going to treat the community of Hinkler different from Brisbane or any other city? Why should those people be treated differently? Why should those Indigenous communities be treated differently? Uh, it is a nonsense, and that is something that the government have no doubt planned. Uh, so this seeks to remove the trial site parameters and establish the cashless debit card as an ongoing program. So it will add the Northern Territory, Cape York, so changing from the basics card to the CDC, and it will mean that those communities of Bundaberg and Harvey Bay will be on the card permanently. Before introducing the new law to make this trial permanent, Senator Rustin hadn't even read the report by the University of Adelaide which was looking into the effectiveness of this trial before launching into a big permanent rollout of the cashless debit card. How arrogant has this performance been from this government? 
The study cost $2.5 million, and the government wasn't even prepared to read the results before considering the rolling out the card. The LNP obviously don't want to read the report before they made the card permanent. As it has been reported that the trial found no substantive impact on measures of gambling, drug and alcohol abuse, crime or emergency department presentations. Dr Luke Greenacre, one of the authors of the University of Adelaide, uh, of the University of Adelaide report, also found that we have shown the CDC policy to have had no substantive effect on available measures for the targeted behaviours of gambling and intoxicant abuse. It has been reported that the government has now spent $4.8 million on evaluations, but so far have failed, all have failed to produce credible evidence to support claims of effectiveness, efficiency nor suitability. A new researcher, Elise Klein, in her submission to the committee inquiry into the legislation. The government had claimed that it would help with youth unemployment, but this doesn't bear out in reality. Since the trial period beginning in late 2018, there hasn't been an improvement in unemployment or youth unemployment, especially when you look at similar communities like Gympie compared to Bundaberg and Harvey Bay. So for those that don't know, Gympie is about an hour an hour and a half drive away from Bundaberg and Harvey Bay in regional Queensland. In June 2018, the unemployment rate for Bundaberg Local Government Association was 9.5 per cent. Fraser Coast, which is Harvey Bay, was 10.7, and Gympie was 8.9 per cent. In December 2019, they were 7.6 per cent, 8.8 per cent, and 7 per cent. So despite the fact the trial had been running for a year and a half, there was no significant statistical difference between the towns on the cashless debit card of Bundaberg and Harvey Bay compared to Gympie, which is a comparable town nearby. The unemployment rate in the Wide Bay labour market region of Bundaberg, Harvey Bay, Meribah and Gympie has stayed high. In September 2018, the unemployment rate for people between 15 and 34 was 10.9 per cent. In December 2019, it had increased to 13.8 per cent. So in a similar period, the Brisbane rate had, had dropped by one over one per cent. So when we're talking about youth unemployment, so those people impacted by the community in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay, they'd actually seen an increase in youth unemployment rate through the period of the trial of the cashless welfare card before COVID had hit. So since January 2010, the average unemployment in Wide Bay yep. for 15 to 13, for 15 to 34 year olds has been 14.6 per cent. So for too long this area has had a high level of youth unemployment, but what the government have done with the cashless welfare trial has seen no change to a, or a high youth unemployment rate through that region. So there's no evidence to say that the cashless debit card has had any impact on youth unemployment through the trial sites. And then I wanted to talk about the forums I held in Hinkler. I repeatedly heard the emotional toll the card was having on those impacted. I heard from Jodie, who shared her story. Jodie has been forced on the card. She actually travelled from Bundaberg to Harvey Bay to share her story with me in November 2019. I've spoken previously in the chamber of how Jodie suffers from chronic pain from her arthritis and prolapsed discs. She doesn't drink or gamble and was applying to opt out of the trial. In July this year, they rejected her application to opt out after nine months of waiting. This caused her to have a stress-induced heart attack caused by long-term severe stress. She couldn't include this in her review of the decision and has, made to, has been forced to make a new opt-out application. We heard from a mother who was almost unable to see her son's school concert performance because she couldn't get the cash out to buy a ticket. It was only a good Samaritan who handed the mother the cash to pay the entry to gain access to watch her son perform. The fact it limits people's ability in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay to visit local fresh food markets to buy fruit and vegetables off local stores, of which the Bundaberg and Fraser Coast region is so renowned for having such good access to fresh fruit and vegetables, they're missing out on that opportunity. And there were countless stories of people missing rent payments because Inju had miscategorised the payment as rent, meaning the actual rent bill came, uh, there wasn't enough money for it in the real account to pay the rent. We heard, from, we, heard people, we heard from people in shops that had been abused and shamed for having the CDC card. One person had taken, 
the steps to put a cover on her card so that it wasn't obviously a cashless debit card so that she wouldn't be targeted when actually paying for people and stigmatised as a result. It's clear that these residents and the government and their local member, Keith Pitt, the member for Hinkler, wasn't listening to their concerns. None of those extra services, none of those focus on jobs that Senator Lambie talked about have taken place in Hinkler to give them a chance for this to thrive. And then I raised the lack of access to support services. Hinkler was promised $1 million in extra funding for support services. It took the government over two years to grant the local funding. So they said that this was going to be part of the proposal, but it took them two years to actually deliver the extra support services that was so much needed in an area that has such high youth unemployment and has for such a period of time. In September 2019, I called on the government to stand up and keep their end of the bargain to the community. After two years of neglecting to fund these services, it still took a few more months for them to actually deliver on this. There's no doubt that this bill is the thin end of the wedge of the cashless debit card. We know that there are LNP MPs out there who have called for the national rollout of the cashless debit card. Uh, Senator Kenavan was on the news uh, yesterday doing the same. In February, we saw Senator Rushton say that there was absolutely a case to introduce the cashless welfare card in major cities, given the results of trials in Bundaberg, Harvey Bay in Queensland, Sedona in South Australia and the Kimberley region of Western Australia. This was the quote. The reason we haven't done it in the major cities is because we need to deal with the technology issue, which we are now close to resolving, she told the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. So there is no doubt the trajectory of this legislation, what the government wanted to achieve if they are able to do it. We know the Senate estimates established that they had a working group with big banks and supermarkets to look at how this could be rolled out across Australia. We know that those receiving DSP are on the cashless debit card, and it's only a matter of time before this is reduced. There's no doubt that the government think that beating up on welfare recipients is good politics for them. They've made an art form out of it since the Howard government 20 years ago. But it is an opportunity for us here in the Senate tonight to say no more, to say that targeting the stigmatising the dividing Australians and targeting those people on welfare will not actually pass this Senate tonight. Labor will oppose this bill and we will continue to stand up to the government's efforts to actually roll this out across Australia. Uh, I know from the work I have done in Hinkler over a number of years now to know that this doesn't work. It divides communities and it is not the answer to problems that need fixing. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.